Hello and welcome to the Peanut Butter Cup number one hosted by Monkey Bubble. My name is Gangly. Today I'm joined by my co-host Jirachi. Jirachi, we're going to be seeing 16 different European players competing today. I mean, it's a breath of fresh air to see so much uh, European talent at a high level. How are you feeling about today? Doing great. Actually, I haven't gotten the cast in a while, so it's nice to be back on the desk. I know it's your first time casting. We're going to mm -hmm. have an absolute blast. But like you said, yeah, it's we have a ton of European talent here today. We're getting to show that off in kind of like a weekly format, which we're kind of missing from EU as a showcase of their talent specifically. Over in NA, we have Fight Night Rising and we have players on from around the world, but it does tend to be a little more NA centric and we'll get EU players on. But having a mostly eu tournament really show off all the talent this region has it's going to be like you said it's going to be a breath of fresh air yeah absolutely i mean obviously we had the european regional finals we got to see a ton of great talent across all of the different european countries but i mean like you mentioned it's so nice to see it in a weekly format where we get to see some of these highest ladder players as well as some of the up-and-coming players who maybe we wouldn't get to see featured on the uh, regional finals. Now, with that said, we're gonna be heading into our first lobby. So let's take a look at our players. We've got seven different players competing in this last lobby with that last spot being filled out by a random player that'll be match made into the game. We've got Improbable Blob, B Chris, Ano Aragante, Sneak and Seek, KRC Brixton, W29F and King Dans. Jirachi, any thoughts uh, when, when we're looking at this lobby? Well, first, first name I see is Seek and Seek who won the last tournament that monkey bubble hosted i believe the banana split tournament and and unfortunately we had a player miss check-in so it's only seven players and we'll 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 figure out how to deal with that at some point but there besides seek and seek b chris is also a name that stands out to me um him and improbable blob those are two names that have popped up in fight night rising in some of the weekly tournaments that i've seen go on so they're they're used to this kind of weekly tournament format so there's there there's a good chance that i think they're going to perform better yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got six games today. We're going to be playing three games. And then after that, the top eight will continue on while the bottom eight are cut. From there, we'll play three more games to determine who our victor is going to be. One of the things that stood out to me when we were looking at that player list is that we actually have a handful of players, like we mentioned before, that were at the European regionals. I know we had Ano Aragante, who, who showed up, W29F. I mean, we've got a lot of talent. But one of the things to consider, especially when you have a player, players of this caliber, is the patch that we're playing on. Right now we're playing on 11.18, patch just dropped a couple days ago. Do you have any immediate thoughts based on the changes we've seen? I think the patch, the patch mostly just added things to the meta. Like it toned down, I'm, the big outlier I think was Lucian. Mm -hmm. Lucian just being such a flexible carry with his itemization and Galio being such a strong super tank. Like the patch toned that down, but Lucian's still playable, and most of the carries and the comps that are still playable, that were playable last patch, are still playable, and new things have been added either through the patch itself and direct buffs or just meta shifts and new innovations. Like, we still have Jax, Rangers, Velkaz, um, all the legendary boards, Nocturne. All those comps are still playable, but now Yasuo getting buffed, he, he's been just far and away outperforming a lot of the other comps in the meta thanks to the buff to the cast time on his ult. It takes less time for that ult to go off, so it actually means he gets to auto more. It increases his damage output by so much that it's led to a huge jump in power in the Yasuo comp. But even besides that, like Draven getting direct buffs, he's a lot more playable now. He's doing really well. And then a couple... Just a couple innovations and reroll comps. Riven being playable again now that we figured out that six Legion Nair is really good for her. And <laughs> the memes become dreams. Chug Jug is now playable and actually really good. But it's not Chug Bug. It's Chug. It's not Chug Jug. It's Chug Bug. That's it's right. Kha'Zix carry primarily. You're not stacking Gragas. Yes, Gragas 3 got buffed because Chug Jug is fun. But it's not, it's not about the jug anymore. It's all about the bug. You get an IE on him. You get healing. You just get any third item. And that Kha'Zix can one-shot carries without needing isolation damage. It's actually nutty. And I've seen some one-tricks on NA ladder who have been climbing quite a bit with that comp. 
I know in the Giant Slayer series, we did see Aegon actually uh, unironically try pull out the, the Chug Jug. Didn't see the greatest results with it, but it seems like this is the opportunity for the Chug Jug to redeem itself as the Chug Bug, as you mentioned. One of the, the things about reroll comps dominating the meta, whenever there is a shift in these very uh, strong spikes on level five, six, seven, it means that it, it is a little bit tougher to have these very expensive boards do well because when everybody is rolling down to stabilize hard at six and seven, going for a fast eight can oftentimes be very risky unless you have the health to spare. Do you expect to see maybe people rolling a little bit more heavily on seven or just rolling a little more heavily to stabilize their boards earlier because of the rerolls? I think because of the rerolls, you might see players opt to roll a little bit more on six. If they're trying to go for a legendary board, it's so much easier to roll down on level six, stabilize off a two cost carry like the Varus into the Kale. It's super easy to stabilize and transition off that because you usually just run the Knight's opener anyways. You just pivot that into Knight's Kale, but it's you're going to see a lot of players more incentivized to roll on six to get them to 5-1 rather than trying to fast eight without rolling all the way to 4-5 because if you're trying to do that, you're going to bleed out so much HP and oftentimes you don't even really have enough gold on 4-5 to reliably hit Kale. And at that point, you lose the next two rounds, you're one life, and even if you hit Kale, you're just one bad fight off of just dying immediately. It's so true. And, and honestly, one of the biggest expressions of skill in the game is being able to roll without having to spend too much so that you can stabilize. And we hear people say this all the time, that stabilize doesn't mean winning every round. It means having a board that is not going to lose you the game. And with that said, we're actually going to be heading into game number one of the Peanut Butter Cup. We're heading on board with Improbable Blob. And you yeah, can see right, right off the bat. First, I'm noticing everyone went for Bo. Uh-huh. And Improbable Blob actually got it. So like, these, these players know Yasuo is really good. You want to play Yasuo off a bow start. And a lot, a lot of the AD comps, like, they don't mind bows. And even you can play, like, R Riven really likes the bows. It's a uh, Rage Blade for Aphelios. It's Lucian items with the, the Lucian nerfs mainly affected the magic damage on his alt. So it... It de-incentivizes de building like the Jewel Gauntlet Hodge build on him, but that that build is still really good. But building AD feels pretty comparable in power now, and building AD was already pretty common on him last patch. So it's it's very easy to get a good illusion build out of a bunch of bows. Yeah, I mean, one of the themes of 5.5 of I think that we've seen is that AD flex is a very strong way to play. And I do want to introduce this one idea, though, because we talked about the, before with, with reroll being on board. Another reroll comp that has been obviously around in the meta, but showing a little bit more prominence is this vein reroll. Obviously, when you run something like Runan's Ginsu is a viable right vein reroll comp. Having the bow on vein does mean maybe that's something you're looking for. Although I will say that not picking up the Hecarim from this shop is, you know, it may be a sign that that's not where uh, she wants to go with, with her opener. Yeah, you, you only have the one vein. You already have the skirmisher open right in front of you. Like, there's no reason to try and hard force vein reroll, especially when you get another bow. You have this Varus in shop now. You can maybe you don't have enough Leonas to really work this into a Varus opener. But Improbable Blob has a lot of options with what she wants to do with this opener. Could slam the Rage Blade, could opt to slam an RFC, even though the RFC doesn't do a lot for you here. If you're opting for hard forcing Yasuo, you can just slam the RFC saying, I'm going to commit to Yasuo and just try and bully other people off the comp. But the Rage Blade slam does feel a little bit safer. You can put it on Nidalee. She uses that item very well. And it looks like... Is she, I think she's thinking about doing that. Exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. what she's going to go with. It's a much safer play than saying this early, I'm going to hard commit Yasuo without any semblance of a Yasuo opener. Definitely. I mean, if that third component is something like a cloak, it makes it a little easier to say, like, I'm just going to slam Runance. It still gives me the option to go Yasuo. But like you said, RFC is one of those items where while it can give you so much value late game when you have other items to supplement your actual damage output, it feels very subpar when it's the only item you're slamming, especially early game. And with a pretty strong board, uh, unfortunately, not able to win out that first round. 
but still, I would say the, the, the Gintu slam makes sense conceptually at this point in the, in the game. Yeah. <laughs> An unfortunate <laughs> armory followed up by a pretty good shop. Like, Improbable Blob started the bow. She's anticipating going some type of AD or Yasuo and then getting offered a bunch of AP items in your armory never feels that good. So ops for the tier, which I'm okay with, it's actually easier to burn excess tiers. Playing AD, you can make it into like a Redemption, Frozen Heart, or a Hand of Justice. You have you have a lot more options with that. With the rod, it's basically just Ginsu's. And she already has a Ginsu, so mm -hmm. there's no point in getting a second one. But also finds also finds the Lee Sin in the shop, so it's for Skirmisher. And maybe could, could swap out the Udir for the Nautilus, but this is still a pretty strong opener. Skirms have always been the dominant AD opener this set, pretty much. Yeah, definitely. I mean, in set 5.5, we, we saw the uh, strength of six Skirmisher diminish. Obviously, it's a lot easier to hit now than it was in previous sets. But with that said, when you have three, two of the three cost Skirmishers, it actually gives you a pretty easy transition into a six Skirmisher mid game because really you're just missing the uh, the cannon as well as the uh, blanket on the last one. But uh, overall, much easier to hit six Skirmisher when Irelia. you have... Irelia, thank you. <laughs> much easier to hit uh, six Skirmisher once you have the, the three costs out of the way, which Improbable Blob does already. Yeah, for sure. And she also finds a Recon pair in one shop. I mean, sure, why not? Recon, still a really strong unit. The nerfs it got, I believe, two patches ago only affected the, th the three-star version. And the three-star version is still pretty good. And Recon, just an easy unit to tack in. It's just free healing for your team. And especially with Skirmishers wanting the fight to get prolonged so you can stack more AD, you can get a ton of value out of that heal. I will say it's, it's pretty expensive. At this point, you're holding on to four different three costs. Also, a pretty nice hook by that Thresh interrupting the Nidalee from getting into the back line. Looks like the Nidalee's probably going to be able to take this fight regardless, though. Yeah, and th this is when things get rough, actually, when you're not on the strongest board and you took two losses in the first two fights. Because now you're two loss, one win. If you take two more losses, your your game's more or less over because you snapped your five loss going into Krugs. You're losing so much money. It can cost you over the course of the game around 30 to 40 gold winning that single round. So from this point, Improbable Blob really just wants to get some kind of streak going. Can Maybe is she going to opt for? She's going to opt for Hand of Justice. I'm okay, I'm okay with the Hand of Justice. It feels really bad having that Hand of justice component be on a one cost yep. you're going to be a little broke especially considering you're holding so many three costs right i mean it's the point you just made you you don't have the streak going you've got a pretty strong board obviously not the strongest board or you would have been streaking but having the sentinel added at level five does increase the strength of that board quite a bit and if you are able to slam an item looks like it is going to be last whisper over oh, hand of okay. justice maybe that that does tend to it feels like it leans a little bit more towards a felios than it would some of the other ad comps is that correct how would you yeah, feel I about think, it i think she's she's leaning more towards a felios or draven also these mm. these two items just immediately scream draven to me like going going for the hand of justice draven not the best user of hand of justice like it's fine the hand of justice has always been that item where it's really good on everyone but not the best on everyone the exception probably being lucian now which i think hand of justice has been best in slot on lucian for a while but the last whisper you're committing a little bit harder to a specific tree but once you get to that specific tree if you can get there you're going to be stronger and she's also she's opting not to sell these pairs for eco not making 10 on two five doesn't feel good but these are good pairs to hold they're Senna and Rakan pair, like the Senna just actually a really solid underrated unit, even for just being a one cost, like it's, if you get the right angle, it's good backline CC, a decent amount of damage, and the Rakan too is just so much healing. Yeah, I mean, all right, I gotta say, I gotta point it out, we've been talking about 
Improbable Blob possibly being broke. She would have been much more broke if she didn't win that last fight. That Nidalee came in huge with the dodge chance, despite the nerfs that she saw a couple patches ago. Still a very strong unit. Has the opportunity, the ability to turn the tide of a fight. If she just keeps dodging, is gaining stacks with that Ginsu's, able to really turn that fight around. And if Improbable Blob is able to take this fight, it's going to be in a pretty decent spot. Unfortunately, not going to be enough. The Rune Ants from that Callista, just too much DPS. You have the brand constantly melting the, the entire team. So probably does not feel great for her to go into Krugs with uh, 10 gold, not going to be able to make 20 off the bat, most likely going to hit it off of the gold drops. But I mean, hey, if you if you low roll, it can be a pretty scary uh, position to not have 20 going into stage three. Yeah, and there's probably a good chance she's going to have to sell this for con pair anyway, which the, it, it's still it's pretty expensive. So yeah. at the end of the day, you're like, I don't I, I need to make 20 here. This pair, even if I hit it, it's not quite worth how much gold I'm going to dump into it if I'm not keeping it around for the whole game. But we're going to move on to King Dan's, who has a pretty high roll opener. Currently leading the lobby, unfortunately lost the win streak going into Krugs, but still in an okay spot. Three upgrades, Knights in, a Riven on board already. Rage played Sunfire Slam. This is this is what we saw a lot in any regionals, actually. A lot of players going for those two item slams specifically because Sunfire, just the best item early game. And it's not even close. It gets so much value because of how slow the fights are and how much healing is actually in the early game boards between Olaf, between Dawnbringers, um, between the, if someone slams a BT. So that Sunfire, you just get so much value out of it. And the Rage Blade, a super flexible item. You can put it on an AP carry or an AD carry. So King Dan's in a good spot, has a strong board, has two super flexible items, can play pretty much whatever they want out of this. Mm -hmm. And starting to call out, you mentioned King Dan's was not able to keep the streak going into stage three. I think W29F might have actually been able to keep the loss streak, depending on the quality of their losses. And I thought I saw them holding on to Gragas's and Kha'Zix's. So uh, I'm, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to spoil it just in case, but I really hope we get to see the, the, the chug bug at some point. I also saw an infinity edge on that chug bug. So oh, they, no. they know the build. It's pretty much infinity edge, a healing item, whether it's hand of justice or Gunblade, and then plus one, a defensive item, another offensive item, even though Kha'Zix doesn't really need it because infinity edge plus two assassin you don't even need the isolation isolation damage a lot of the time so wow super strong build and this is something i think we're going to see a lot actually rolling on level six king dance has the riven pair has a decent amount of gold there's so much ev effect effective value expected value excuse me in rolling that you hit this riven too you are so strong there is a very good chance you streak here from to into neutrals yeah so it's it's a ton of board power and they still have 30 gold on board there's this not is, they didn't even have to roll a ton to hit this insane power spike it's pretty impressive to see this quality of board with this much gold especially considering they actually rolled a uh, quite a bit they had a very very strong economy going into it i believe actually 50 gold when they started their roll down i think we can expect like you mentioned that this is the kind of board that will win streak but I do want to talk about when building boards, you see this at a higher level of TFT, right? When when you're starting out, you think of these traits in their vertical nature, right? If I'm building Dawnbringer, I want four, I want six, I want eight, I want all Dawnbringers. This is a bulky board comprised of what? Three different defensive traits of Dawnbringer, Nightbringer, and Knights, all empowering this Riven to have a greater uptime throughout the fight to gain stacks on that Ginsu's. And when you have so much DPS coming through this Riven and so many different units around her to empower her and give her time to build up, I mean, we're really going to be able to see this Riven take over the fight. For sure. And having having these like not vertical synergies having a bunch of small synergies it can definitely work out it just depends on what the units you're hitting if you're hitting a ton of upgrades and they don't necessarily match up all into one synergy that's fine like we see a leona 2 gragas 2 on the same board and the knight synergy actually complements the brawler synergy it's dipping into multiple dipping into that multiple defensive synergies can actually make all your units just that much tankier and we're seeing this Riven just run through these boards. Like, this Riven is doing so much work right now. 
yeah, King Dan's definitely in a good spot. Sitting at 88 HP, 40 gold on a win streak, most likely going to be able to get a couple more wins, potentially streak through the entire stage. Now it's time for the carousel. I mean, this is one of the parts of the game where obviously you have a bit more agency and also one of the parts of the game where I would say the lower end of the spectrum in terms of health are going to look for that comeback mechanic to get their perfect items and actually swing the pendulum back in their favor. So depending on what players like W29F and Brixton are running, this could be a part of the game where they're really starting to build up that mid game spike. Yeah, for sure. And on the opposite side of that, you can sometimes see players like that have low carousel priority. It's more just about finding an item they can slam that keeps their board strength going. And for um, I, King, and for King Vans, found a cloak off that carousel, is able to probably slam gargoyles. Mm. Just another defensive item, just keeps that board strength going, keep the win streak going. But we're gonna swap over to Brixton, who found the Velkaz, had Igel Gauntlet slammed, which Igel Gauntlet, that was on the Lux, this doesn't get a ton of value, because Igel Gauntlet is more or less a Rapidon's death cap until you get I don't know what the exact number is, but until you get AP on a unit. And for Velkaz, ha is able to get that redeemed, really make use of that of that spell crit. And especially if we can get spell weavers in or the six redeemed, you're you're getting a lot of value out of of this Velkaz. And value aside out of the items, it's a Velkaz on stage three. It's <laughs> this unit is still really good especially once you get the spell crit on it, it doesn't look like it's going to get a mana item because it has it has the glove on it and I, and I assume brixton got this Velkaz off carousel so no mana item not a problem just stack a bunch of damage but three six means the radiant armory and these these items aren't the best but like the banshee silence still a pretty good item like having having a banshee's claw on your entire team you can Depending on the lobby, you can get a ton of value, and we're seeing like that Callista. It can stop the Callista spirit, stops Thresh Hook. We're seeing Thresh, we're seeing Thresh on some boards. So gonna gonna take the Banshee Silence, and I completely agree with this decision. Yeah, I mean, obviously the pool of, of items split basically into tank, utility, and offensive items. You already have two offensive items on your Velkaz, so I think it is fair to say time to just. Uh, start itemizing in a way that supports my board in other in other parts of the game. I have a lot of I've got a lot of damage with this Velkaz. Obviously, three redeemed gives Velkaz a little bit of AD or AP as well to supplement the IE jeweled gauntlet. But unfortunately, it looks like the Velkaz is not going to be able to take this round. So despite taking the the Velkaz off carousel, Brixton's still not able to turn it on yet. We are taking a look at B. Krizda, who was able to take that fight, is carrying a Kled. So let's talk about this. When you have an early game carry like Kled, who's really strong in stages two and three, you're going into stage four with the decision to make. Am I going to fast eight, sacrifice a ton of health, and then on four or five, level to eight and roll down? Or am I going to try and transition my board right now on level seven, save a little bit of health, but have to spend uh, more gold? Uh, in the spectrum of the game, where would you feel is the safer decision right now? If it's 100% just rolling on seven, especially if you're rolling for a four cost carry, which it looks like Beakris is probably gonna want to do that. Um, go Maybe go for a Jax. The thing, he's not rolling here, and that tells me he actually wants to go for more of an Akshan carry or a Felios. Mm. Has a bunch of offensive items, so I don't even mind this. You can put um, you can put items on both a Felios and Akshan, have that dual carry. You're healthy enough to have the option of going for the fast eight and playing Rangers. So I don't mind this decision. It's not personally what I would do. I just I play I would play this much safer. I'd probably just be playing Jax here. But B Chris identifying this is what I'm going to go for. I'm just gonna commit to this. And well we'll see how that works out. Yeah, up against Aragante now, who does have a uh, stacked MF in the back line with a pretty strong front line of that Hecker. Looks like a Hecarim 2 with Bramble plus a belt. Going to be a pretty big win for Aragante. Going to be dealing a, a significant amount of damage to B Chris. And this is one of the things you have to look out for when you are doing that fast state style, though, because if you take two more losses like that, I mean, you're, you're going to be losing a lot of health. And then if you don't hit on four or five, when, like you said, if you're transitioning to something like Akshan Aphelios, it's a pretty expensive board. I mean, I mean, it, it can be pretty scary and uh, can feel a little doomed going into stage five if you don't quite have all the pieces you need. For sure, and he's actually gonna, 
<laughs> he's gonna opt to just straight up a level here deciding i'm not going to sack any more hp than i absolutely need to i am gonna have no gold here but we're just gonna level anyway and this is the danger of going for that fast eight those three sack rounds in stage four when a bunch of people are rolling down finding their four cost carries you're gonna be taking some pretty bad losses and it's very easy to lose 40 hp in three fights and that can dip you from Beaker's a spot 80 82 hp all the way to 42 possibly maybe even lower put yourself into stimmy range the radiant blessing or we like to call it stimmy over <laughs> in north america but the level eight that, that level eight you just don't have gold and he's still gonna lose the fight anyway yeah i mean so i i, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, Keeping, keeping the Kled probably is the only option because of how little gold you have, but I mean, oh wow, oh. it's a double Aphelios and Diana on one shop. If uh, B. Chris was looking to actually play Aphelios, I mean, he kind of needs to take this. Also does hit the Jax pair too. The thing is, you have so little gold in your wallet and a lot of gold on the board. And if you're looking to play Aphelios, if you're looking to play Draven, you're going to have to sell quite a bit of stuff. Looks like not, you're not going to be looking for the Draven does hit three skirmishes as well. So going to be transitioning those items onto Jax. But I mean, this is the scary part of the game where you have to spend a lot of gold that you don't quite have, but you got stuff on your bench that you know could be really good once you itemize it. Yeah, and he's healthy enough that he's not like panicking yet. It's not the greatest spot. You don't have a ton of gold. You're still trying to find an auction. You're still trying to find a Felios too. But he's what he's doing now is actually not bad. He's using the carries he's found and the better carries at one star. A Felios, very strong carry, can delete boards at two star. Uh -huh. That's the caveat. One star of Felios is not really good at all. You just not quite enough damage to actually get through boards. But Jack's one, still a pretty good option for stage four. It can, you can still do around 8,000 damage just on the Jack's one. So I like what B Chris is doing. You're using the better one star version of your carry right now. And eventually you're going to try to get to a Felios once you get the two star of Felios and maybe an Akshan. So B Chris ended up actually selling the Aphelios pair right before Carousel. There ended up being an action on Carousel that he was trying to go for. Honestly, oh wow, it does hit Jax too, which is pretty big. Something I want to point out though is you were talking before about when you're running Aphelios action, you can utilize all of these offensive items. When you're not running a Felios action, you now have to put your secondary offensive items on something like a Nidalee, or if you can itemize a Gwen late game. Uh, you can you can throw it on there, but it's a little bit harder to utilize all of these offensive items. We're going to be switching over to Aragante now. Looking at the Forgotten board, is going to be rerolling for three star uh, Hecarim, I believe. Wait, is that that is that a three star? No, no, it's still three MFs away from three star. Uh, but like we were talking about before, is one of these boards that they're going to be looking to stabilize on six rather than going for that fast eight or even level seven board. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> good old Horsey, uh, the comp that terrorized the first week of set 5.5, um, got <laughs> one of, as one of the people who was terrorizing ladder with that comp, got <laughs> quite a bit of flame for this, but still, still a playable comp. If you find the angle for it, I don't think it's hard forcible anymore, but if you have an MF early, you find a couple Hecarims, you have the items necessary to go for it. Very easy to just say, I'm going to commit to this because I have the angle and play it. But also, and also playing it from ahead. Yeah. Is actually really important. It's not one of those comps you can hit on one life and you go first from there. Which is normally what you think of when you think of reroll comps. You think, oh, the reroll comp, it hits the three stars. It's automatically the strongest in the lobby besides legendary boards. That's just uh. not the case with that and a lot of reroll comps besides assassins. So playing it from ahead, really valuable. And Aragante is really healthy. 53 HP at going into stage five is pretty healthy for this board, taking some really good losses. Only a two unit loss to Seek and Seek playing the Velkaz and really close to a lot of these three stars finds another hecarim and is that that's only that's only one sedge two so probably not gonna be going for sedge three this game but that's an easy level seven 
for your next level, either on 5-1 or 5-2. And I also, I really like that he's holding on to this Nautilus. I think part of the strength of this comp is going for all the three stars. If you're just going for MF and Hecarim 3, it's not enough board strength. You actually really want the Thresh 3 and the Nautilus 3, just so you have a ton of board strength all at once on your board. Yeah, definitely. Unfortunately, not a not a great hit there. Uh, does hit another bow, although finds a Draven, so actually can utilize that with the Redemption. Not too bad. And finding, a, wow, a handful of units that, that Aragante can use. This is the part that's a little bit scary, though. Obviously, your your bench is a little congested. You got to... Oh. oh, no. And this oh, is what you have happens. to sell Rail Pair. You have he to has sell, to sell Rail Pair. Keep, keep the MF. Okay, no, he's not even going to bother with Thresh. But it happens. Far off. Oh, man. He sells, sells all. Okay. This I is the danger. Like this is the danger of playing reroll, especially when you're not level seven. It takes up so much bench space to find this. Ends up not hitting any of the three stars on five one, and has to sell some of those benched units that could have been used to power spike later. The nice thing is you do have this Draven that's going to be the corner bait for the MF. At least you're going to have this MF free hitting up against uh, Brixton now, who does have that Velkaz online. The Velkaz goes off and is able to clean up, although. The Hecarim with Bramble is surviving quite a bit. No, okay, still going to take that loss. Overall, not a bad loss, though. Uh, not quite at stimmy range yet, either. What is, I'm looking at this. It's probably just the Ionic Spark. You need a third Hecarim item, and the Ionic... Ionic really good for Hecarim. And uh, he's passing of Thrashes. Finds, finds the Hecarim 3, so at this point... Oh, he accidentally... <laughs> He overleveled. Uh, oh no! Finds the MF3 anyway. It's good to go. Found found the units, but this is going against what I literally just said. Of you want <laughs> as much as many three stars as possible, and sold four Nautiluses to clear up bench space for this Draven pair and a Rel pair. Also going to play se just a random Sedge too. And I'm actually, I'm a big fan of playing Lucian in this comp, actually. You throw it in the other corner, it's good corner bait for Lucian, for an, for opposing Lucians for an Ash. So instead of targeting your entire backline, it'll target the other side of the board. Of course, nothing, none of that helps when you're facing a Nocturne 3 at level 8 on 5-2, just deleting the backline. This thing is still terrorizing, With but it doesn't matter against a Bramble Vest Hecarim. Three, able to take down the Nocturne 3, gonna clean up this fight, wins it for Aragante. Bramble Vest coming in clutch right there. I mean, Hecarim's got all the pieces there, right? He's got the Bramble Vest to, to avoid the critical hits. He's got the Ionic Spark to deal damage whenever someone's casting, and he has the, the Redemption to keep him alive. And you know what? I want to bring something up, though, because we are talking before about Aragante choosing to not go for all the different three stars. When I see that, that says, I just want, I just want top four. And you know what? In the format we're playing today, that actually does work. Something we didn't talk about before is that in typical scoring structures, you get an extra point for top four and an extra point for first. But today, we're actually not playing like that. You do get an extra point for top four, but we are not seeing the extra point for first. So players may be indexing a little bit higher on just looking to play for a top four rather than the playing for first. For sure. And that's <laughs> honestly... Like, personally, that's one of the gripes I have with the current tournament format system. Like, it is what it is, but that extra point for first feels bad when you don't get first because, you know, a lot of times getting that first just kind of depends on high rolling. But, and it, uh, other tournaments, it just be like that. But for this tournament, because we don't have that point bump, playing for top four, you get a lot of value out of that. And unfortunately, I believe... That's uh, a, a random in the lobby going eighth. So <laughs> that's true. Yeah, but we're uh, hopping <laughs> on back back on board with Improbable Blob now, who is running six Sentinel. We saw in the beginning that Improbable Blob had this Sentinel skirmisher board. So typically speaking, that is a pretty smooth transition. But as Jirachi, you mentioned when we first started the broadcast, we have seen Lucian get some nerfs on on the uh, magic damage of his old both at one and two star and improbable blob is running the jeweled gauntlet version of this comp yeah and the the jewel gauntlet version is fine but i think the problem with improbable blobs items is actually that there's there are split between ad and ap normally you get a ton of value out of lucian by committing to one tree or the other you go an ad build on him you go an ap build on him you really you really commit to um, on the AD side, like a Deathblade Last Whisper, you really, you can really utilize that armor shred. But the armor shred, 
that you get from this last whisper doesn't do anything for the magic damage that Jewel Gauntlet really boosts. So it's the mixed build like this, and it's probably what her items just said to build, but it's just not the best thing to go for. Still going to clean up this fight. Lucian's still so good. Yeah, so I mean, we were just on board earlier with Aragante, and we talked about it, how not uh, opting to not three star your entire board does lower your cap that's just the reality of it the hope is by leveling you can boost your current power level so that you can can sneak into that top four i will say though it is a little scary and probably blob celebrating right now because she's saying you know what it's not a seven it always feels good at one hp to climb even a single placement on the ladder yeah, sometimes sometimes you go in and you're saying i am playing for seventh already just off this early game off of just how things go. You get that seventh. Yay. I'm done. Get <laughs> me out. Right. Or in this case, a six. Yeah, just get me out of this lobby. Although there's even... a, there a chance she can climb back to a top four, depending on the fight RNG, mm -hmm. depending on who she hits. Looks like so. she is afraid of those the, the assassins right now, putting everything in the corner, saying, just please don't give me the Nocturne player. Please don't give me the Nocturne player. Ends up not hitting it. Instead is a very, looks like a pretty strong Gwen 2 with Thieves Gloves with a Heimerdinger in the back. For King Dance, King Dance is definitely looking pretty strong. Although the Lucian is able to take out that Gwen, but the Abomination comes out and finishes up the backline for Improbable Blob. Uh, we'll see. I mean, you still got a little bit there. You've got this this Galio too with quite a few items on it, a Declaw in particular. But it doesn't look like this is going to be enough. The Abomination falls. The Scion is on that Galio, and Impl Improbable Blob is going to go out in sixth place. Yep, sixth place, and we have actually rounded out our top four. Now we're back on board with King Dan's. Yeah, Beaker is going out in fifth, and for Improbable Blob, that feels bad, and I've been there. You clump up, you're saying, I want to just position for the Sin player, I don't want my carry to just get wrecked by this Nocturne, and then you face the A-Bomb player, who has a Heimer, who hits your whole team, and has shrouded your whole team. It's the unfortunate reality of matchmaking. And for B Chris, just that little bit of a scuff transition, too many offensive items, just leading to a fifth, and it happens. But we're on board with King Dan's, who we just saw knock out Improbable Blob. Sitting on a Heimer 1, has a Nikos though, finds one more Heimer, has the Heimer 2. The Heimer 1, not super strong right now, but if you get that Heimer to 2 star, then it really comes online, still just as good as it was before the nerfs. Yeah, King Dance actually finding a lot of five costs in that roll down, but none of them were the five costs he was looking for. It does hit the second Volibear pair. Unfortunately, it's one of those things where it's like, I have a Volibear pair, which can be really great, but it also costs a lot. Uh, unfortunately, finding two Vieos can't use that, wishes he, he could have hit the Heimer instead, and it's going to lock his shop. But up against this Nocturne, who's just going to immediately <laughs> immediately get on the, the Heimerdinger, say goodbye, say goodnight. But now the, the Nocturne might end up, because the Thieves' Gloves gave Gwen a Bramble Vest, still not able to finish off the Nocturne, though. This yeah. Nocturne is so cracked. Uh, it's a Nocturne with three Zeeks because of the t Thieves' Gloves roll on the Ivern, giving uh, giving W29F an additional Zeke's. Yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of attack speed on the Nocturne. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. I've been a big proponent of, with Nocturne, the items you really want are Last Whisper, any two good Nocturne items, and as many Zeke's as you can get, because Nocturne already gets a ton of AD at three stars specifically, has a ton of crit from the assassin trait. Really what you want is attack speed and that armor shred, and that Zeke's giving so much attack speed, it lets you just rapid fire mow down boards. But as we saw, we see Aragante going out in fourth. You know what, Aragante, they got their top four. They got, they played Cavs, they got their top four. They only had two three stars. That is kind of a just get me out angle. I got, I got my <laughs> top four, job done. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, this is like we said before, when you're when you're playing in a format like this, you really just want to be playing for that top four. And if you can show that level of consistency throughout the entire tournament, well, you're going to end up in a pretty good spot. With that said, King Dan's up now. I didn't actually catch whose board that was. It might have been Sneak and Seek's, uh, Seek and Seek's, but uh, was up against a ghost. So we'll have to see how the next couple of rounds turn out. It does look like the Nocturne board is in a pretty good spot. I mean, capped Nocturne, when you've got all of your revenants in, when you've got your three-star Nocturne, especially with a decent amount of health, I would say 25 health with at stage six with the Nocturne sounds like a lot of health to me. 
it's and the, the nocturne is going against two ap boards that it's very easy to just mow them down but i like this play from king dance he knows he's playing for second and just nico the volibear get that little bit of extra hp you know you're fighting seek and seek here if that extra that volley two lets you win this fight knock out seek and seek you get your second but that's all you need that's pretty much all you can get they know they're not beating this nocturne player so they're just going for the win here and if they can't beat seek and seek now then it's just a third it's a little it's a little bit risky actually because you if you hit the heimer two then maybe you can knock out Seek and Seek later, but even that doesn't look likely because you're gonna start rotating into the Nocturne player. Mm. Not gonna, not gonna take the fight. A good loss though, and even a good loss here. So now you're just hoping we're that you both face the Nocturne player. One faces the actual player, the other faces the ghost. You're just hoping for a better loss at this point and mitigating your loss into Seek and Seek or just winning entirely. That can secure your second right there, and then you're out of the lobby. Yeah, I mean, even going off of that, we see King Dance picking up the Mystic Emblem from the Carousel, kind of doubling down on the, I'm probably not going to be able to beat the Assassin's Player, but you know what? If I can beat this AP board, I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I can. We I, we even saw King Dance uh, position his board very quickly, reposition at the last second against the AP board to dodge the Velkaz laser. Even so, the Heimer was not able to do enough. It did look like the Volibear didn't have a great ult. So you know what? I'm willing to say that if the fight RNG and positioning is better, there is a world where King Dan's is able to take it over that Velkaz board. But we'll have to see who he's up against now. If it is the Nocturne, we'll see if he has enough CC to stop this Nocturne to go into town. The Zephyr comes out on the Heimerdinger. So there is going to be quite a bit of DPS. It's not going to be uh, going for King Dance. The Nocturne does get into the back line, takes out the Heimer and the turret. And honestly, unfortunately, that may be all she wrote for King Dance. It, yep. It sins. <laughs> That's all I can say. But is it better? And the double oh, no. kill. You can see takes a better loss, even down to HP, able to clutch it out. So W29F takes the first with the sins. And that that round, that's the top four. W29F with the win on the Sins, Seek and Seek, taking that second. That win over King Dan's was Man. really helped secure it, plus a slightly better loss into the Sin player. Yeah, I mean, I got to say, we talked about going into this game, how we were expecting to see some of these reroll comps that were introduced uh, with this patch, right? We, we talked about the Riven. We talked about the Assassins. We talked about Chugbug. We talked about a bunch of different things. And it was ended, uh, the lobby was taken by a reroll comp in the Assassins, but we did get to see some of these uh, level first AP boards coming through with the Velkaz and the Heimerdinger. I mean, it definitely shows that the meta is in a place right now where basically any strong board can win. And I think we're going to see a large amount of variance in the quality of boards and in the type of boards and types of trees and lines that players are going to be taking. For sure. And honestly, looking at that lobby, if you asked me which patch it was between this patch and last patch, I could not tell you. It's the board, the boards we saw in the comps people were playing was the same as we were playing last patch. We didn't see Yasuo. We talked about Yasuo. <laughs> Yasuo didn't come up at all. We talked about Chugbug. We thought W29F would have a Chugbug angle. They didn't go for it. They went the other Sins route. So a lot of the same stuff being played. And I want to see as the tourney goes on, see what other players incorporate into their play. See if they get some of those new comps that we've found innovations for into their wheelhouse. Yeah, I mean, all of it really comes back down to the way you play your, your opener, right? And the way you're positioning yourself in the mid game to build out that late game fight. One of the things you and I talked about before the broadcast began was the idea of flexing between uh, different assassins boards, right? We talked about how you can you can play a game that looks like maybe it's going to be chug bug. And then if you have uh, if you're not hitting the Dawnbringers, if you don't have enough Kha'Zix going into Stage 3, you can say, you know what, I'm going to play Sins. And it did look like that's kind of how W29F played their game, and in the end, it paid off. Yeah, the Glove being a great item for Kha'Zix, because you want the Infinity Edge, and the Hand of Justice is the most common healing item people go for. Um, and for Nocturne, Last Whisper, maybe a QSS, Infinity Edge, either Assassin comp can use infinite gloves. Even besides carry items, Shroud, excellent item in Assassins, a Trap Claw or the Banshee's Claw can do a lot of work in either version of the comp. So that 
the glove start into assassin flex mm -hmm. it's yeah it's exactly what we were talking about it's what w29f did decided to go the nocturne route found the nocturne three propels that into a first yep absolutely and and you know what i also want to point this out when you do have that glove start and you, you want to flex between Chugbug and Nocturne. You talked before about how Last Whisper is really the most important core item in Assassins, but the reality is when you're playing a Lost Streak board, you can basically build whatever items you want because of the flexibility you have at Carousel. It actually enables you to slam Infinity Edge early, even though you want to save a glove for Last Whisper, because the odds are you're going to be able to make that Last Whisper by the second or third Carousel. Yeah, and it... That speaks a little bit to also how you prioritize your items. Sometimes you decide, you slam a Last Whisper early, you know I'm just playing Nocturne. You can start going for the Zeke's Heralds instead to get that attack speed going. But if you slam that Infinity Edge, you decide I'm gonna just commit to my carry items first rather than these supplemental items like the Zeke's Herald. So the it speaks to the different routes you want to go. If you're hard forcing Nocturne, you go the Last Whisper, you prioritize the Zeke's Herald. If you're playing that Assassin Flex, like you said, getting the IE Infinity Edge as the priority instead opens up, opens up your options just a little bit and really lets you play around what you hit more of. Definitely, yeah. And, you know, we're, we're at the end of game one. We've got five more games ready, so we're actually going to be taking a look at the scores coming out of that first game. In first, we've got W29F, and also we have uh, <laughs> Zool. <laughs> we were talking about this. We're, we're going to have a great time pronouncing this name. <laughs> yep, yeah. We're gonna, I'm going to say Zulanok. Zulanok also coming in first in the in Lobby B. Seek and Seek, Peaky, King Dan's, Team, Team Laws, Ano Aragante, Nakashi filling out the rest of the top eight. I mean, honestly, I don't know exactly how Lobby B went, but I can say that based off what we've seen in Lobby A, one of the best things we're going to see about today is just the huge amount of variance we're going to be seeing in in uh, all the different games. Yeah, we, we saw a lot of different comps come out. We saw Lucian, the Sins, Squid, Jax, Cavaliers. Um, there was the Heimer board. Um, there's everyone's playing something different and, and that's part of what makes flexibility super nice like you know there's so many options that you that you you can find some kind of angle that no one else is playing you can find something that's uncontested mm -hmm. so that and that makes you ma makes your chances of hitting just a little bit more reliable and even if you're not trying to go for like an optimal comp for your items sometimes it is going to be better to just play a carry that you can two star with not the greatest items versus really good items for a one star four cost carry that's not going to be that strong yeah, you know, I think one of the other really interesting things about having a flexible meta is that it also enables you to have a, a greater level of, of player expression. You can have some players who stick to two or three lines, but have a myriad of different mid games that they can pivot between. And then you have players like in North America. I know we have Ram Kev, right? Who talks about saying, I can play anything. If I hit it, I'm going to play it. With, with that said, we do have the... the uh, second half of the scores actually never mind i apologize for that thought we had the second half of the scores but we actually don't going back to what i was saying though when you do have uh, all of this different flexibility in the, in the game available to you. You have all these different players who can play the game the way they want. I know, for instance, in Europe, a good example is the Italian player Luque. When going into the European regional finals, he, he had told me, hey, I'm only going to play a handful of different comps, but you know what? I can play them better than anybody else. And then we have players who, who are more willing to, to dip their hand into every single tree in the game and say, I am a jack of all trades and I will be able to make Make the most out of any situation that the game gives me and even on the, even on the complete opposite end of the spectrum you're gonna have the one tricks mm -hmm. no matter what and obviously over a small sample size one tricking not necessarily it it leaves you leave yourself a bit more at the mercy of the rng because if you just get garbage items for what you're trying to hard force and you just don't hit the units you just go eighth and it is what it is, and you just have a bad tourney. But if it works out, the one tricking, you can establish yourself as a one trick and get people to just not contest you. Mm -hmm. So you can make sure you're uncontested every game. And in regionals, Balotelli is, I think, 
the example that sticks with me if he was hard forcing sins every single game and him once you know that someone is going to slam sins every game you don't really want to contest them yeah that is the beauty of a one trick when you just assert your dominance on the lobby and say you guys can contest me but you're not going to win because i'm not i'm not going anywhere with that said we do have our next lobby ready we're going to be taking a look at lobby a for game two of the peanut butter cup number one so let's take a look at the players we have We've got W29F, Peaky, King Dan's Nakashi, B Chris, Stinky Abuser, and Brixton. We've got a handful of players from the last game as well, I would say, right? Yeah, look at look at some some new people, see what they're playing, and we're we're gonna get to also see what some of the players we actively got to see last lobby. We we can see what they're gonna play again, see if they stick to some of the same comps or go more of the route of, yeah, I'm just gonna play whatever the game gives me have that like jack of all trades style but looks like we're getting into game and we are going to start with i believe king dan's yeah we're starting with king dan's first yep we'll see looking like he's got the kha'zix with a tear i mean hey could be a hand of justice i'm gonna I'm, every single game i'm just gonna say this is probably a chug bug game until it happens because one day I, i'm telling you one game is gonna happen we're gonna get to see it you just you really just want to see the chug bug and in all fairness i want to also see the chug bug the thing is you probably need to do it off a glove start yeah, with with your opening carousel item you're always pretty much saying what can i play that i don't mind getting infinite of this <laughs> item for chug bug infinite tiers not so great for something like spell weavers for the velkaz yeah i will happily take infinite tiers but when if you're trying to like hard force any kind of assassin comp, no, you'd rather have infinite gloves. So I don't think we're gonna get to see Chugbug here, especially with <laughs> yeah, with, with these drops. I think I think that, that this speaks is, for itself. You can still play this Dawnbringer opener. Has the Kha'zix too. You can 100% play Brawlers as your opener. You don't even have to play this Kha'zix. You can play the Ziggs as your backline. Mm. And it, it's this is how I think of Flex personally. Like Flex isn't. There's players like Mismatch Socks who can think of like every single unit on your board. How do I flex literally every unit? For me, I just think strongest front line, strongest back line. Strongest front line here, Brawlers. You already have the Gragas too. You have a Sedgen shop. What's your strongest back line? Maybe it's Kha'Zix plus a Ziggs. And um, wow. <laughs> that feels bad. You find the Nocturne. Actually doesn't opt to pick up the Sedge. Maybe trying to keep that Nocturne angle open, but I don't know about it. Yeah, that does seem a little tough. I mean, having tier rod, I mean, if you're looking to play Nocturne, it basically means you got to kill two items, right? Like you're looking to make Locket, you're making the look, making looking to make a Frozen Heart, but it's like, where am I going to get these two vests? Because I'm certainly not picking them up off the carousel. Yeah, and another another way that King Dance is looking at to kill this rod is with Rage Blade, which I, I really like Rage Blade Nocturne. That item's really good on him because of just he him loving attack speed so much but you're killing a bow yeah. that was natural drop so you're less likely to get them and you're killing a bow that you really want to be last whisper so the sins angle looking a little bit tougher and he's gonna opt not to level he king dance could level here for board strength but instead opting to save the gold in order to hold on to everything which i don't mind early you say you save the gold either way you're probably making 10 gold on two three so you save your gold you hold as much as possible and you just you leave your options open and have a lot of ways to go to build up a ton of board strength yeah, also able to pick up a Soraka there. It does keep the four Dawnbringer uh, option open. Definitely not going to be able to hit it now because he's still level three going into 2-2. Two, two. So not going to be able to hit Riven or Nidalee in this shop. Taking a look at his armory, he does have the cloak and the bow. I mean, we were talking about it before. If you want to make a Rage Blade, you need another bow. This is one way to find it. I think it's going to be a little tough to play Nocturne from the spot. And yeah, in fact, does take the the cloak unless he's making rune ants and it's really hard committing i i don't think we're going to see that though I'd, I'd be very surprised to see that no there's no way <laughs> um <laughs> there's good, good luck good good luck playing nocturne from this spot especially once you've not taken that bow it almost says to yourself yeah. mentally like i can't play i can't play nocturne anymore i've passed upon the opportunity to do so gets rid of the nocturne anyway can make 10 here most likely yeah can it always maybe feels, sell the zigs it always feels a little weird 
uh, to not level on 2-1 and also not make gold on 2-2. Two two. So I, I, I would be surprised to not see King Dan's opt to, to make gold here. I mean, like you mentioned before, though, there's nothing wrong with wanting to keep your options open if you want to keep everything there. But the reality is you do have two spell weavers. It doesn't give you any new outs and does opt to sell that zig. So makes sense. Uh, going to introduce a loss to the mix. So maybe going to be able to find up. Uh, Wait a second. Finds the Yasuo, but also found Draconic. Ah. So there's some options. Yeah, like two, three Draconic. This is going to be so much money coming in. He could totally could opt to play Yasuo here. Could opt for leveling yeah. leveling next turn, playing playing the Yasuo, just plus Draconic, plus Brawler. And you can play, you can easily slam like Runan's. Uh, take a glove off carousel, go Runan's Hand of Justice. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are two of Yasuo's best items. And honestly, don't even mind the lack of bows here. Yasuo doesn't need the RFC. He really likes the Rapid Fire Cannon. Don't get me wrong, but he doesn't need it. You can easily go Runan's Hand of Justice plus another offensive item. So just f finds the Yasuo early. Wouldn't be surprised to see a commit here. Yeah, you know, I I feel like RFC, we talked about it last game, where RFC is one of those items that supplements your already existing items, right? So to me, when an item exists like that, it says, this is an item that will cap my board. But if I make Runan's Hodge, Runan's Jeweled Gauntlet, I can make a board that's really strong, put me into a top four position, and then, you know what, maybe I get CC'd by these crazy late game boards that just have Ivor and Volibear, or whatever it is, but I'm going to be able to beat all of the low rollers who can't beat me before that point, and I'm going to be able to secure a top four. Yeah, and even, and sometimes even having RFC on the Yasuo can make him weaker depending on the matchups, because now we're at, we're seeing a little bit less of the Revenant frontline, because of the Volibear nerf, because of the Ivern nerf, it's still a strong front line. Don't get me wrong, but it's just a little bit less powerful and still really expensive. So we're seeing a lot of knights still as the main primary front line. And if the Yasuo has an RFC, you actually really don't like you really don't like RFC going into the knights matchup because Thresh exists. And if you have RFC on the Yasuo, you have to you you have to play some kind of Thresh bait in order to deal with that, make sure he doesn't get hurt. Now, with that said, we're moving on to Nakashi. And did you, you're seeing what I've seen? Uh -huh. I've, I've seen, I see, I see a sin spat into, I've, you know, actually, no, I don't think we're seeing, I don't think we're seeing it. There no, I don't, I don't think we're seeing uh, Chugbug. I do think we're going to see some open fort sins though. And, and you know me, I love my, myself some open fort sins. This is going to be a lot of fun to watch. We're probably going to see Nakashi lose streaking for quite a while now. Doesn't want to risk winning even by slamming that that uh, assassin spa spatula right now. Uh, but having an assassin spatula while also having a bow, and honestly, when you just have one cloak, it's not that bad. It can still be Runans if you can find yourself another bow actually a pretty good spot and i would say 74 hp going into the final round of stage two it, that feels like 100 hp when you're open fort nocturne for sure like the baseline for pure open fort is 56 hp if you don't play a single unit most games at the end of stage two you're going to be 56 hp so anything above that it's you're killing units you're giving yourself that little bit of extra room and especially with open fort nocturne if you can get to 4-1, you actually have so much more gold to hit your board. It actually feels so much better. It's just so hard to do in a tournament setting yeah. when all the stage two, stage three boards are so much stronger than on ladder. So the Kashi, there's a good chance they're going to go for it on 3-5, even though they are a little bit healthier. And the good, but the great thing about Open Fort Sin specifically is the Sins you're going on back on units, these Kha'Zixes save so much HP. One shot to Senna, not going to kill this Olaf, but 66 HP for open, more or less open fort, making the eco intervals you need to. That is nuts. Yeah, that is really great. And Nakashi actually attempted to lock the shop. I did see that. I, I would not have been opposed to that decision. One of the nice things about having three, uh, three Dawnbringer at the end of stage two. Oh, wow. It does hit the ribbon anyway, is that having four Dawnbringer plus Brawler uh, throughout stage two three will save you a lot of HP. And and it's exactly like you're talking about before, Jirachi. When you're playing open fort, the goal is let me make it to four one. If I can make make it to four one, I'm gonna have a billion gold. And <laughs> we're gonna get to see the uh the assassin consume. I I 
I think that Nakashi is going to be able to 4 1 at this game. Kha'Zix and the Nunu are both going to kill so many units, especially with the Sinspat. There's a good chance that Kashi can find or assassin on stage on stage three use that to save a ton of hp if they win a couple rounds they can go to 4-1 100 percent able to still make 50 even holding these three costs yeah if a They're soraka not... comes in here yeah no, not gonna hit soraka but does hit legionnaire if he wants to play that uh plus ribbon so yeah i agree definitely gonna have a pretty strong board through stage three much stronger than i would say the average open fort board at 3-1 yeah, and when you're playing these open four boards, it's really just killing units. And Kha'Zix kills units. Nunu, especially jumping into the back line where the units tend to have less HP, gonna kill units. Mm -hmm. So this this saves so much health over the course of these fights. Nakashi, if Nakashi can make it to 4-1 with around 30 HP, they're gonna be in a nut spot. And I, yeah. really, I really think they're going to be able to because I do think this board is going to kill enough units to get that done. Yeah, and you know, the other thing to consider, oh, unfortunately, Kha'Zix uh, losing the 50-50 ends up on the Thresh instead of the Vein. Might be able to kill it anyway, though, uh, is that typically when you are playing this open fort, oh, wow, able to win the round. Wow, that's actually, that's not bad. If yeah, no, can, that's okay, that's okay. They can, they're, mm, this is this gets a little weird, because you snap your streak, you lose a lot of eco because of that. But if you can get a little bit of a win streak going, if you get two win here, then you that can actually do quite a bit. I actually wouldn't mind a little bit of rolling here. You have four Dawn to possibly power spike. If you find a couple more Sins, you can power spike. That way you have four Brawler as an option. Rolling on six feels like something you don't really want to do playing Sins, but it can stabilize you so hard. It saves a ton of HP and then it gets you to four one. Because at the end of the day, Eco doesn't matter if you're dead. <laughs> Very true. And with that said, we're taking a look now at Peaky's board, who's got the skirmishers up and running. He's got an Italy with Ginsu's as well as an Olaf with BT. All right, so when you're seeing these items, obviously looking like some sort of AD flex board, uh, do those items speak any of the, the AD carriers specifically to you though? Um, you kind of rule out Jax because of the Rage Blade, because that's mm -hmm. just a completely dead item on Jax because he already has attack speed ramp built into his kit. Hits the Lucian, but it kind of rules out the Lucian a little bit with the current item setup. You really need a dedicated damage item. BT is more of a sustain item. Rage Blade, not a damage item on Lucian necessarily. Well, like a, a damage item that specifically amplifies the power of one shot of his ultimate. Rage Blade, mm -hmm. you get a bunch of shots out, but into a four night board, a bunch of shots that all tickle doesn't do anything. And he only has half of he has, he has a vest, doesn't have half of a damage item for illusion. Can still play delusion anyway. It's going to do a ton of work. It's still going to clean up the units. If Tiki finds a good radiant item for illusion, finds like finds a radiant death blade, finds a radiant IE, then can totally play illusion carry here. And besides that, can maybe go for Felios, maybe go for Akshan, maybe go for more of the Rangers route. Yep, we're going to see him take that round over Nakashi's assassin board. Looks like we so we were talking about before, Nakashi did not roll. But with that loss, does confirm that Nakashi is going to get first pick at Carousel. So when you're playing from a spot without any gloves as assassins, I mean, we're probably going to see Nakashi looking for something like that off this Carousel. And we're probably going to see Peaky, like you mentioned, looking for a, a damage item. Yeah, and Peaky, with, with the third pick, not the best spot to find the damage item. But you also... You have two carry items already. It's okay to actually go for a frontline item here. You, you confirm that you don't have any frontline items right now. You have two damage items. You have a thieves gloves, which is more of like a secondary carry item and opting to take the rod, which I'm not, eh, you, you're opening yourself up to not to, if you take a radiant carry item, what does this rod do? I mean, you can kill it on a Galio by slamming an Archangels, but that's about the only thing this rod's gonna end up being. So it's yeah, it's one of just those... me. I would love to see something that you can slam with this vest. Could have gone for Sunfire, even though it's fallen off a little bit at this point. The Sunfire is still okay to take, or could have gone for more of a Bramble vest. Kind of balance out 
your items a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, you were talking about before how third pick does tend to give you more of that defensive tree, right? But like when you're when you have two offensive items, you could look for those items for a Galio, for instance, or for a Rel or whatever it is. So yeah, you could have gone for vest or for belt for Sunfire. You could have gone for vest for Bramble, even cloak for gargoyles would have been fine. There were a lot of really strong defensive options there. And it's about leaving, what power are you leaving off your board? By taking this rod here, you're saying, I'm going to save this for better items, maybe, but you already have two carry items. You, With Radiant Armor coming up, you don't need to prioritize those carry items as much, and you're just leaving power off your board. And we see in this Radiant Armory, has I see a damage the, item. Gauntlet and Demon Slayer. Yeah, we see damage items here. Takes a demon, so I yeah, do like this demon that makes slayer sense. over the Jewel Gauntlet, just because we're in an AD build because of the BT. So Ooh. the Jewel Gauntlet makes a little less sense, and the Demon Slayer, it's a bit, bit more well-rounded of a damage item. We, we go over to Nakashi, has a hard choice between Zenith and Titan's Vow, but also, <laughs> you know what? You've got Last Whisper, you've got Zenith Blade, you've got half a Runance, you've got a lot of strong things, and you have four assassins plus a Tome that you can now use on the next round to guarantee you have one extra assassin in, uh, giving you a slightly better chance. But you're making a face, are, are you thinking maybe something else off that, that Radiant this, Armory? This is an insane spot. I'm also thinking it was Radiant Titans. I think Radiant Titans is actually one of the most broken items in the game right now. It's an incredible amount of stats, and that little bit of survivability actually it allows Nocturne to get that little bit of extra work in, get that little bit of extra damage off. And Infinity Edge, especially when we're most likely going to have six assassins, this Infinity Edge, this Radiant Infinity Edge, almost kind of it becomes overkill. Mm, yeah, I, I will say another thing about having the Titans. I was once not a believer in Titans. I rec recently have become a believer. But when you have an open belt, it means that you now have an option for Zeke's. When you have Zeke's plus Titans, you're stacking that way faster than normal, meaning that you're getting much more value out of. Oh, my gosh, Come out on. of that Titans. <laughs> that's a hit. That is a hit and a half if I've ever seen one. I mean, it's actually, that's exactly what you're looking for. With this Nocturne board, you're really looking for four sins plus plus a revenant, plus like decent frontline that can be sentinel and find some folly bear. Okay. Okay, this spot's officially nuts. As long as Nakashi can find a Nocturne 2, then he's good to go. Another tome? Are you kidding? <laughs> Second tome? Okay, okay. Imagine Please. though. Find Doctor. Okay. <laughs> I'm done. I'm I'm done. And the <laughs> okay, let me just say the rest of the lobby is is so thankful that you don't get an extra point for first right now. Although not hitting a, a okay. second revenant well, or one first try. Okay, doesn't hit. Oh, doesn't hit on <laughs> no, either. No, you know what? Who cares? Doesn't hit yeah. the sins bad off either. I don't care. We found Viego. Yeah, it we doesn't even matter. It doesn't, doesn't even matter anymore. Wait, no, we don't have six in. We're missing Pike. As soon as we find Pike, we have six assassins. <laughs> look at look at that Diana Jesus too. Christ is bored. Yeah, I mean, all right, that's this is something else. This is definitely you something know, else. I've always been, and I've said this a lot. Hitting of one of the five costs you like for assassins is actually not unlikely on seven. When if you're going for just that one percent, this one specific five cost, it's pretty unlikely, and hitting that's a high roll. But when you have two five costs you're going for, that 1%, on average, you're actually expected to hit one of those every 60 shops, approximately. Mm. So you, I just, one or the other, and either spikes your board so hard, finding both though is insane. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you add the two tomes on top of that, I mean, that's just, someone, someone's definitely high rolling quite a bit. Oh, oh wow, Iron nice. Two. Iron okay. 2 is good here. I mean, needs to find the pike, does find the pike. You can I play like six this assassin. Role so much. You, if you find the pike, your board spikes an absurd amount. Uh huh. And it, do, it doesn't cost anything. You were on 40 gold anyway. And this, this is a little bit weird. Yeah, the items, the items are a little weird. I mean, you have a couple options. You could make the, the Banshee's Claw, you could save a glove or or a belt for Zeke's. Yeah, Banshee Claw, Banshee's Claw makes a lot of sense. It also still keeps the option open for Zeke's and Runan's, depending on how this next carousel goes. I was going to say, though, this looks weird. You're taking out the Volley Bear to opt to keep in Rakan, and I think it's correct because you really want the Sin Spat to go on Fiddlestick specifically. We don't have Fiddle, and you don't need Volley on Stage 4 to be incredibly powerful. You have 6 Sin, you have Diego. 
you can you can see his Nocturne board. What is that? A six unit win over B Chris? You don't need the Volibear Bear right now. You can just you stick that in at level eight. You're good to go. And honestly, Nakashi could just straight up push levels from here. Only has three Nocturnes. Six Sin, even from this spot, you can still top four pretty easily just off finding a six Assassin. You have the Volibear already. You have your guaranteed next level power spike. It's actually an option to level on four five. Get this Volibear in, go for a top four, play it a little bit safer. Nakashi, of course, could opt to just stay slow rolling, go for the Nocturne three on level seven, go for more first or eighth, but they have options here of how they want to play this. Yeah, I think it depends on kind of who you watch. I know from what I've seen of Balotelli, this looks like a fast eight to me. If you're if you're Balotelli, I've seen him go eight in this spot over and over again. So going up against Stinky Abuser now, I mean, we did see Stinky Abuser is uh, has rolled quite a bit. Has got this Riven online with Warmogs and Titans. Does look like probably just some sort of item holder for the late game. But I mean, it, it does feel bad when you roll down sitting at 20 gold at 4-3 and then you take what a five unit loss there. It's always tricky because the the Viego uh, the the Viego steals might be actually a four unit loss. Four, I think it's four. <laughs> yeah, still either way does not feel great when you roll and lose at seven halfway through stage four. Yeah, and I want to say Stinky Abuser was rolling for something else besides that ribbon because the Warmog's Titans doesn't scream yeah. ribbon carry. But Nakashi, here's the thing. Here's the thing about Open Fort still has their first pick. Mm -hmm. It's so low mm -hmm. HP, they're win streaking, they're the strongest in the lobby, and they still have their item priority. They can get even stronger. They secure the bow, they secure the rune ants for Nocturne. So Nakashi now, you know, I would not be surprised if Nakashi pushes eight right here mm -hmm. and says, screw my eco. I have everything I want. Finds a Nocturne though. Uh, this, that... could <laughs> this could prompt them to start slow rolling, yeah, finding yeah, yeah. this Nocturne. Hey, you know what it is though? It's just... <sighs> Holding that Voli on your bench, it just feels like so much value that could be on your board that you just can't really fit in yet. And I mean, if you do go, if you do go eight, find Fiddle, you're now looking at a board that's six Assassin, five Revenant, right? And it's like, how do you pass that up? That is a spike. I think I like this though. It's holding the gold, see how many Nocturnes you get. If you natural another Nocturne or two, you can just roll it down on seven, secure the Nocturne three and then go level eight. There's also a chance that Nakashi just levels levels to eight, sticks with the Nocturnes, maybe tries to find the Nocturne three on level eight, go for a bit more of a high roll, but using less gold to find the Nocturne. Have the top four secured, and then if you find the Nocturne three, then you can play for first. But holding the gold here is actually nice. If you see what you do, you're not gonna find Nocturne three before neutrals anyway. You hold your gold, you see what you natural, and you can play around that instead of automatically putting money into levels or slow rolling here. Yeah, absolutely. We, it does look like we're we're hopping on board with uh, who is this with B Chris right now, who is sitting in the middle of the standings, 43, just hovering right above that stimmy. Honestly, it's one of those spots. You're level eight. You know you're not going to be rolling your gold. You're going to wait till after neutrals. I actually don't mind losing this next round if it's only by a, a unit or two. Yeah, and with the Lucian one, there's a good chance that he loses this round facing a Jax 2. Jax 2. This yep. isn't gonna, this is not gonna be a good loss. Like, this <laughs> looks like a pretty bad loss. Going into Fortnite, two iron, just the two ironclad Jax 2, but that's good luck Lucian 1 getting through that. Well, so, I will- Able to snipe out a couple units, which is really nice though. Yeah, it actually worked out pretty well where the Galio was able to ult and then the Rel ult actually casted after the Galio had his full ultimate. So after the Galio had all the damage reduction, the Rel shield comes in to allow him to actually cast again. So even though he loses this, you, you he's got to be happy about losing by two units. That's a way better loss than I was expecting. And Peaky has the Jax carry just for now. Even even though I said the Rage Blade is redundant, it's still a Jax 2. It's still the best carrier of these items you're going to yeah, find. True. So it's more than okay to go for that. And this... Mm, that doesn't feel what great, you, right? What, what is from this? this? Honestly? Okay, hear me out. You go Night... Assassin... Okay, Assassin Spat. I was going to say, you can go Nightbringer Spat and play Diana Thresh. And this is a tech I started doing with Lucian because the Diana Thresh combo... Oh. Uh is so absurdly good because think about it diana you want you want to counter diana by cornering your carry and clumping around that that's what thresh does hit the corner carry mm. 
That's so true. Yeah. You know what? That's one of those things that people talk about in TFT. You have synergies that are, oh, a nice roll down here does hit Lucian 2 and the Rakan 2. Those are nice hits. You have units that synergize because of their traits, and then you have units that synergize because of their abilities. We've seen this in basically every iteration of TFT, and that's a great example of how you can use these units who may not exist within the same tree, but because of the way they act on the map, can be used in unison to make a really strong board. For sure. And playing around that it, and also it, think about what you're dropping in order to play that you're dropping a rel and a nautilus and it's only two ironclad you're not actually losing that much in order to play an absurd synergy an absurd unit synergy even if it's not inherent through traits that can just counter opposing carries completely and that can win you fights and especially if you get lucian in a good spot to snipe out carries then just all these unit synergies piling on top of each other, that can be so much value just off that. Hmm, another this... another armory coming in with a few more emblems. Hmm. The thing is, when you take, if you want to take, you know, something like, you don't you don't really take Cannoneer unless you're looking for four Cannoneer, right? You don't take Knight unless you're looking for four Knight, right? So it's like, no matter what you take here, unless you take a uh, an item, you kind of have to pivot your board around to actually make it uh, completely optimal. I like a knight emblem here, because four knights still has a lot of value at this point in the game, especially in this lobby. There's Jax, there's Lucian still. Against that Lucian we just saw with the Iedul Gauntlet, a little less value, mm -hmm. but because of how powerful the shots are. Cannoneer emblem is also okay. You really amp up your damage, but you'd have you have to find the third Cannoneer now. And here's the thing, the third Cannoneer you're playing is isn't a good unit like yeah. mf at this point in the game no items doesn't do anything tristana even more useless a fourth knight you find a find a thresh just a thresh one you already get a ton of value out of that so even the, even if the four cannon synergy is better if you manage to find that it's a lot of it's going to be in also unit power mm -hmm. so it's able to still wipe the floor with Oh, Brixton. Sorry, Brixton's board, yeah. I can't and, read. You know, but. one of the things about Brixton's board right now, he does have that Draven with Rapid Fire, the Radiant Rapid Fire, Ginsu's, and Giant Slayer. I mean, it's a lot of attack speed, not a ton of damage, but if you can ramp up, does a lot. The problem is when you have a lot of CC, like the like the Rel coming in, like the Galio who's taunting, you're doing no damage, and you're frontlining, so if you can kill that right corner unit of the Nautilus, you might end up targeting the Draven. It can be uh, or a a build that doesn't actually get to ramp up. So I actually like backlining here because of the RFC better than the traditional Draven spot of that second row back. The RFC, yeah, allowing you to put put the Draven in the back row, keep him safe. But the unfortunate thing this is a Draven one in a lobby with ironclads and knights and no last whisper. Yeah. Like I I'm of the, even not in a lobby with Ironclads and Knights. Last Whisper still does so much for Draven. In this type of lobby, everyone is playing all these defensive traits. Last Whisper is mandatory. And it's only a Draven one. There's not that much board power. It's starting to run through some things. It does get some great RNG actually on that Nidalee. Not the Nidalee not dodging enough shots, but not wow. quite enough damage. Just the blue buff Rapidon's Karma wiping out a Draven one. And that's the downfall of only having the Draven one. Even though it was pumping out quite a bit of damage, it doesn't have enough health off of only being one star. It's not quite tanky enough. So it just goes down there, loses the fight. But you know what? Brixton is going, Brixton's probably fine at this point. You have a one star carry. You don't even have a pair in sight. You have top six right now, can maybe squeak out a fifth from this spot. I would be happy with that. Yeah, definitely. And you know, I want to call something out though. King Dan, uh, we saw we saw him in the beginning of the game with the tier rod, ended up playing something down this Dawnbringer tree. I want to see actually what he ends up getting off Carousel because he's playing Dawnbringer Karma from ahead. And I did see if, if he can get that Dawnbringer emblem, could be in a spot to actually run a pretty wild late game composition. Although, depending on whether or not you have enough CC, it may be tough to deal with that uh, with that assassin board. Yeah, and we, we were talking earlier about how he had a Yasuo angle, did not opt for that Yasuo angle, opted to go instead into more of the Karma AP route, which is fine, it just depends on what you hit. The ru Runans we were talking about just ended up on Riven. It's just a secondary carry item. Mm -hmm. So yeah. good, good adaptation. I assume this is based off just the units King Dan's hit, so really nice adaptation. Yeah, absolutely. And I did see a Nunu with Dawnbringer's bat too. So we'll have to keep, keep our eyes on, on King Dan, see what he can pull out late game.
for Up sure. Now. And, but oh my god, this that Galio, that's that's a Galio with Bramble double war mogs. Good luck killing that. Yeah, that's gonna be a little tough to get through all <laughs> the whole is so sad. You oh know what god. though? The Giant Slayer, Giant Slayer plus Gintu's here actually puts in a lot of work, specifically because of the itemization of Galio giving him so much health. Uh, is he able to survive? Survives with one health. Maybe can still turn this into a fifth. I mean, at this point, Brixton is praying for a fifth, right? You're playing for fifth, and if you get it, then you are happy. You know, pr I I doubt it's going to be a fifth here. You're you're behind you're behind the lobby now, and you're there's. You have to pray someone takes a garbage loss and you take like a one unit loss. That's mm -hmm. the only scenario you can really take a fifth here, but sixth, sixth is fine. Not the end of the world, you know, it's not eighth, not seventh. Like mm -hmm. bot, bot two is honestly like, as long as you can avoid bot two, it's fine. It does feel bad though. It's only three games. You bought for one game that can put you out of finals entirely. So we'll see how the points shake out and we'll see how, like if, and we can see if someone who ends up in finals actually took a bot for see how taking that one bad placement affects things. Yeah, you can see Brixton was positioning for the assassins, but uh, ended up against this this Jax with the Ginsu's BT Giant Slayer. We saw this in the uh, beginning of the game. I can't remember exactly who it is, but with that Jax on the Hecarim, that Hecarim is probably not going to live that much longer, but a huge Thresh Hook actually comes in and actually delivers the Jax straight to the Draven. So a little bit unfortunate. I don't know if he would have taken, if, if Brixton would have been able to pull that fight out either way, though. I mean, Peaky just takes them down. WT9F going out actually was playing the Lucian. We've, we're seeing a couple Lucian players in this lobby. Same deal. I talked the last game, you you were looking at the lobby and I couldn't tell you what patch it was on. Same deal. Like all the comps are just the same thing besides this one Draven player, which even we were seeing some Draven last patch. So it's not like it's a new comp that's coming up. It's more of a build that was around that just got better. Like I, I can't tell you what patch this is on. It's the same things. People are sticking with their comfort. They knew it worked the last patch. They know how to play these comps. They know it's still good. They're just gonna stick with it. And you can get a lot of value out of playing these comps that are just so in your comfort zone. And that's, that is the beauty of TFT. The best way to watch TFT is when you really get to see these players just play what, what the game has given them because all of the units and the compositions are balanced so well that really you just play to your strengths. And if you make better decisions than other players, well, you've got a better chance of, of top fouring. And especially with the scoring system that we keep talking about, playing for those top fours is, is exactly what you want to be doing. For sure. And so we're if we're on Peaky right now, find a Viego. And this is more or less the best of the capped version of Jax on level eight at least. Well has the Nico on board. If he high rolls another Viego, can just Nico for that Viego too, and that's what really caps out this board. But it's against Nakashi's assassins, and yeah. Nakashi doesn't even have Nocturne oh. 3. Opted for the I opted for the go level eight, hang hang on to these nocturnes and play for play for first off of finding nocturne three on level eight. Is top two though. Peaky goes down for in third and B Chris takes the fourth. So yeah, I mean and King Dan's managing the squeak out second actually. Not bad at all with karma. And he, but here's the thing: that tiny micro optimization found the nocturne. They should know Nakashi doesn't have nocturne three yet. Hold on to that Nocturne and grief, grief Nocturne 3 from Nakashi, then you have a better chance of playing for first. Here's the thing though, I don't know if this board can beat Nocturne 2 even with six <laughs> sins. Viego 2. Let's uh, well, the find Nocturne, Nocturne 3, is 3 here. anyway. Here, well, we'll Viego see. We'll 2, see how Nocturne it turns 3, out. 6 sins. You might as well just FF now, <laughs> honestly. Ooh. Yeah, I mean, uh, that car was in the middle of the stage. You know, she does not want to be there if there's anywhere on the stage she, she's going to be. It's just oh, an absolute. Whoa! Murder. Wait, look at that that Garen though. No, okay, yes, definitely still not enough. There was a second there though. You got this fully stacked six Dawnbringer Garen. He's got a lot of damage. He's got a lot of defense. But yeah, definitely not going to be enough. I, can see I, I hate to dash your hopes. It's I don't think it's happening. <laughs> Even with a Garen too. <laughs> Even though the the Garen does have Bramble, so at, at a Garen two, there's a shot that the assassins can't get through it but as long as viego's alive mm -hmm. that not allowing that garen to alt like this board is going to wipe out all of king dan's board there's going to be like a 6v1 against the garen most likely and at that point the viego on top of it it can't alt they can 
that assassin board can most likely just kill the garen anyway through all this tankiness doesn't manage to even hit the garen two finds a volley two which is still a really nice power spike and a gwen two actually so this is about the best chance that the karma player has a good diana alt doesn't quite hit the karma nocturne is going to be on top of the karma very soon goes into the revenant state gonna come back go the wrong way spin through the garen doesn't matter end of the day takes down the karma the sins player takes the first knocks out king dan's and that's gonna be it <laughs> since winning another lobby listen i mean we said it from what three from, from stage three whatever it was i mean that was a good spot to be playing assassins from i mean when you're when, when you're in akashi in that spot you've got you've got an, uh, an assassin spatula already you've got your six assassins at what four two i mean he had the revenant spatula as well he hit the viego on seven the volibear on seven i mean uh, listen the stars aligned for nakashi I, I i think we can chalk that one up to a little bit of hyrule but with that said, was also able to manage his economy and his health well. And there's still, there is definitely still a level of skill expression in being able to open fort and be able to save health. I mean, it's not easy. Yeah, sa saving health plus the decision to go level eight is something the less experienced players maybe wouldn't do. They see that one Nocturne, they're like, oh, I'm going to slow roll automatically. But going that level eight, when you know you have the power spike on bench and have six assassin, which still stabilizes you super hard, stage five, even without a Nocturne three, may, it's, I mean, it's assassins you high rolled and even low rolled the tomes a little bit. Like didn't find a second since bat, didn't matter. Still found, still found decent tomes out of it and able to take that to a first off of making some good decisions and saving HP early. Yeah, absolutely. All the, the stars aligned with great play combined. It led Nakashi to a first, and I'm sure we're going to see more out of them. But we have four more games on the day. But before we, we get to those, we're going to take a quick break. So please don't go anywhere. Stay tuned. We have more games in just a bit.
Hello and welcome back to the Peanut Butter Cup number one. We've got two games completed. We've got four more to go. And with that said, we've got the scores starting to shape up. We're starting to see the people on top, on bottom, where they need to be. In first, we've got Seek and Seek. Second, Nakashi, followed by King Dan's, Peaky, W2F, uh, 29F, Ano Aragante, Zul, Enoch, and Improbable Blob finishing it out at, at eighth place. Jirachi, what are you thinking so far? Um... I'm thinking I'm just, we're seeing some some players make some comebacks and also Seek and Seek establishing themselves at the top of the leaderboard once again, looking to make a good run, maybe take a second Monkey Bubble tournament in a row, going 3-1 so far. They were able to take the first over in the other lobby. The other the other thing I'm noticing, Improbable Blob brought it back from that sixth in game one, I believe, took the second playing Yasuo. We're finally, we finally saw Yasuo in a game, not on the mainstream, but in the game off stream, found the Yasuo 3, found Lee Sin 3, able to take a second there, but over, um, but eventually beaten by Seek and Seek, who had three star Nunu, Heimer 2, Oof. Teemo 2, just a capped A bomb board, basically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've got we've got a lot of players showing up. I mean, we're definitely seeing a lot of variants. And one of the really cool things about what we've seen so far is that the meta is really allowing these players to be creative, build these mid game boards that can get them to the end. And when they do really show that they can out position their opponents and, and you know, take the win, take the top four. With that said, we've got Lobby B coming up for game number three. Let's take a look at who we have competing. Yeah, we've, we've got, got. Oh, you got it. Sorry. We got Peaky, <laughs> King Dance, Ano Aragante, Zul Enoch, White Lies, Tem Laws, BWG, Red Nightmare, and Arnold. A couple of these players we actually haven't seen. I know Red Nightmare and Arnold in particular are the ones that stand out to me. Yeah, I believe everyone except Peaky, King Dance, and Aragante we actually haven't gotten a chance to see yet. So we'll get a chance to see how they're going to end up doing. But I want to go back and just and touch on the comp diversity and not just in what people are playing, but in what people are winning and top fouring with. Yes, the two games on stream were both won by Sins, but over in the off stream games, we saw Karma 3 take first in the off stream game one, and then that A bomb board taking the first in game two. And we're, we saw, and we've seen over the course of all four games, I believe, I want to say, 10 different comps take top fours it's wow it, there's a lot of diversity in what people are having success with which is really cool to see yeah i mean you said it happened off stream the yasuo board did come in and, and have a super high placing we're expecting to see that today i i do want to see it on stream i think one of the things about those reroll comps those, those three cost reroll comps is you can't always just open for it and just you know uh, spike really hard on seven like Nocturne. A lot of those comps, you need to have a strong mid game. With that said, we're getting started with Ano Aragante for game three of the Peanut Butter Cup. Yeah, Aragante looking at the belt start, and I really like I really like that defensive start, especially in a meta right now where the balance is kind of between AP and AD. Going that defensive item allows you to keep your options open to go into either tree as long as you're comfortable going into either the AP or the AD tree. Having having that option open, you start the defensive item, look to slam the defensive items early. Whatever offensive components the game gives you, you just play around that and it lets you play super flex between those two styles of carry. Yeah, when I when I think of belt opener, my first thought is the people who like to play belt opener oftentimes like to play this strongest board early game, right? Because you have the things like Redemption or uh, or Sunfire or Warmogs, all of which can have a really large impact in these early game fights, especially if you can two star your frontline early. Yeah, especially because every every opener, every comp is going to use frontline items. Not every comp uses AP items. Not every comp uses AD items. So having having the defensive options open first, you can play those on pretty much any board. And even if your opener is just not in, I'm looking at these shops. This opener is just <laughs> not in for Aragante. <laughs> you can it's you can still find your way into reroll comps out of defensive items. I've played Nocturne as a vest start, like it's. It's actually doable. You can work those defensive items and you still have your carousel priority. You can still get your carry items. And right now, Aragante's opener could slam the Hand of Justice, could slam the Redemption. 
or just opt to see an opener that just doesn't do much, see the Nocturne, and maybe just off that the side, I'm just going to play Sims this game. Yeah, uh, like you mentioned before, not not the best jobs. does end up hitting the Kled 2, which is nice. The thing about the, the board and bench state of Aragante right now is that it's really hard to make a board right now that that makes you confident you can win this first round. I think most players at this at this state think I either high roll and hit someone weaker than me, or I probably am just committing to losing this first round. Actually, it looks like he might even be thinking about just full selling his bench. No, he's gonna put something in last second. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. always a tough spot. I think uh, yeah, Argante's, Argante's opener is just so awkward. You have a Kled 2. But, I mean, you have a Ziggs, I guess, for Hellion, but you don't really have any frontline. Ops, ops to not level, I think it's correct. Even if you level here, there's a good chance you don't even kill a unit. And if you've leveled and it doesn't save you HP, you're already so far behind. It's just, you put yourself in such a bad spot there by not taking this level here. You can hold everything, leave a lot of options open. And also by not slamming any items, you leave your options open. Has the blue buff could opt for it. Now has the Ziggs pair. Could totally opt to play. Now this Gragas play the Ziggs, slam a blue buff on it. That's exactly what he's going to do. Put himself in more of the AP tree. And like I said, start the belt. See what the game gives you as your, as your carry items. Play around that. Sees the blue buff, slams the blue buff on the Ziggs. Now you can play around that. Yeah, and you know, you have a couple different options. He does have this Leona pair in shop as well, if he opts to pick that up. I mean, you basically are looking at a place where if you run this blue buff Ziggs, I know you and I were actually talking about this like last week, when you have this Ziggs opener, it allows you to play something like a Karma uh, and also save a lot of health early game, which typically is one of the hardest parts of playing Karma because you need a lot of gold to get there. So if he does hit Ziggs too, and ends up hitting another Dawnbringer or a Brawler to build out a strong front line to buy buy time for this Ziggs, that he actually may be able to be in a good spot to play Karma, or if he ends up with more of these redeemed units, he can be in a spot to play Velkaz. Obviously, Velkaz would probably prefer a Sojin or a blue buff, but in the grand scheme of things, still a usable mana item for the carry. For sure, and you don't even need to put the blue buff on the Velkaz. If you have three damage items for him, I'm a big fan of putting the blue buff on Brand, actually. Using that to get Spellweaver stacks really going, and that just amplifies that amplifies Velkaz's damage. And you don't even need a mana item. Sometimes, especially if you can get a Spellweaver spat, get four Spellweaver in there, you actually don't want a mana item on him. Because you don't want him casting at the start of the fight. You want him casting once the Spellweaver stacks have built up a little bit. So, and then you can really use like triple damage items, maybe like a uh, high jewel gauntlet hand of justice. Mm -hmm. That plus a ton of Spellweaver stacks can be absolutely disgusting. But if if Aragante doesn't get three damage items for Velkaz, the blue buff can very easily go on him. Still an acceptable mana item for sure. Yeah, I remember back in the NA regional finals, we actually saw Pakigam running six Spellweaver in one game and had a blue buff on Brand. And I remember specifically that by the time the Velkaz had ulted, the Brand had casted three times. So the Spellweaver stacks are stacking up so much that when that Velkaz finally casted, it obliterated everything. Yeah, and that's part of part of the Spellweaver re rework, just being able to build up those stacks even before the Spellweaver rework. Re rework you want to build up you want to build up the stacks before Velkaz casted and even more so now that you can go over this cap of 10 and if enough units on the board cast you can get to maybe like 12 stacks fairly mm. easily and at that point the especially on the six spell weaver you you obliterate the entire board even on four spell weaver you wipe out boards and on two it's not a lot of bonus damage but it's enough bonus damage it can make a difference and a lot of times you just want to play for every little advantage possible especially at this high level yep uh ano Aragante does end up taking the belt for warm warm but we're actually swapping over to bwg red nightmare who does take the yasuo with glove off of Carousel does hit a Diana and a Lee Sin, so that's quite a quite a bit of Nightbringer. Is also very expensive. It's expensive and also like the glove Yasuo. All these Nightbringer, you have four Nightbringer already. You want to play Yasuo, but you have BT, so it gets so awkward. And yeah, I, you can play the Yasuo for now. It's two Nightbringer, two Legion with this Aurelio with the BT on the Olaf 
has to carry. It's not bad for now. It's just it feels bad. You want to play Yasuo with these items, but your items you've built so far just do not scream Yasuo. You know, and one of the hardest things about holding on to this the, this many units, and, and when you commit to not making gold here, I mean, you basically are saying, I have to stick within this Nightbringer tree. End up selling the Sejuani and the two poppies after winning the round so that he can make gold. Otherwise, you're basically trapped in Nightbringer and just praying that you hit. Yeah, and does opt to make the gold there, gonna make gold here too, on, on yeah. a win streak. Between being on win streak and making these eco intervals, Red Nightmare is going to have a pretty good HP and eco advantage over the rest of the lobby. There's a very good chance he's gonna get to level seven, fairly healthy with good gold, able to roll down for the four cost carry of his choice from the spot, easily Jax or Lucian, or it could even go Aphelios, but if you're rolling on seven, it's a lot harder to fit Aphelios besides, unless you high roll and hit him two star. But th this, is a, this is a good opener, is gonna be able to take this to, to at least for one, probably not beyond that, the Sentinel Skirm opener falling off a little bit at that point. Now, Ano Aragante is actually on the other side of this fight and does end up hitting a Kled 2 to hold that Warmogs and a Ziggs 2 to hold that blue buff. So you can see even though uh, Red Nightmare's got a really strong board, Aro Aragante is actually able to put up a pretty decent fight. A good loss for Aragante. The Yasuo doing quite a bit of work. No damage oh, items, yeah. still 3k damage. Now finds a Lee Sin pair. And this is, you know, I don't even mind if you don't get gold here. I don't mind holding this Lee Sin pair. There's, there's arguments for holding it versus selling it. Even if you hit it, it's your only... You can maybe play it on your level 7 board, but if you're going Lucian, sometimes you want to not. I don't mind holding this pair, because it can stick around for a while if you hit it on 2-star, and it's just so much power, even after getting nerfed. Lucian 2 still quite tanky, still deals a good bit of damage, and that attack speed slow on the front line, you just get so much value out of it. Oh, of course, yeah. It definitely it definitely has a large impact in these early and mid-game fights. And of course, a great holder for the Morello is able to deal that AoE damage when he does ult. Uh, also, hitting a lot of gold there, able to make gold sitting at 43, means he's going to be over 50 when he does level to 6, probably going to end up around 40 gold, and then has the freedom to either roll at 6, or like you said, uh, is probably going to be rolling at seven and may be able to just greed his gold until level seven and have a huge roll down. There's a world there that Red Nightmare rolls on six here, though. His board isn't that strong. It's only one upgrade, and it's the Senna. Has a Rallya pair, has Lee Sin pair. You, you're so rich, you can afford to roll a little bit of gold here, keep your streak going, save a ton of HP. Even if, even losing streak here, I don't mind rolling. You can you save a ton of HP. You put yourself in such a good spot that even if you don't really hit on four one, it takes a ton of gold to do so. You have the time to eco back up and still be in a good spot. Even leveling, even if you level to eight a little bit later on thirty. 3 HP, gonna opt to roll, finds a Jax. Oh. First roll and a replacement all off. Oh my goodness. That's and the nuts. hitting. Does he, does he have six skirm? He had six skirm. He had six skirm. <laughs> oh man. And hitting the Olaf does mean that if he wants to save gold, if he ends up hitting some of these pairs, he can actually just play six skirm, uh, three sentinel at seven. Maybe even look to go eight, eight if he finds that that board is stabilizing him enough. I mean, this is a strong board for three, two. Probably good. I, I want to say you opt to roll some on seven still. It's all one star skirms. It's not it's not that powerful for stage four, but six skirm with the buff. It's going. It's so stable in stage three, especially finding the jacks goes down here from actually not oh. great positioning into Arnold, who has Yasuo and that Yasuo being on the same side as the jacks and being able to target the jacks down before it really ramps makes a big fight difference there. But yeah. I, and I I like I like the roll there. Obviously, kind of high rolled. I also do not mind swapping out six skirms for Sentinel, which is a ton of attack speed. You also get a little bit of extra. You get a little bit of extra tankiness. You ha you have the stun on the Riven. You have Legion to boost Aureli just a little bit. All and all one star skirms. The shield, the extra bonus shield you get isn't that much because it's based off percent HP. So I don't mind this at all. You opt for some slightly better units. Otherwise, you would have had a Senna 2 sitting on bench and you get to play some still good synergies instead. Yeah, you know, something you called out before that's really important to note is 
this is a one star board. And when you have a one star board and jacks, and you have jacks all the way on one side, it basically means once the enemy backline has killed whatever unit is blocking jacks, in this case, Riven, which is going to go down pretty quickly, they're almost always going to immediately turn on that jacks. That's why we, we you often see jacks run with four knights and the Gallio or a Nautilus or something tanky right next right next to the jacks because it is able to buy time to give jacks more uptime to build up stacks to increase his dps and take over the fight but when you only have a one star front line especially something that's not supplemented with other traits like this riven that doesn't have dawnbringer it's really hard for jacks to stack up and take over the fight thankfully up against that last opponent who also had a generally one star board so uh you know takes that fight but i would actually say now that we've seen it in action maybe not as strong as we initially thought it was yeah and like you said all all one stars even we saw before we swapped they're able to find a rally too which is a huge boost to oh, yeah. the tankiness of that board gonna buy a ton of time for that jacks but we're going to swap over to temlaws who was running four knight two spell weaver with a galio a poppy two with gargoyles and the zigs with blue buff this is a similar situation to what we saw with Aragante actually who also had a blue buff zigs but this is a much stronger version of that board also on 40 gold maybe i can see I, I can see a world where they rolled a little on level six on three two to find this board because there's also there's a Galio, there's a Nautilus too, there's so many upgrades. Oh yeah. But this a good strong board, they're win streaking, they're in a really good spot to play just some kind of AP. And the gargoyles got nerfed, but it's still Galio's best item, allow that unit to live for so long if they opt to go for a knight's front. Yeah, I feel like generally speaking, it's a little bit easier to fit Velkaz into the Knight's front line because you have the Leona and Rel, which, which pairs well with your Nautilus. So you can kind of play that four Knight plus three redeemed at seven. Also does find the Radiant G uh, Jeweled Gauntlet, the Glamorous Gauntlet, still has a couple options though. So we'll see, yeah, ends up taking that. I mean, that is just a lot of damage. It's a little bit safer for now. You can opt for maybe the Sunlight Cape to if you're planning on getting to A-Bomb later, because you're going to get a ton of value out of that item with A-Bomb specifically, just duplicating that Radiant item. But right now, the Radiant Jewel Gauntlet is... I can, I can see it being better, uh, even though they have a bunch of damage items on bench already. Yeah. So, and go, go for the IE. Yeah, it makes a ton of sense. You have this rod left over that... You can go for like Archangel's Galio, you can go for maybe Morello on someone. You you have your you have a little bit of an imbalance of your items because it's a little bit more on the carry side, but a little bit more carry items just securing that damage. That three item carry is always gonna be a ton of value. You see that Ziggs blowing up the jacks. Oh but yeah. But Nightmare gonna take a decent hit, a three unit loss. And Temlaw is in a great spot, keeping the six streak into neutrals, 90 HP so healthy. Yeah, I mean, it was a little scary there for a second where Temlaws, the Ziggs was actually stuck on that Irelia 2 with the Radiant Bramble Vest. So it did look like the Jax was actually getting very close to that Ziggs. If the uh, Irelia had had lasted for even just a second or two longer, that Jax might have been able to take out the Ziggs. But in the end, Tim Law is able to keep his six streak, uh, getting that bonus gold every single round is looking in a very, very strong spot going into stage four. Finds another, wait, was that another poppy two off orbs? I believe it was three poppies, right? <laughs> three more, sure. Sure, I guess, uh, why not? Uh... <laughs> now, when, you, when you're in this position, uh, when you when you have this much AP, but you also have these knights. I mean, we've seen a lot of people opt to play this Invoker A bomb late game. It is a pretty large transition to get there. Obviously, you do have the brand. Are you thinking something like I want to keep these knights long term and actually play something like a four knight or keep this Nautilus and plus Rel, or would you actually opt to maybe even play uh, go for a large transition and play A bomb late game? At this point. At this point, Temlaws has so much gold, they can do a pretty big pivot. It's, they, they, this Ziggs saves a ton of AP that? by killing units. Like, you, you see these Ziggs bombs, right? Like, oh, they, it, they kill so many units that you save a ton of HP, even if you're lost streaking. This Velkaz, I think, yeah, it cleans up the rest of the team, but a two unit loss when you're sacking the level eight, that's, you're going to be more than happy with that. And with this over kind of overbalance of AP items, the Velkaz can still use that. You have a third item for Velkaz. It could go for this Archangels, could go for also easily a Timo Heimerdinger duo carry. 
Like you have a ton of options even with surplus offensive items. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm curious to see what component Temlas ends up taking here. I mean, I think the Archangels does make a lot of sense. I mean, I feel like it's a, a little bit more uh, versatile than the Rabadons, right? I mean, you could use that on, like you mentioned earlier, the Galio frontline, or if you are going for a Teemo, uh, Teemo Heimer uh, duo carry, like you mentioned, you'll have so much damage on your backline carries as long as you can buy time for them. Yeah, ops, ops for the Rod instead, I'm I think it was Archangel's a little bit more of that flexible item and also better on Heimerdinger. Like, Heimer, once Heimerdinger casts, Archangel's is basically a Rabadon's because <laughs> of how much mana he has. So, uh, Ops for the Rod doesn't slam a Rabadon's. No one to really slam it on yet. Just still sacking. This is a uh, five unit loss. Yeah, it's, these are still loss. pretty good losses. You think so? You don't think it? I feel like five five loss. I mean, the the I guess the the fact that he has so much starting HP makes five loss not feel as bad as if, for instance, he was at forty four HP or fifty HP going into four two. Right? For sure. And not you're you're killing you're killing units. You killed two units. The last fight it was only a two unit loss. Seven, Twenty HP lost so far in two fights. When you're sacking stage four, that is, that, that's really good, actually. You're not losing that much HP compared to like, you could have lost easily 30 at this point. So it's, it's really good spot. Probably gonna be around 55 HP going into a four five roll down. But if you find copies of your five costs, it's so easy to stabilize off that. Is that a Yasuo one on the yes. other side? That is a Yasuo one with double RFC and Runance. Uh, I mean, I know the itemization can be kind of flexible. That seems a little extra flexible. I don't know how I feel about that one, but it, <laughs> social distancing Yasuo. <laughs> it's a, you know, this item combo turns him into a four range carry. I'll say that, but still only a Yasuo one. It's still cleaning out. Wow. You know, Arnold is really lucky. They hit th th these two players are insanely lucky. They hit each other. Arnold with only a Yasuo 1 and Temla's sacking to 4-5, it's a, a one unit loss for Temla's. They're happy with that. And Arnold is going to be happy winning that, saving the HP. Both players saving HP there. Arnold was win streaking for a while off a of Yasuo 1. Still hasn't hit the Yasuo 2, but they're so healthy. I still think they're hitting Yasuo 3 this game. Yeah, definitely a match made in heaven that last round for sure. I, I mean, Arnold, did roll down to 30, which like never really feels great when you're rolling for a three cost and can't stabilize on, on a two star. But the fact that, like we just said, he was able to hit 10 laws does put him in a spot where maybe he can get back up to 40, maybe win another round, maybe natural Yasuo to get back up to 50, maybe even slow roll because he has such a huge health advantage. Now we're, we're going back to, to Red Nightmare, who is level eight. He's got a Jax 2 running the Sentinel Skirmisher board. And this is the part of the game where you have to kind of piece together what this late game board is going to be. Are you going to be playing something like a Fortnite? Are you going to stick with um, four, three Skirmisher? I mean, most of the time you see four knights coming through and a Galio 2 is exactly what you need to protect that Jax and make sure that nobody is turning on him. The four knight just feels so good with Jax because you're getting... You're getting three ironclad out of it. You can play the rel, and it's it buys so much time for Jax to ramp up. Also has the Titan's resolve. I actually think this is Jax's best items. The a lot of people really like the Runans, but I really think it's just better to just mow down mow down one unit, move on to the next. BT is the sustain. Titans just a bit more survivability to ramp up. Last Whisper helps kill one unit. Unfortunately, is the wrong side against Draven. You really want that Jax opposite side the other carry because you don't want it to get focused down before it reaches the carry and has enough time to ramp up and just run through that Draven. We talked about it earlier where, oh, he does hit Stimmy now. We can see uh, what he's going to get out of that. But we talked about it earlier where you want the unit in front of Jax to survive for a long time. Before, when we saw him in stage three, he had that Riven without a Dawnbringer. And actually, we're going to see him doing it now. I was about to say, why is the Galio not where the Rel is? Because the Rel is a one star Rel. That's not going to survive all that long, especially when you have a Draven with Last Whisper on the other side of the field. This Radiant Bramble Vest Galio 2 is going to survive forever and taunt any Thing that could hit the the jacks yeah and this oh this positioning jacks has a shot at wrapping go wrap to the ivern and probably target timo next 
Oh, and the no, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, never mind. It's gonna go onto the fiddlesticks. But is that, Cannon is just on the back line, autoing down that Teemo. Teemo goes down. Jax is gonna be able to clean this up, I think. Should be able to. That yeah, is a gonna, challenger gonna level Kennen right there. That yeah. Kennen carried that fight because if Kennen doesn't kill Teemo, that Teemo is constantly ulting the Jax, slowing his attack speed and putting him in a spot where he really he's not going to be able to take over because he can't ramp up. Sin Kennen. <laughs> Kennen who needs he's a back. sin bat for Kennen just becomes an assassin, goes into the back line, and this people underrate. Kennen's auto attacks, but he's still a skirmisher. He's still getting the ID, still gets good damage off the autos. If he gets to the back line, you can just auto down that Teemo and kill it, especially with the Morello burn on it and a decent amount of damage already applied. Now, one of the techs that I've seen uh, when people run this, I know uh, Piba, the North American player, does this all the time when he plays, is that late game, when you're playing Jax, you can actually opt to drop Skirmisher completely late game and actually uh, duo carry Gwen if you have the items for it. And you do have uh, a jewel, a, what's it called? A Hand of Justice. Ideally, blue buff would feel a little bit better for that Gwen. But late game, you could actually run Mystic where you run Gwen plus Fiddle or a different Mystic unit and have this Jax who is all of your AD damage supplemented by this Gwen with all of her AP damage. Yeah, but for just, you don't really have the secondary carry items so sticking with the skirm is going to be a lot safer i think and i like this qss e either way the hand of justice or the qss not a ton of value on kennen but if you get a viego if this kennen turns into a viego qss gets so much value on that unit you're playing for the future a little bit just because what you can play for right now isn't that great and i like that a lot okay I got to call out that QSS that, that you were just mentioning. That QSS saved this Jax's life because the cannon went into the back line, the assassin cannon, and then got the second cast to stun the entire team. And while the Jax was trapped on the A-bomb, he was able to stack up against the A-bomb, get to his max stacks, and by the time the A-bomb was dead, the rest of the team had become unstunned, but Jax was, had so much DPS and lifesteal with a BT that they just couldn't stop him. Yeah, that's... <laughs> cannon... Yeah, I'm Team Ken so forget good. Gwen. Forget for Gwen. Oh, this, this, Pete, there are a lot of units people sleep on. I really think Kennen is one of them. And the Morello Cannon does a ton of work. There's not a lot of units to set that can really use Morello, but Kennen is one of them. And he can use it really well. So good, good adaptation to the items and playing units that use the items specifically really well. And one of the things Red Nightmare was scouting there was that Radiant Frozen Heart. I didn't see who's... Uh, whose team that was on. But that is definitely something to look out for. Actually, it, looks like it might be, have been Aragante, unless there's another another player who has one. Obviously, that is an item that can be uh, very, very unfortunate if you get Jack stuck on that Rel who does have that frozen heart. But actually, Jack's kind of skipping around the, the Rel, walking all the way around the team, making rounds. But you do have the Jax on the other side with this blue buff VT stacking up against a team that doesn't have the frozen heart. But the cannon comes through with the Morellos, the stun, and able to kill that Rel, kill that Jax, and Nightmare ends up taking the fight. Yeah, well, I mean, once the once that Jax 2 gets past the Frozen Heart Rel, it's not even close, can kill the Jax 1 super easily. I'm surprised Aragante also played Jax. Contested Lobby had blue buff slam early, and I had written in my notes, oh, Aragante's probably playing AP, finds a Jax 2 finally. But that blue buff turned into a blue buff Jax. It didn't turn into AP at all. Has some AD items, so, you know, I don't mind it. Blue buff Jax, actually not even a bad option. You can stack up that ult super fast, but not the greatest spot now. Only, ha only has rail one, and these items are on the rail instead of the Galio. Galio one, a little bit more value than the rail one. The rail, rail one, even with items, sometimes doesn't cast. It gets gets the cast off here with the with the radiant frozen heart. The rail pretty much guarantees cast. I I will take my statement back. Now I do want to point out though we saw we saw Aragante play the, or we saw Red Nightmare play this same matchup but with the cannon we saw Aragante play it with the Viego you think five costs versus three costs a five cost win but when you actually see it in practice that cannon was able to buy time for the Jacks that the Viego just wasn't able to do yeah the the and that's also overall board strength and what was upgraded um. Red Nightmare had Jax, Galio, Rel upgraded. Those were the units Aragante didn't have upgraded. So the board strength just favoring Red Nightmare there, especially in the mirror. But we're down to top six. Zulunach 
and King Dan's going down in this 8th and 7th. King Dan's actually, I got the peak earlier, was playing Varus 3 carry. Wow. So, and that's not something we see that often, but I think for good reason. I don't, <laughs> I think Varus, I don't think it's worth staying on, staying on like level 6 or level 7 to slow roll for Varus. When Varus items just go directly on Kale, like Kale 1 can do so much work. I feel like you might as well just go level 8 and play for Kale. So, the Varus 3 not working out. We, we tried to innovate. Didn't really work out. As I'm seeing, White Lies has a Viego 2 in a con Viego contested lobby. So, sure. Why not? Man, so something to point out too is Dual Enoch, King Dan's, and Aragante all are players within the top 8. If Aragante goes out this game, it actually could mean that our top eight is going to shift a little bit, when, especially when you have three of the players who are looking to uh, to survive past the elimination round. And with that said, it looks like Temlaz is going to be able to take out this Jax board with his invokers. Yeah, just not enough frontline for Aragante. Gets run over by the invoker board. Timo, one of the greatest units into Jax, stops, mm -hmm. stops that Jax from really ramping up. So, going to go down in six. We're down to our top five. Wow, look at the health. It's that is, so close. That is a uh, nine health difference. Uh, Boop told me there's one thing I, if I was supposed to, to learn going into casting is don't try to do math. And uh, I did it already, but at least I got it right. But that's a nine health difference between fifth and first. And you know that all of these players are sweating right now. Yeah, for sure. And we can, <laughs> this top four could go all the way to like, I want to say six, three. But if we're looking at the current board, Temlaz, I love this though. Timo, Karma, Duo, Carry. These two carries, they're both RNG targeting focus. So it's very easy for like Karma to miss the say Heimer entirely. It's very easy for Timo to miss the Heim Heimer entirely. Both units, someone's gonna hit this Heimer. And if they both hit the Heimer, they can one shot even the Heimer too. However, Heimer two got the cast. So Ooh. even with even without an Archangel, still just going to wipe the floor with Temlaz. Yeah, you know, I was going to say it doesn't matter who they target when the entire team is clumped up in a corner, but the Heimer was able to survive the burst. And like you said, once he casts, I mean, he just takes over the fight. Even if he doesn't kill all of the, the enemy's units, he does so much damage that when you combine the CC of the Volibear, the Fiddlesticks AoE, the A-Bomb coming out, I mean, there's just so much extra damage in the comp that Heimer just needs to whittle them down and they will get cleaned up. Ooh, okay. I Riven saw that three. too, yeah. Riven 3 coming in from Arnold. Also trying to slow roll for Yasuo though, and it's a Riven without items, so I'm not even sure how much value that gets. And I want I want to see how many Yasuos that Arnold's actually on, because if they're missing a ton of Yasuos, that Riven is actually gold that you could be using to go for the Yasuo. Wow, and if the Nico you don't drop. Hit the Yasuo three. If you're down to like one gold and you're missing one Yasuo, that Riven three, the gold you spent on that could have been the difference. Yeah, I mean it's one of those things, right? Where oh. it's like, whoa! Fight Gear two and was dropped the Nico off neutrals. Gets the Nico with Timo. Has Timo two carry two? All right, Jesus. that's that's pretty strong. I mean, Tem Law is obviously not feeling great coming off a loss in the last round, but I mean, that is a cap board. I mean, that is very, very strong, especially for level eight too. I mean, I think it's going to be really hard for any of these other players to compete with that. We did see a Jax two on Red Nightmares board. I'm curious what's going on, but Arnold not hitting Yasuo three also was opting to uh, roll for Sedge three and didn't hit that either. Called it out. They didn't hit Yasuo three, but swapping over to, we get, we're we getting to really peak at Peaky's board. Mm -hmm. Level eight, more multiple five costs upgrade five costs on wow. level eight is apparently the name of the game heimer gwen and volley all upgraded red nightmare doesn't even stand a chance yeah i mean and we did have the cannon coming through and and trying to whoa hold on a second yasuo two okay beating that board wait that's kind of wild actually i don't think <laughs> i didn't see that coming yasuo Man, and he's so strong. <laughs> okay, how do you feel about he does? Arnold does hit the Sejuani three. I'm actually surprised that he didn't opt to just sell the Sejuanis and have extra gold for Yasuo. It does feel like if you want a capped board, if you want to win every single round, or even when the health is this close and you need to win the very next round, I don't really see the Sejuani making that much of an impact in the fight versus the Yasuo. 
It's really good frontline. Like the jump in stat and defensive stats from Sejuani 2 to Sejuani 3 is actually really good. And the Yasuo comp tends to lack a little bit of frontline. Mm. So finding a Sedge 3, you actually get a lot of frontline out of that, especially with 6 Nightbringer. The shield based off HP is so much on any 3 star. It's an incredible amount of frontline. But we're, as we're going over to this fight, White Lies is Draven. Wiped out by the Gwen, wiped out by the Heimer. This Hecarim, just on its own, gets wiped out as well. We're still... Oh, Red oh, Nightmare wow. goes Red down in fifth, out. just barely. So we have our top four. Kiki, Arnold, White Lies, and Temlaz. Now they're all going to be vying for that first place. If Arnold can hit Yasuo 3, there's a chance it can beat this capped Heimer board, but I still don't know. It's... Oh, it's close. I will say, I mean, you've got essentially uh, the attack speed based comps, and then you have this AP, these AP comps, and both of the AP comps do have the Teemo. So I got to say, it does seem at a glance that if this Teemo does target the units that need to ramp up, then uh, I, I think I would put my money on the AP comps. But we're not going to get to see that because they're playing each other. And really good volley bear positioning from Peaky. Go stun the entire Ooh. back line. Teemo ults the entire back line as well. Stops that. Stops the attack speed for just a second. How, how are these Heimer ults going to do? Um, the second Teemo ult comes in. Next Another Heimer ult, ult and that's going to do out. it. Yep. Emelaz yep. is going to go down in fourth. Wow. And actually squeaks out a third. Actually, that Arnold takes a bigger hit, goes down in fourth, then find the Yasuo three. So it's down to Peaky versus White Lies. And if the previous fights are any indication, I don't think White Lies stands a chance. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, bringing the Shroud in just... I, here's the thing, when you, White Lies comps, he's got this Ginsu's Draven, right? And you talked about it before. Oh, whoa, hold on. That's a Kale 2 that White oh. Lies has. That might make a difference. Because here's the thing, though. Again, it comes back to, can this unit ramp up, right? We've seen that time and time again. Does the Draven ramp up? Does the Jax ramp up? Well, guess what unit Peaky has that's really good at stopping people from ramping up? It's Teemo. So we'll have to see how this plays out, because if this Teemo can prevent Draven, prevent Kale from ramping up and taking over the fight, you have a lot of damage between the Timer Dinger 2 and this Gwen 2. So we'll have to see how it plays out. Yeah, but Peaky getting a Shroud, able to cheese the Shroud, is a huge deal. And this Kale 2 only has one item, only has the Giant Slayer, so you're not getting a ton of value out of that. That being said, I love this positioning. You're splitting up the carry so Teemo can't ult both of them. Gwen on the Kale in the back line, though. Bye-bye, Kale. Mm -hmm. Draven just trying to whittle away at this A-bomb. Gonna get destroyed by the Heimerdinger, though. This looks like the end of it. White Lies goes down. Peaky gonna take first in game three with the Heimer. Wow. I mean, what a final fight, too. I don't know if you saw, but the, the, the Viego was on the Teemo after killing the Brand. And when the Viego was about to ult the Teemo, the Lulu of all units came in clutch, ulted the Viego, allowed the Teemo to continue ulting. And again, like we've been saying this entire time, prevent the ramp up from the Kale and the Draven. Once the once the Draven was hit by a Teemo Shroom, I mean, it really spells disaster for that composition. So when the Gwen was on the back line, the Teemo was on the other end. Uh, I mean, it's just hard to lose that fight. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, Dr Draven, Draven, even even with his buffs, is he's he's still not going to have a great time into all these five costs into these incredibly beefy front lines, and even even with splitting up the carry, still going to get stuck on that bramble vest a bomb. That a bomb still really tanky. Doesn't not going to get a ton of value out of his healing from Legionnaire because of. Heimerdinger and the Grievous Wounds you get from that doesn't get a ton of attack speed because Teemo's slowing that. Even just a Teemo 1 you get so much value because it's just a random Frozen Heart on whoever. So that Draven just having a rough time, but you know, a second gonna... White Lies, unless, depending on how the scores were, if White Lies needed that first, not gonna be happy. If they only need a top four, that second is going to be put them in a really good spot. Yeah, I believe Peaky and White Lies were both sitting in the top the top eight already. So they're both going to be feel really good about securing their spot in top eight, depending on how that all plays out. But you know what? I got to say, we talked about Yasuo. We said at the very beginning, Yasuo is going to be in, in, in these games. And Yasuo was, we kind of expected Yasuo 3 to be the top four comp uh, or the top one comp. We ended up seeing Yasuo 2 <laughs> top for that game. I mean, it, it definitely goes to show that Yasuo has flexible itemization, 
if you can keep him safe. We saw double RFC allow him to just cast over and over again. And you know what? Who needs an extra damage item if you just have true damage that's casting from four spaces away, right? Yeah, pretty much. And the not able to hit the Yasuo 3, so it's only a top 4, but you know what? Top 4 with Yasuo 2, they're going to be happy with that, but we got some scores updates, so I'm throwing it to you for that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, let's take a look at our top 8, going to be uh, advancing to the final 3 games of today. In first, we've got Seek and Seek, we got Peaky, W29F, White Lies, Nakashi, King Dan's, Aro Aragante, and Temla is sneaking in that final spot. All right, Jirachi, what are you thinking based on what we've seen so far? I'm thinking Nakashi really likes that he got first with that sins because bar barely squeaking into his top eight and the bot the bottom five of this is actually I honestly bottom six like seek seek and seek way out ahead in first peaky not far behind then another three point gap to W29F and then the bottom five all just three points apart and in that scenario, when you got that first, you're very happy you got that first. So Nakashi gonna be happy. They got to play since they got the first out of that to squeak into his top eight. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that stands out to me is that I see Seek and Seek positioning themselves to actually take their second straight event hosted by Monkey Bubble, right? They were the winner of the banana, banana split coming into the back half of the games today. They're in the lead. And you know what? It's worth saying that because we don't have the bonus point of the first place finish, a two point lead actually feels way, way higher than it normally would because the, the point distribution is much closer than it than it normally would. For sure. Yeah, that's you. You don't get to make up a ton of ground by getting a first. You get, you still get to make up ground, like nine points, mm -hmm. still a lot for first. But you're not, you're not making up quite as much ground by getting first. So you d seek and seek feels really good right now. They're just at such a comfortable lead, and someone they they would have to bot four or three games, and someone else would have to go one 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 for them to fall out of like comfortable top four range in the lobby. So they Seek and Seek has to be feeling really good right now. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you just said it. I mean, you can play for a top four. You can play a little bit more conservatively. And obviously, when it actually comes to the game, the margins for playing for top four and top one, you know, they can be different. Either way, you still have to play well. You have to play clean. You can't be lazy. Playing for top four doesn't mean that you're on autopilot. You still got to work hard for it. So we're going to see these players definitely sweating it out, but we're going to see players like Temlaws really have to work hard to, to make their way back to the top. Yeah, and for, for players in the bottom four, when they see Seek and Seek and Peaky out to such a huge lead, it becomes hard to play for first, to play for that first, for that first place money. But... There's still prize pool all the way down to fourth. They can still play for, they can still play for top four. They can, they don't have to go into full first or eighth mode. I mean, you could opt to go for that in like the first game. If you get that first, then you can start playing for winning the tournament. But it's, you have your options of what you want to do. And if you play first or eighth in that first game, you go eighth, you probably wreck your chances of even top fouring the tournament at all in the last two games. So it's, depending on what players goals are they can opt to play safer they can opt to go for broke but for the players at the top they can play safe and that safety is still playing for first because they have such a big lead we saw this <laughs> we saw this with robin over in the na regional qualifiers went out to 1-1-1 and he was playing incredibly safe in game four and that was still playing for first yeah, definitely. And I think it's something to consider when you are one of the players at the bottom here is we're in the back half, right? So if that player at the top made that lead in three games, I can make up that lead in three games, right? I mean, by no means, what is it? 11 points between first and eighth. That is a lot. But if you have those top players falling into the bottom four because they become a little complacent with their lead, it is by no means impossible to see Temlaz uh, or Aragante make their way back up to a top two finish. Yeah, for sure. And actually, I'm also realizing Seek and Seek, that 26 point score line, it took my brain a second because I'm so used to 10 for first. They went 1 2 1. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When, when you realize that because of the nine points, you're, you're like, right. okay, Seek and Seek is popping off. 
So if they keep that going, they're looking so good. But we're going to get into game four. We're going to get into the finals lobby of this tournament for Peanut Butter Cup week one. Let's hop right into it. And we're going to be starting off with Temlaz, that current eighth place player and see. Let's see what he's going to do to make up this this advantage. I mean, once again, you see everybody going for those bows, right? It seems like bow is a contested carousel start for, for a lot of reasons. I mean, you can you can obviously play uh, Yasuo with it. You can play a reroll like uh, like Nocturne. Obviously, Glove is a little better, but Bow is by no means bad. But it also allows you to play many of these flexible AD comps that we've seen dominate the, the meta so far. Yeah, for sure. But with Tem Laws, the tier start screams more of the AP route. We touched mm -hmm. on this, I believe, in game two. Gets dropped the Glove. You have the Hand of Justice option. You... If you get dropped another tier, you have the blue buff right in front of you. If you're Red Nightmare, that blue buff turns into a Jax. <laughs> Fortunately, Red Nightmare is not in the final zombie. But um, it, and us, even this Hand of Justice, if you find the Varus here, you have a very easy setup to just go Kale. And it's easy even in Kale to burn tiers on frontline items, the Redemption, the Frozen Heart. You have you are very flexible out of this opener. Find a brand. That's huge. Because if you want to go the Spellweaver route, that brand helps out so much. And you just need to hit one copy. And if you can find the three stars. Oh my god, not excuse me, not three stars. Two star zigs. <laughs> three star zigs this early would be absurd. If you find the two star zigs, you can really ramp up that power. Has the brand brand pair though. You hit this brand too, you can very easily just start stacking that instead of the zigs. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Basically, you know, you've got the the knight front line, you have the Spellweaver back line if you can find a Ziggs, and really, if you can just stall for that brand to take over, I mean, he will take over the fight. The, the DPS from the brand is insane as long as the fight, you know, lasts, and wow. Just gets dropped the whole jewel gauntlet with a tier start and the brand pair. Doesn't Not bad. find Doesn't find another Spellweaver. Uh, but also, you know what? Honestly, not really in a position to look for the win streak anyway. So I, even though he, obviously you'd rather have the stronger board, it's not all that bad because it's not like he was relying on on hitting a Ziggs to find a win streak. Yeah, and not I would be shocked if they go for the level here. They have a ton of pairs on bench. Okay, don't, never uh -oh. mind. They're they're gonna sell pairs. You know, selling these pairs that don't fit into your board super well is fine. At this point, you look at these items and you do kind of think like, yeah, I'm just gonna slam this JG on the brand. Not gonna slam the JG on the brand, I lied. But there's also a route where you hold all these pairs. If you hit a Varus, if you hit a bow in the Radiant Armory and then a Varus, like you have Rageblade Hodge. There's your Kale angle right there. Yeah, I mean, it, this is one of those spots where maybe you're saying, I want to play for the higher, for the better roll odds. I want to make a strong board next turn based on the information I get from the armory. And this Callista is actually probably not going to be able to beat this Kled in overtime. Yeah, very close fight, though, if it were not for the Hellion buff. Uh, yeah. But based on what information Temlaz gets here, I, I would expect them to make some sort of commitment with their items. Yeah, and th that level for the random Callista actually made that made that a better loss. It <laughs> more perfect than perfect loss. We think of perfect loss as one unit. That was a zero unit loss. They lost one HP for that. So the level ended up it did end up saving HP, and they're getting decent roll odds. Finds a Yasuo. Oh, is it time? <laughs> they have it. They have Rabs. They have Rabs Hand of Justice. There's there's a world they just slam Yasuo here, even with. They can, it's hard because you don't have bows, but with that build, it's probably just one bow. You just go for the runans at that point. Yeah, ops to hold on to the Asuo, I think that's totally fine. I mean, they did level, so again, they can choose to pre-level next turn and kind of hold things on their bench. Does make the jeweled gauntlet uh, probably a little tougher to play. Well, actually, could still, could still play Yasuo, I guess, but pr probably not. I mean, you're basically committing... Uh, to more of the AP tree, especially because you now have to pick a bow off of the next carousel, and then you'd also want to get a glove. So maybe a little tougher does end up selling that Yasuo. I think that makes more sense when you're just kind of thinking of the game at a fundamental level, and you're just thinking like, what gives me the best chances to build a strong board? When you kind of have to dance around and say, yeah, if I get a glove, if I get a bow, then I can play Yasuo, then you're probably not making the right choice. End up getting the Spellweaver uh, in with the Zyra and making 10. So honestly, a pretty pretty nice spot. 
Ooh, okay. Slamming, slamming the Archangels because this this is strongest board on the Zyra specifically. But here's my thing: a Zyra one doesn't really kill units, so it feels it feels rough. Especially one round before Carousel, you could easily just take a blue buff here. Like, look at the Zyra. Doesn't kill anything. Zyra one doesn't even save HP. So, Temlaz has. Good items, maybe griefed his items a little bit by not greeting out. Could have gone for a brand carry instead. You have the brand pair. Like, I didn't like you, but like you said, selling the Yasuo there is fine. Like, you make eco, you keep your, you just, you see what's right in front of you and you go that route. We have spell weavers right in front of us. Let's just do that. Now, on the other side of the standings, we have Ano Aragante, who is on a three streak, going to be looking to actually five streak through stage two, if possible, running a four Hellion board. I didn't get a chance to see what components they have, but most of the time when you are last pick, you're getting some sort of defensive component, but does have an option for Rod. And based on their composition, could be strong, but Ops, oh wow, already has two Ziggs items. So I, I think that makes sense. You have two offensive itemizations on your Ziggs. You can take the defensive component, start to build out your front line. I will say you have a lot of attack speed, a lot of damage on the Ziggs too, but this front line is looking a little frail. Yeah, and with the mostly one star front line, I'm actually kind of surprised they leveled to five on two, three with that, that off interval. Usually when you push that super aggressive level, you're trying to maintain a win streak. But it's hard to maintain a win streak with an all one star front line, especially scouting around the lobby. I'm seeing some upgraded front lines. This Olaf too is going to be kind of hard to get through, especially when the Ziggs doesn't have damage, doesn't have Spellweaver. It's you built blue buff Gunblade, like good sustain, but it's not quite enough damage, I don't think. This going to get stunned by the Pike, going to get taken down by a Nocturne. That's your win streak gone. So that win streak you were trying to push with an aggressive level is just suddenly out the window. Or not, because the Hellions maybe, I, I lied. <laughs> Nocturne, I was like, okay, definitely Nocturne, you're gonna clean through the Hellions, and apparently I can't follow fights that well, because rats. <laughs> I mean, either way, I do think that, like, when you think about this board conceptually, right, then it's, it is hard to justify the level five, but the results speak for themselves, right? I mean, who cares if you have a weak front line, if you have this crazy sustain on Ziggs. I will say though, not having Spellweaver with all, and also not having any sort of rod item does make this Ziggs feel like he could be doing much more if his items were slightly different. Um, but if Ano Aragante hits a good matchup in this last fight of stage two and is able to win streak, I mean, you, you can't argue with, with what's happening. Yeah, this is, uh, with the Sedge two, this fight gets rough, but you know, you know what? You, that Aragante, low key, could have rolled here. Rolled a couple times. You have three pairs. Hitting any of these pairs as a massive frontline upgrade can really help out, can maintain a win streak because you're on the four streak and you want to maintain that into neutrals. And the Ziggs kill the Sedge too. I'm not sure. I think it comes down to whether this Kennen can cast and actually kill or actually stun the rest of the team. It looks like even with that, the Ziggs is not going to be able to burn through everything in time. So close fight, but it looks like nobody is going to be going into stage three with a full streak. Very, very close fight. Maybe. OK, we didn't hit in this shot, but there there's a good shot that Aragante rolls a couple times and finds a frontline upgrade and that one frontline upgrade can do a lot actually and especially when you're trying to maintain the win streak you would have lost the gold interval from uh going from 20 to 10. that one gold is nothing compared to the street gold you would have gotten back mm -hmm. especially if you can continue that into 3-1 3-2 i mean you're talking about three gold every round that's also helping you hit further gold intervals so yeah it is a lot of gold hitting a six gold orb definitely feels nice allowing him to still hit the 30 gold interval and also hits a glove and tier. Doesn't really need another tier item right now, at least. I mean, I would be surprised to see the Hand of Justice. Probably going to hold on to that and, and uh, wait to see uh, what other components he can get, either through Carousel or just a Radiant item. Never mind. What am I, I talking about? Uh, I don't like this. Uh, mm, it's, here's my th Gunblade Hodge. If you roll healing, where's your damage? There's this Ziggs, the, currently the Ziggs is showing having real damage on the Hand of Justice. Oh, uh, rolling healing, excuse me. Where's the damage? There's no damage here. You're healing off of not enough damage, so your healing isn't even that insane. 
and get, gets hooked is gonna get wiped by this skirm board from Seek and Seek. Yeah, and I gotta like, say, this is actually a largely one star board, not entirely, but largely one star. And if you're losing to that, I mean, it's gonna look, it's gonna, it's gonna be tough to burn through the two star boards that oftentimes do come through if people stabilize on six. So, uh, I, I feel like Ano Aragante definitely can roll here. And yeah, we are gonna see him hit the Kled two, the Velkaz, the Poppy two. I mean, all right. That okay, well, there's your damage. There's your damage. True. Rolling there, totally worth it, though. Even rolling a couple more times. I like that. You still have three pairs. You have Nautilus, Leona, and the Kennen pair. You're still at 20 gold. Your eco's still in not a bad spot at all. And if you hit, um, if you hit, like, a uh, brand and uh, some replacement spell weavers, maybe you can even transfer Zig's items. But this Zig's too going to be more than enough damage. Velkaz, no items with just two spell weavers, still outputs a good amount of damage. It's a stage three, four cost. So Aragante taking a couple losses, a couple more than would have liked to. But now off of a solid 3-2 roll down is in a good spot. On the other side, White Lies does have a two-star Nidalee with Last Whisper Infinity Edge. Uh, I did roll down all the way to 10, so it would feel really bad for Light Wise if, if for Light White Lies, if he does lose his fight, is able to dodge and the Nidalee is actually able to clean up the fight. So feels very good for White Lies to not lose there. Uh, for Ano Aragante, does lose, is able to keep the streak, loses by one unit. I actually don't know if winning that round is as important as it would have been for someone like White Lies. Wait a second. Aragante has four spell weaver, he and I really it. do, and plays it. I really do think it's four spell weaver here because it's so much damage, and the Ziggs is lacking damage. Like I said, it has double healing items, so now four spell weaver becomes your damage. It's gonna fall off just without the spell weaver spat, just because you still have to play the Ziggs to get that four spell weaver trait, unless you have the spat and then you can drop the Ziggs. But now, now your damage is in two upgraded knights. Four spell weavers, your carry spell weaver upgraded. This is a solid board. Yeah, and we're gonna see this Ziggs cast what four, five, maybe six times before the Velkaz comes through, which really allows the Velkaz to open up and clean up the fight, and that's exactly what's gonna happen. That Velkaz beam, no items. Wow. Just four spell weaver, one beam, 2.5k damage. Ziggs putting out 4k. Like that's that's a four spell weaver diff. Just straight up. Yep, we talked about it before too, a couple games ago, where if you do have that Spellweaver spatula as well, it actually opens up to put the blue buff on somebody else, like a brand, and power up your Velkaz who has three full uh, offensive items. Where, where in this case, if you have the, the Gunblade on Velkaz plus a Radiant item plus a Hand of Justice, that Velkaz is going to be putting out a lot of damage. So we'll have to see if that option opens up uh, later on in the fight or in the yeah, game. But we're going over to Peaky, who's playing Vayne. And I know this is this is one of the comps you were looking out for, actually. Mm -hmm. One of those comps that was like around the last patch, wasn't super prominent after the B patch nerfing Vayne, definitely fell off a little bit, but it's still good. It's still very playable, still pretty strong. And Peaky opting to go for it has finds the eighth Vayne. I, I'm totally down to roll it down here. Maybe the maybe the thirty. You sacrifice a couple gold of interest, but if you hit the vein three here, you can power spike. You can win streak into neutrals, and opting not to roll down here, even just one vein off. You, I wouldn't. Me, I wouldn't go to like ten gold, zero gold, just for this vein. No reason to send it completely yet. But you have Vein 3 as a power spike, you have Thresh pair, you have MF pair, you have so much room to spike. Sacrificing a few interest gold, if you roll the 30 here, you're only sacrificing 3 interest gold. And you can get that back through wind streaking. And even if you don't get it back, you don't hit your power spikes, it's still a little bit of investment for such a big possible payoff that even if you don't hit it, it was still worth it. Now going into the Radiant Armor, you'll see it does find two radiant defensive items which feels really great when you already have three items on your vein and now you can start itemizing this hecarim does hit hecarim two as well you know i think bouncing off what you were saying before it's it's an important part of tft where it's essentially this triforce of economy where you have your gold your board state and your health and all three of these things play into the tempo of the game and where you're and going to end up so uh, i agree with you that sacrificing your economy for two rounds to be able to hit vein two 
two is, yeah, sure, maybe I'm going to end up having five to ten less gold, maybe even less than that, actually. But if I have 20 more health going into stage four and a three star vein going into stage four with two star Hecarim, two star Thresh, three star vein and a radiant defensive item on your, your Hecarim and two quarter baits to protect your, your vein, that's going to feel way better than five gold is going to make you feel. Oh, for sure. And yeah, lo long run 20 HP or five gold, it's probably 20 HP. And this fight, I think is vein three diff. It's... <laughs> it's such a close fight and it doesn't even give you the radiant blessing yet so it doesn't it hits the vein three here's the thing if we assume like this the same shops would have come if you had rolled instead sooner would have hit this vein three on three five and that would have been that that would have been the board strength you need to save a ton of hp and also also would have had a three win streak going into neutral so you're getting gold back that way yeah, I mean, I feel like the margins when you're playing reroll are are a lot smaller than than um, other comps. I mean, Peaky is playing more conservative than maybe he normally would be because he is in second. I think there's an argument to make about that. That saying, it's okay if I lose a little bit of health. I'd rather cap hard, even if I have if it, even if I take a bad loss late game against these super capped boards. At least I'm going to be able to beat the roll the the low rollers because I'll have more gold than them. So I I see the argument for staying above 50, but I would say, generally speaking, I would agree with you that rolling down to fine vein three saves you 16 health in that in that spot, and overall probably can make the difference between a fourth or a third or a second when we typically see the health difference being about that large. Honestly, I'd say, I'd say that the safer play is actually rolling down there, saving the HP. If you, we always think about playing safe as playing for HP. So playing for HP, there actually is the slightly safer play, other rather than greeting this out. You don't need carousel priority. You see this vein three rip through W 29 nine F. Uh huh. Yep. And I'm just sitting here thinking, what if we had this on three five? Yeah. Well, well, I would say at this point, oh man, hitting the dragon's claw is oh, really nice. Holy. Okay. Wow, this all right. This puts oh, see, so I am actually not exactly sure. From this position, would you prefer to stay level six, roll for Nautilus, Hecarim, Thresh, or would you rather push to seven and roll there to cap your board and still have the potential to three star things? See, in a different lobby, you can roll on six still. I think it would be correct to roll on six still. However, B Chris for a moment was contesting calves, has pivoted off re-rolling that comp, but there's enough players playing forgotten units that the gold you need to hit the three stars of those units, it does take more. And at that point, almost it just doesn't become worth it. Just on four Hecarims and you're staying on level six for so long. I do think it is correct here to push levels, find a rel, really amp up the tankiness of this, this Hecarim by getting Cav and Ironclad in immediately rather than having to spend a bunch of gold and sacrifice a bunch of rounds just to, for the chance at finding a Hecarim 3. Now, he does take that round, but I got to call out that Gwen, who Ano Aragante transferred those Ziggs items to Gwen, who is now running Blue Buff, Gunblade, Hand of Justice. And you know what? Those items felt pretty good, but not amazing on Ziggs, unless you had the four Spellweaver. They feel really good on Gwen. And when that Gwen is two star, I think we're going to see that taking over the fight. Yeah, Gwen carries something a lot of people have been sleeping on. Like, with the buffs, Gwen outputs so much damage, and you can go for a bit more of like a stall comp. You can run a bunch of Mystics, Knights, and Ironclads because Gwen is a Mystic. And also with the damage reduction, damage reduction is going to amplify the effective HP of any unit with a bunch of health, uh, flat reduction, or um, defensive stats, the armor, the armor and magic resist. So you just you can get so much defensive value out of this Gwen, and Gwen being a carry, you're no longer stuck with barely any damage with a full defensive comp. And we see this Gwen mm -hmm. doing so much work on Beakers. Oh yeah, I mean, Gwen, she's hopping around, she's Whee! ducking and diving. I mean, she basically has this, you know, built-in dodge mechanic, you know, where if she's, if a melee champion's on her, they're not staying on her because she's running somewhere else. If a range unit's on her, there's a chance she just runs out of range and they swap to somebody, to, to a different target entirely. So this Gwen is going to be able to deal tons of damage while the four knights stall out. And like you said, at level eight, level nine, we may just 
see Ano Aragante stick with the Night Tree and add Mystics in to just build this incredibly, you know, this Exodia stall comp with a Gwen just terrorizing the enemy team. Snip, snip, yeah. And I like it. And I love the adaptation too. Like, it, clearly, 1% of the Gwen, I assume, e either hit Velkaz 2 or. And the looked at the items was like not the best for Velkaz, so we're gonna go Gwen instead. Or just didn't even hit the Velkaz 2 in the first place and had an easy decision. I'm just gonna go Gwen from here. So great adaptation from Aragante. Looks like opting to not level here does get rid of the Cavaliers and is able to put three Mystic in. And it's exactly like you called. I mean, it is this Knight Mystic stall out the game, let the Gwen. Uh, deal enough damage to the enemy team to slowly whittle them down, or in most cases, one-shots them, depending on who they are, uh, but is going to be indexing hard on this stall out the game for a long time, and I'm sure G Gwen will figure it out. For sure, and you know, the level here is cheap, but I'm okay with not taking this level because there's not anything great you can really level for. You want to greed a bunch of gold for level 8 because you want to find 4 costs, you want to find upgrades for your current board, you want to maybe high roll a Gwen 2. If you can high roll a Gwen 2, you need as much gold as possible to do that. And Oh, oh, oh man, okay. if that Gwen cast had come through, it might have been enough at the oh, Nidalee 2 with the Radiant Ginsu's Last Whisper IE is able to take out this Gwen Knight comp. Does find a Rel. That is a nice hit. Adding Redeemed, adding uh, an additional Ironclad as well. Yeah, and this level costs five gold with the so the four gold extra gold you put into levels is gold you're not getting. I've from this spot, unless Aragante goes nine, which kind of looks iffy for this lobby and the HP and how close it is. You it's four gold you lost from putting that extra tick into the levels and this one interest gold. So it's five gold versus the seven it would have been last turn. But now we have a better unit to put in. So there is there is justification for taking this level here rather than last turn. Yeah, the uh, Radiant Thieves Gloves, the Rascal's Gloves, does give the Frozen Heart and Zephyr. Is able to Zephyr the Poppy for quite a while and buy some time for the Yasuo. But this Gwen is coming through. We'll have to see if the Gwen's actually able to take out the Yasuo, Yasuo on the Gwen, and the Yasuo does. So the two-star Yasuo actually stabilizing W29F's board very hard through the entirety of stage four. He's probably very happy about that. And uh, Ano Aragante does high roll that Garen. That's got to be, that's got to feel good. And you know what? That's a level eight diff. So taking that level eight just a little bit earlier maybe gives you a natural shop with the higher cost unit you want. And here, that, that five cost Garen very likely that would not have come if he hadn't taken that level so and it's a little bit of hindsight but even, even like hindsight aside still worth it in the end looking at these components looks like it could be something like a redemption plus gargoyle on the front line not sure if you'd prefer to have that on galio versus garen we'll have to see does find a second garen also has rel 2 online does find a galio as well We'll see where he puts this. Offs to keep the Leona for the three redeemed buffs. It takes out the Thresh. It does lower your DPS or your uh, CC, but finds a Garen two and a Galio two. I mean, that is a roll down. That's you hit what we hit. Galio two, Galio Lux, Rel, and Garen two. Like, okay, that that's a roll down, and you still have ten gold. You still do have the possibility of going nine. Actually, go nine, find the Gwen two. <laughs> Oh my god, this Gwen is a terror. And with this, like, this full oh. defensive <laughs> board, this Velkaz is not doing anything. Gwen just ate an entire Velkaz ult to the face and wow. did nothing. And I believe Hodge rolled healing for this Gwen too, allowing her to sustain through the Velkaz ult. I mean, she's literally in the middle of the laser and just ulting straight through it and going back up to full. Wow, and just like that, yeah, Ano Aragante. Uh, deals a lot of damage to Temlaz, who is now sitting at 6 HP. Velkaz casted twice and did 980 damage. Three Mystic, four Knight, also a Velkaz 1. Like, okay, in all fairness, yeah, it's a Velkaz 1. Good luck getting that Velkaz 1. Getting, good luck even getting a Velkaz 2 to get the damage off on this board, but Velkaz 1, no shot. So many defensive synergies, the Gwen just tank, face tanking everything, healing back up. Argante's playing for first. Gonna gonna eco up. If 
he gets the chance to go nine, he's gonna go nine. If not, maybe roll down, roll back down on level eight, go for Gwen two, and went off that. But looking looking very strong to play for first this game. A Peaky's board. We're back with the Vein three. Hecarim three is also level eight. So honestly, must have found that Hecarim pretty cheap because they uh, they <laughs> honestly were able to go level eight with a pretty similar tempo as the rest of the lobby and also have two different three stars on their board. So we're actually going to see the true damage of this Vein able to take out the uh, Knight Mystic Gwen board of Ano Aragante, which I think makes sense. I think that's a pretty fair fight to lose. Yeah, I mean, it's... Vayne, true damage into a bunch of defensive synergies. Vayne just ignores all the defensive synergies, mows down the team. <laughs> Honestly, shocked he found the Hecarim's 3. Don't think he slow rolled for it at all. Just kind of found it in his level 8 roll down or level 7 roll down. So I'm kind of high roll there, but that improves your front line so much and that feels so good. We're going over to Nakashi. Nakashi, doing the roll down. A Nocturne roll down. I like the roll speed. Not quite finding the Nocturne, though. Gonna just stop there. Not enough roll speed to find it quite in time. A little bit of gold left. But six, six Nocturnes. What do we have? 20 gold. Okay. 30 gold. It's still I would doable. Say it, Doesn't I, feel great, but still doable. But hits the Vayne matchup. Goes right on top of the Vayne. You know, Vayne, even at three stars, so little health. Because she's a one cost unit that nocturne two even can just mow straight through her but it's might get stuck on this hacker yeah got stuck on the hacker <laughs> it does get stuck on the hacker but i gotta say it is a rune and stiff where the nocturne is able to take out the majority of the team despite being stuck on the hacker was still able to get two or three different unit kills after uh, attacking the hacker so it doesn't feel great to lose that round but if you're nakashi i mean you have to expect that Nocturne 2 at 5-3 is going to start losing. The Pike 3 feels nice, but unless you get that 3-star Nocturne, I mean, you know, you're not long for this world. Yeah, and Stage 5, Stage 4 is when Sins thrive. It's it's when Nocturne really shines, but by Stage 5, you really want to be finding that Nocturne 3. The Nocturne 2 can still win some fights. It can still take really good losses. That was a really good loss. Got right on top of the vein, but not enough damage to get through the rest of the board. So yeah, Nakashi really wants this Nocturne 3 now, but it's so far off. Three Nocturnes off in 40 gold? That feels so rough to find. Still not finding Nocturnes. This is the downside of going for this Assassin build. Sometimes you just lower roll like this. Wow, not even hit. Where's one. Nocturne? That's my question. Yeah, just pivot to Yasuo at this point. He's got the rest of the Yasuos in his board and in his shop. Oh man, doesn't feel great. But uh, you know what? It can always be a positioning diff. That is that is very true about Nocturne, that if you can position well, well, and at night, it doesn't feel great. But you know what? Typically, there's still hope for for Nakashi if he can run into a couple of matchups that feel all right for him. Yeah, and this Nocturne, you know, it's mowing through units. It's getting good kills off. I don't see it getting through this Gwen and Garen or Galio. Oh my god, this, this Garen gonna just all get the shield off. Oh. Gwen maybe can clean up. Am I gonna oh eat my. my words? Gwen get what? taken down actually. Okay. Wow, I I, I gotta call out the Volibear ult there. The Volibear ult was gigantic on uh, the enemy team's board. Came in huge. And at first I was thinking that it actually was a Morello's diff because Nakashi passed the Morellos at Carousel and instead uh, opted to, to take the Hodge. But you know what? Nakashi pulled it through. That was a very, very impressive fight and could be key to Nakashi actually pulling out a top four here. For sure, and we're, as we're poking around the lobby, some of these boards are nuts. Kale 2, Yasuo 3, I believe essentially was in there as well. Suddenly, Ooh. honestly, this Gwen 1 carry is starting to pale in comparison. It's just a one star 5 cost carry. Like, some of these boards are just nuts. Diana, though, right on top of the Kale. Kale just doesn't get to play the game, but this Draven just getting the time to ramp up with the Radiant Ginsu is going to make its way through the Sin board. Ooh. Nakashi on one life now. Takes a bad loss, could die next round. So it's going to come down a little bit to 6-1 Lottery. Seek and Seek, also on 7 health. Aragante will be able to beat W29F, and that's going to be huge for him. Allow him to go 9. Probably not going to hit the Gwen 2 at this point, but allow him to get that extra synergy in. And as... What is that? 
item dragon drops double Zeke's for the Nocturne player. Wow. Okay. You're, you, know, you're, you have to be kidding me. If Now, there is actually a world, uh, we talked about it before, 40 gold is not a lot of gold to find Nocturne 3, but Nakashi is high rolled enough right now. If he high rolls a little bit more and can find Nocturne 3 in 40 gold or 36 gold, whatever he ends up having, I mean, he's going to be in a spot to actually play for first. We'll have to first. see. Uh, Nocturne, honey? Any any nocturnes? <laughs> well, that's just unfortunate. <laughs> that's just unfortunate. As a sin player, I know how depressing this is. Oh yeah, I played I played a game recently where I where I was slow rolling at seven at a uh, six three and couldn't find nocturne three. Sometimes it just happens. I feel like that sometimes. Yeah. You know, oh, when did you he not hit sins, it? You you just have to accept sometimes oh. it happens. But this Diana is gonna be right on top of the Draven nocturne. I want to see where this Diana puts it. Is Diana oh. going to cast? Fesh came in clutch and didn't let Diana cast. Either like, way. I don't know if it matters, this Nocturne. <laughs> I mean, that Nocturne attack speed is Triple disgusting. Jesus mm -hmm. Christ. We're That's back on so board with Ano Aragante, who locks a shop for double Gwen. <laughs> I don't... What? Uh, what? Wait a second. I think it's not sell Draven. I think it's actually sell Lux there. No, there's no way. Oh, no, you, you've redeemed. Actually, it could be it. Actually, no, the only way to do it is Draven, right? I mean, what is the Draven doing realistic? I'm OK with this. You're OK with with I'm, three. I, yeah. Yeah. They're honestly. And ironically, I put double BT on the Viego. Just it's still it's defense for him. That's it. <laughs> Well, we have the Nocturne, the Nocturne coming through. We'll have to see if this Gwen's actually oh. able to take out the Nocturne. It is a lot of damage coming through with this Gwen 2. Yeah, oh no God. Nocturne 2 is probably going to fall off against the Gwen 2 with perfect itemization. I think that's a fair loss to Nakashi. Going to round out our top four and our top three with W29F taking a fifth, Nakashi taking a fourth. And now we're in a position where Ano Aragante has his Gwen 2 and is once again playing for top one. You know, I don't think Nakashi is upset with a top four. No. Top with four with Nocturne 2 when you're stuck on Nocturne 2 for that long and you're donkey rolling, you're just like, where's my Nocturne? Oh my god, where where is this where is this unit? You know, wouldn't be upset about that. I do I'm okay with this adaptation. You drop the mystics, it's there's no more magic damage in the lobby, and you do need a carrier for this random double BTRC you got dropped from Dragon, so Put in the skirms, you get to fit in three ironclad anyway with the jacks, and you can turn it into a secondary carry. I really like this. You know, we talked about it earlier. Oh wow, the Draven sniping the Gwen. And the Kale is finally ascending. Oh man, that's actually a wrap. That's a that's a lost fight for Ano Argante. He's still alive though, he's not dead. But we were talking before about how Oh, that's top two as well. Okay, well you know what? Okay. That was White Lies' as ghost. White Lies goes down in third, but you know who's the last player standing? That it's Ergante the vein. does not want to deal with. It's the vein. <laughs> oh, Good no. luck into the true damage. You have to pray that Gwen like sneaks its way into the back line, blows up the vein. Other than that, it's not looking great for Argante, but you know a second here is fine against the vein, which basically hard counters your board. I would not be upset with that. I mean, it, it's the one matchup you lose, and it turns out to be the only matchup you have to have to play at the end of the game. So yeah, you know what? I'll take a second and get out. And especially at sixth place, the difference between first and second is not that big of a deal. So I'm sure uh, uh, Ano Aragante feels pretty good about taking eight points out of this game four. Yeah, Aragante. The and this is where the nine points for first starts to feel actually feel pretty good for the second place mm -hmm. player but we'll we'll see it's coming might be the final fight viego not gonna get quite on top of the vein this hecarim actually it's, it's getting not getting focused by the gwen vein getting the time to free hit vein takes down the gwen that's gonna be it Piki takes down Argante, takes the first with the vein reroll and we've got ourselves a series Man, I mean, we talked about it at the beginning where we said we're going to see reroll comps, but we're also going to see these these four cost comps as well, right? We, the, the biggest thing I think we have seen, though, is like 
people need to stabilize on seven. They they can't afford to be caught with their pants down and not have a strong board at stage four, because if they do, they're going to end up having 30 health uh, by four or five and not enough gold to stabilize their board. Yeah, unless you're unless you're high rolling your early game and you can just straight go fast eight and still have 70 HP, you're going to be want to rolling on six. You're going to be want to you're going to want to roll on seven. You can get away with that fast eight on ladder, but this is turny. Like turny boards just tend to be stronger. And when when a few boards get stronger, then everyone else's board is going to get stronger. And if you're not keeping up, you're just going to take bad loss after bad loss. And so rolling on six and seven just to keep up with tempo, you get a ton of value out of that. So and there, so keeping keeping up with board strength is it's, it's so important for tourney. Something I do want to touch on though is just some of the placements. Deacon Seek had a very good lead coming into this, and is Peaky overtakes him. Seek and Seek took a sixth, and this this lobby has tightened up quite a bit. King, Dan King Dan's and Temlaws still stuck at the bottom in 17 points. But the rest of the lobby's tightened up, even with Peaky kind of jumping out with that first. Yeah, I mean, this is the part of the tournament where a gap definitely starts to form, right? We talked about it before, if, if Temlaws wanted to bring it back, he was going to have to really turn on the Jets and get a top two, top one every game. But then you have players like An Ano Aragante, who did start at six, worked their way up to fifth, and now, sitting at 24 points, is in a position where if they go 1-2, one, 1-1, two, 2-2, one, one, two, two, can actually sneak into the top three, depending on the placements. Yeah, especially when, especially when the bottom half of the placements start to tighten up a little, or really the mm -hmm. middle of the pack, then you really start needing to sweat out those placements. You have more people competing for those top fours. So it's, it's gonna get close, and we've seen some tight lobbies where the scores just get really close together and there's a ton, there's not that much parity, it's it's very easy for this to be a super tight lobby by the end. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's actually almost exactly what happened at NA Regionals where the first place started to run away and then you ended up having these four players fight for three, four, five, six, ended up coming back down to the last game to see who could sneak their way into there. Today, obviously, we're paying out the top four, everybody's looking for one of those spots, but obviously, the higher you get, the more money you win. Everybody wants to sweat their placements and place as high as possible. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, are we going to a break soon? I believe we're going to be going to a break soon. But after after this break, I believe we're getting into games five and six. And we're going to see who takes this because it's getting to be a really tight series. <laughs> All right, and we are back, back on board right now with B Chris in game number five, uh, starting with a chain. How do you feel about starting chain? I feel like it's gone through a bunch of iterations over patches and sets to be of varying strengths. You know what? I've been starting chain since like set 4.5. I the the chain versus belt start. I feel like is really just personal preference honestly and just for me i feel like there's so many good items that build out of chain a lot of them aren't even like the best items you really want to build but 
Most of the chain items are slammable. Sunfire, best best early game item. Titans, one of the better items throughout the course of the entire game. The only items you don't really like slamming are Rocket and and the Guardian Angel. You just don't get a ton of value out of them. So the chain start really flexible. Just one of those solid defensive starts. And B Chris here has some options. Has a new new already. Has Dawnbringers. Also has a Ziggs 2, just an entire Ziggs 2 and chop, has two-thirds of A-bomb, he hits a brand here, his early game set, just A-bomb spell leader. Yeah, I mean, this is one of those boards, honestly, where you can actually even consider, I mean, if you can win the first two rounds, the 2-5 level 5, because if you, if you hit brand, the next thing you really want are extra bodies to die because the faster you can have your A-bomb coming out before it actually the enemy team reaches your backline, the more uptime. Wow, that's a new new pair. Unfortunately that's not. Shot. Okay, new new pair. I'm okay, I'm more than okay to just play the new new pair here. You wanna hold on to everything else. I mean, totally just slam the jewel gauntlet on the zigs. It's not the best right now without spell weavers, but it's a slam. You can just say, I'm going to play Velkaz now from this spot. I have two thirds of A-bomb. I have a new, new pair. I can very easily just commit to Velkaz. Slams the Jewel Gauntlet. I really like that. It's not a lot of added board strength, but you are still adding board strength. And that's so important in these early points. Any little bit of board strength you can squeak out can make a difference. Yeah, I got to call out that this is probably one of the strongest non-synergy boards you can actually run at 2-1. I mean, he has so much board strength, despite the fact that he's not able to actually unlock any of those synergy trees and is able to actually take the fight uh, over Seek and Seek. So I'm sure he's feeling good. And hopefully with his next shop, he'll be able to actually get one of those synergies, whether it's Brawler or Spellweaver, either would feel good. Yeah, has the has the Gragas in shop, wasn't able to buy it pre-win, but the one the one gold for winning, able to pick up that Gragas, can now play Brawler. I like the tier here, finds the brand. Oh my god. Right, we're good to go. That's a hit. We're good oh to go. man. Yep. Yeah, you know he's feeling good. You know Literally the perfect unit to find. Now has now as a tier can go Shojin or Blue Buff on the Ziggs. He, and, I mean we have our board until 4-1. <laughs> we're good to go. And if you're B Chris, you're, you're sitting at, at in eighth place in the overall standing. So the only way you're back in the money is with two really strong performances to close out the game. So honestly, the, uh, B Chris was due for a win, doesn't have the goal to, to uh, do much else. I, but I do think that if he's able to win this game, I, I, I would be fine with the uh, level up at 2-5 if he sees that someone like Peaky, W29F, or Temlaz are able to actually contest his board strength. We'll have to see though. Yeah, and honestly, saving HP can still be a play for first. Like, having a strong board, being a 100 streak, even if you're not getting the carousel priority, you have really good items. You don't need that carousel priority when you have a carry item and a half already, and it's with the armories, with the radiant items, very easy to find your three carry items and a good balance of tank items for the A-bomb. That <laughs> A-bomb barely able to squeak out that win. Every, every little thing and hitting that brand is such a huge hit. Yeah, it absolutely is. And uh, and was up against W29F, who did have a very strong board, had uh, the Udyr upgraded with some items on it. So I think B Chris is, is in a spot where he's saying, just don't don't let me hit another strong board. Let me just have a free one. Let me get to 10. Or if he does lose, you know what? Maybe he does get to actually make that blue buff and gets to spike super hard. So. I would say odds are no matter what happens, he's probably OK with it. But it does look like he will be able to take out uh, Nakashi this fight. We'll have to see how the A-bomb actually hits. But yeah, he's just tearing through that front line. That's not even going to be close. Yeah, And Nakashi looks like he's open for it, has 20 gold and a weak board. I wonder what Nakashi's playing. Yeah, because those wait, items don't don't say Nocturne to me. They don't say Nocturne. But if he gets two bows, this is vain. That's a Zeke's Herald. That's mm. uh, that's half of Runan's and Rageblade. I I think that Nakashi is forcing vain. Like that's yeah. just my, that's just my call right now. I mean, twenty gold at two three definitely says that if you want to play reroll, you're in a spot to do it. And eighty six health going into Carousel is not not bad by any means, actually, especially when open forwarding. We'll have to see. Is going to be either be able to get a one cost or three cost bow. So I think if he does end up taking this bow, it does say that he's going to be looking to play Vayne. 
Yeah. yeah. And also, getting to deny a Bo Yasuo is also huge, because if someone here gets that Bo Yasuo, they can say, I'm going to just commit to Yasuo. But Nakashi is... The I mean, could still play Yasuo out of this, but playing Yasuo from 86 HP, actually, this isn't that bad. But you don't have board strength to back up the Yasuo, so there is a good chance that Nakashi just sells this Yasuo, commits to the vein, finds a Hecarim as well. This is this is looking good for a vein force, even though it gets really sketch on only one copy of vein on 2 5. Yeah, it's going to be hard to. I mean, the only way to buy the Hecarim is to sell. Uh, one of the Threshers or the Nautilus, Nautilus or go under 30. I think it makes most sense, yeah, like you said, to sell the Nautilus, pick up the Hecarim. You, you know it's going to be more vital to your board. End up actually playing the Yasuo. So, I mean, you said it before. It You'd rather have the board strength to back it up and uh, play with, with a higher tempo going into the mid game, but it is possible to play Yasuo from this position. And we do see Beakers continuing a streak with a win over Temlaz, who was one of the other players with a strong board and had streaked through the first three rounds. Yeah, Temo, uh, sorry, B Chris looks like he was able to pick up a belt off of Carousel, had the vest on bench, able to slam a Sunfire Cape. I mean, strong item early when you get it on the A-bomb, that's a duplicate Sunfire Cape, so you're just doubling the amount of procs you can get off of that. So B Chris more than set for this early game, even more so than we touched on before, but Temo's, we're looking at his board now, has a Ziggs 2, 2 Brawler, 2 Renewer, uh, this board does look, this looks like a strong board. The only thing is he matched in the Beakers, and that always it always feels bad to be the second strongest in the lobby because you're always praying to not hit the strongest player to ruin your streak. And because Temlaz hit Beakers onto five, ruins the five win streak. It looks like is he gonna win here? The Nunu is gonna go here. down, but it he looks like he'll buy enough time for the Ziggs and the Soraka yeah. to clean up. And you do have the Rakan healing up that Gragas. Let's see though, no, yeah, it looks like the, the that Udir will not be able to withstand the burst coming through the Ziggs and Soraka. So now you feel even worse because you had your five wins snapped on two five. You're just you're just broke now. <laughs> He's only at twenty gold, ninety four HP, twenty gold, not the worst. But his eco is just so mad now, just because he low rolled hitting B Chris on two five. So Tenlaz looked like he was originally positioning for an ab abomination board, right? Obviously holding the Kalissas has the new new front line and is now in a spot where he made the Soraka 2, also has the Renewer in with um, with the Rakan. So he kind of has to figure out what this mid game is going to look like, because I, I do feel like it's a little tricky, right? Besides just adding another Spellweaver, how do you really fit in that A-bomb? Yeah. Finds a Nikos, which is going to be nice. Makes a Kalista 2 as well set to? Uh, it's just everything. It's hitting everything in like the in not in not, not in a bad way, but like in a confusing way, right? It's, it's like, not what you really want to be hitting. Like the set two is like okay, fine. The Raka two is just okay, fine. Everything he's hitting is just I just look at it and I just think okay, fine. Like that that's the story of his board right now, and it's. The items are awkward because he has double BF and maybe he wants to set up for AP. Gonna Deathblade Callista is fine. Yeah, okay. Just use up use up the two swords. Archangels can still be a Galio item if you end up wanting to slam that. But with what he's hitting, it's so much that doesn't help him enough. And he's already broke. It's gonna cost so much money. If gonna make 30 here, which is the correct it's the correct option, but only gonna be at 20 gold on 3-2. Not even and, getting to roll. And I got to call out White Lies there, who's sitting on the Ginsu Deathblade Aphelios on 3-1 with a Nico on bench. Yeah. It's the Draven here and the Yasuo able to put in Legionnaire. I like the Legion here. I also, I wouldn't mind just dropping the Ziggs at this point. It's a Ziggs 2 without synergies. It's not contributing enough. The Soraka 2 contributes a lot more because it's Dawnbringer for the Gragas. You're actually contributing, you're contributing to your front line. You don't need the Ziggs for damage because it's not doing quite enough. This Soraka 2, you get so much more value out of this Gragas as your front line. And it, you can also sell the Ziggs to guarantee making this eco interval. Yeah, Temlaz going to have a hard time winning this round, especially with the Draven Hand of Justice. Ginsu is being hit by Peaky. The Draven, the the uh, Callista rather, is free hitting on that Yasuo or that Draven. 
but is not going to be able to clean up the fight. And Peaky's able to take that fight over 10 laws. What's the Soraka 2 to make eco? I mean, it. Yeah. His, his spot's just so awkward. Because he, he won, win streak for a while, looked to be in a good spot, and then faces one bad fight and is all of a sudden just falling off. So we'll check back in later. We're going to check in now with Peaky, who is our current points leader, has a Draven with a Rageblade Hand of Justice, which is doesn't even scream Draven. This screams much more like Kale to me. But using the Draven as an item carrier for the Kale, more than okay. It's a Draven in Stage 3. It's still going to do work, even without a Last Whisper. The other players haven't had enough time to get all these defensive synergies in yet. So you don't quite need the Last Whisper yet. You can still go, you can still mow through boards without these damage items. Any four cost carry on stage three really is going to feel strong. Yeah, but on the other side of the field, B Chris does have this new, new two with Abomination. We saw it all before, but I mean, he's got to feel pretty good about his spot. Sitting at 40 gold going into the back half of stage three. Kind of close, though. All right, that was a little closer than I thought it would be. Close, but B Chris still so strong, still 100 streaking. Probably going to be able to level to seven here. So, and we'll, we'll see why he takes off Carousel. Slam the Redemption on this brand. I love this. It's a it's actually a good slam. You don't commit to a blue buff to commit to like a Karma or have a suboptimal Velkaz item. Chances, I want to say chances are you can get a tier here. You can just take the tier here and have the blue buff anyway. We're just going to go for the belt. That's also fine. Um, but you just, the redemption, you get an A-bomb item. You get a frontline item early, which is going to have more value. And you still, you still have this open tier between Armory and this next Radiant. Radiant Armory, you're gonna find these carry items more likely than not. Yeah, we'll have to see what actually turns out. Does does end up going level 7, wants to keep the tempo up in the game, can play Draven for a Legionnaire, finds a Galio instead, a very strong unit, and can add the Knight in uh, with the Thresh. Uh, yeah, this is a pretty scary board, very strong front line, will buy plenty of time for that Ziggs to come online, so we'll have to see if he can keep up this streak through Stage 3. You know that if he goes into Stage 4, <laughs> He's gonna love that. Yeah, I and I love the rolls there. You're on such a huge streak. You want to keep it going. You dip from like thirty to twenty gold. Not that expensive. But I'm also gonna take back. I kind of wish I see, saw the blue buff there because now I'm realizing Beakers has a surplus of defensive items. Excuse me, drop my pen. Um, <laughs> as I. Going into the Radiant Armor, you don't want a surplus of defensive or offensive items. You really want to balance. Beatrice has opted to take an offensive component there. Would have had blue buff, JG, blue buff JG, Sunfire Redemption, two offensive items, two defensive items. You can take whatever you want off this. You have the option of the Radiant Bramble or the Radiant JG. Now you're going to feel a little bit more pressure to take Radiant JG specifically. You don't like you poke around the lobby. It might, it's probably okay to take Radiant JG, but you also see a Sin player and you want to take the Bramble. So it's, you put yourself in a tough spot, takes the Bramble, but now he just has one too many defensive items. Yeah, I mean, on the bright side, the nice thing about running Abomination is that you can kind of have an, a surplus of items because you can still itemize your front line and then also itemize the Abomination, but it, it creates this problem in the long term that you're that you're talking about where it's like yes it's still going to be very strong right now but when it comes time to to itemizing my front line i'm going to have one stacked unit and then one partially stacked unit where you may prefer to have a stronger back line because your front line is already three items itemized and if you get more defensive items in your next pve drop uh it, it may not feel great yeah that's it's just the principle of triple stacking a carry. If a carry that doesn't have three items just doesn't do enough damage, especially with against super stacked front lines and compared to other carries who do have their third item because of the items scaling multiplicatively off each other, having ha having all three items on a carry multiplies their damage by so much and lets them actually keep up. Beakers opting not to take a carry item, even if it's just a blue buff, which isn't the greatest Velkaz item, it's still a Velkaz item. And it would I think it would put him in a much better spot here. Does end up hitting a tier either way though, so definitely can slam that blue buff. I think I, I'd be surprised to not see, well, he could wait for armory, but- He really doesn't like blue buff. Yeah. He really uh, does not want to slam this. 
On the other side, we do see Nakashi sitting at 35 health. So I wasn't sure exactly if he did end up playing that vein or if no, he actually did transition back into Nocturne from that spot. That did not look like Nocturne, but you I know what? He made it work. That is a, that is a sin player if I've ever seen one. A true D-Gen. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but you'll I mean, that, wait, no, I saw a vein on Seek and Seek's board, but also didn't look like vein items. So maybe we got scared off a little bit by the possibility of being contested, but it's a Giant Slayer and Radiant BT. That's not a vein reroll. But you know, D-Gen's at heart. You're going to want to go Sins gets to sins anyway, has the carousel priority. If he doesn't get a bow, probably going eighth, but odds are he gets a bow and can bring it back. Yeah, I uh, honestly going up against the A-bomb here probably feels pretty good. Unfortunately, he does have the Bramble Vest on that A-bomb, so uh, not gonna, maybe not able to actually kill the A-bomb who has the Redemption and Sunfire as well, but definitely going to make it close. But it never feels great if you're at 4-1 playing Nocturne, you roll down and then you don't win the next round. This is a dangerous spot for Nakashi. Yeah, this is where you have to be winning rounds. If you are, you are losing rounds as Nocturne, when you are the strongest, then especially on just 30 HP. Like, what can you really do? Gets offered a Zeke's in this Radiant Armory, but it's not a Last Whisper. You really want that Last Whisper. So it's, uh, it's tough. I mean, it's a tough spot for Nakashi. Only four Nocturnes, 30 HP, no Last Whisper. The Death Blade Runans, I do like on the Nocturne 2 to stabilize a little. Not going to do quite as much on Nocturne 3, but... It's just such a rough spot. If you take one more loss here, you have to just dice the Nocturne, go for Nocturne 3, send it immediately, even though you don't have the greatest odds of hitting. Yeah, and there are some people who have spiked. I did see White Lies hitting the Aphelios 2 on 4-2. So if Nakashi does rotate into some of these stronger boards, he could be in a little bit of trouble. But right now, up against just an Aphelios 1. Or is that an Aphelios 2? That's an Aphelios 1. That's an Aphelios 1. So uh, thankfully, up against Seek and Seek, who... Only has the Aphelios one, but able to cast, not able to kill the Nocturne, so he might be able to heal back up. He does have the Rune Ants, and the Pike coming through does stun that Aphelios. So overall, going to be able to take this fight. So, uh, you know, buys one more life for himself. He's going to be getting one step closer to Carousel, and does hit another Diana, but he already has Diana too. So actually, doesn't even, doesn't even help that all that much. He really needs that Ivern. Yeah, I kind of need the Ivern. Honestly, the Ivern would even be better than this Fiddle just straight up because two versus three Revenant doesn't even do that much. And Ivern is going to be better for the front line, even with Daisy getting nerfed, the knockup getting nerfed. She's still a big body for the enemy team that, to get through. So that's that's the main front line for the comp. Fiddle just kind of dies, revives and then dies again. Not doesn't do enough for your front line here. I love this. Uh, always, you always, always, always need to reposition on Nocturne to make sure that you're getting the optimal fight. Is able to jump onto that back line, and uh, and here's the thing about Nocturne: it's uh, the positioning can make the difference between winning a, the fight by five units, six units, or losing the the fight by five or six units. It can be a huge positioning diff, and Nakashi comes in clutch there against W29F to win the round and send W29F back down to his health total too. So. Definitely feels good winning those last two rounds in stage four. You want to know what I will never understand? I will never understand assassin players who don't sweat their matchups <laughs> because like, it's the whole point of sins. You need to be sweating your matchups. You need to be sweating your positioning in order to win fights. And I, it's what Nakashi's doing. He's doing a good job of it. Got the Nocturne on the Lucian last fight and was able to one shot it and win the fight off that. And it's all positioning. It's one of those things you just have to do playing assassins. And he does pick up the bow here, so he's going to be able to make that Last Whisper on the Nocturne. That will be a very large spike. I mean, Nocturne uh, with Last Whisper versus Nocturne without Last Whisper is a very, very large difference, especially once you get into something where you're playing against a, a team with Ironclad and also hit the Ivern on that roll. So going to be feeling pretty good. Feel much better if he had a couple more Nocturnes, though. Yeah, I'm going to... I mean, it's just... It's starting to slow rolling now. You can... As long as you win the next two fights, you're in an okay spot. 30 HP on 5-1, still a good spot to be in. Like, you're not super unhealthy if you hit the knock 3 from this point. Don't know if you can go first with the current items. No Frozen Heart on Diana. Only one Zeke's, a Deathblade as one of your items on Nocturne, which is more of a let's save HP now rather than go for first. 
But if he hits the Nocturne 3, I think he's going to be good for top four. <laughs> Diana right on top wow. of that KO. Man. A lot of people... Okay. A lot of people hate Assassins. And I get it. I also hate the current version of Assassins. As someone, This is as someone who plays Sins, by the way. Like, I think the... Low-key, I think the current version of Assassins is not great for the game. There's too much CC in there. There's five... Once you hit Viego Volley, you have five forms of CC, and two of them are yeeting themselves into the backline. It's it's way too much for assassins. Yeah, the the name of the game right now for Nakashi is basically just going to be find Nocturne three, try and uh, go eight, find Volley, find Viego. Like you said, stack that CC one on top of each other. Uh, but in the rest of the lobby, we are seeing White Lies overcoming B Chris in health total with that with that Aphelios two. B Chris it did look like he's playing a Heimer Dinger. Does have the Archangels? You talked about it before when Heimer does finally cast. With the high, with the uh, archangels, it is a ton of damage. So, uh, also having three items on that abomination feels good, but the thresh coming in to stop the Heimer cast. Oh my goodness! <laughs> oh man! And the the turret ends up one shotting the Draven and has enough damage by itself to finish out the fight. That's got to feel pretty good for B Chris. <laughs> I'm just still in shock. I'm still in shock from that Heimer cast. I will. I swear to God, I will never get used to Heimer, like the third Heimer cast. Once you build up the Archangels, just one shotting things, even on Heimer one. But you know, I want to talk about B Chris's carry choice and what he was greeting these items for. It wasn't opting for like this blue buff for the Velkaz route for for slamming items that point you towards spell weavers. The spot he's in, he's in eighth place. He has 15 points. He needs to catch up. Opts for the Heimer to try and force the Heimerdinger out instead. Play first or eighth. Really play for this first here. And for the spot he's in, I actually do think that's correct. You need you need to get this first here to put yourself back in it, just to even top four. So you're not even risking much. What are you risking? Like your 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 risk is that you just aren't don't end up in top four at all. But you weren't gonna end up in top four at all if you don't get first here. So you just go you go for first. And I really like that tourney adaptation. Yeah, and B Chris has a very, very nice roll down, hitting the Ivern 2, the Fiddle 2, finding a pair for his Heimerdinger. Unfortunately, going into the Nocturne, but the Syndra throws him away. And actually, he might be able to win the fight because of that. We'll have to see if this Nocturne is able to get through the rest of the front line. But with the Radiant Bramble Vest on that Abomination, I think it's going to be pretty tough. And it looks like he's going to be able to finish off this fight. See what's on the Kashi's bench. <gasps> Zero gold and eight Nocturnes. Oh no. He sent it and missed. Again. Well, that's the life of a, of a Nocturne player. That's how it goes. Also not hitting a third Heimerdinger item on the uh, armory doesn't feel great. I mean, I don't, I don't exactly know. Is there a world where you ever take loaded dice here? You I can see of, it. You oh. already have a Bramble. I mean, you could take yeah. Ionic Spark. What? Spark Ionic, isn't bad. Ionic Spark's not that bad. The Last Whisper is useless. I kind of yeah, like this. I, I, I agree. Hyrule, yep. Got it. <laughs> yep. That's, yeah. That's one of the few cases where where loaded dice actually works better than an item. And obviously, there's uh you know more variants in it because he very well could have just used loaded dice and missed. But you know what? He's played for first. He wants to get in the money. He's got a long way to go. But if he can place first in this game, you know what? Maybe there's a conversation where B Chris can work his way back into the top four. Yeah, it's what's going to give you more power. I think is just the question. What's the bigger spike? Heimer two, or one of those items? One of those items, you already have your A-bomb items. One of those items doesn't do that much. A Heimer 2 does infinitely uh -huh. more. Like, you can see this Heimer 2 working. Yeah, I'm waiting for this second cast, but we're not, I don't even think we're going to see it. It doesn't even matter. The Draven will fall anyway. Seek and Seek may take another bot 4, which would not would not uh, be great for him. He was first place going into the back half of the tournament, but does avoid eighth. Peaky is going to take that after losing to the Nocturne board. And he, Nakashi actually found Nocturne three with no gold. So, you know, he's feeling great about that. Maybe he can sneak into a fifth, maybe, maybe top four, depending on how it all plays out. We'll have to see. Yeah, I mean, you donkey roll on seven. You just find that last Nocturne. That's more than okay. Mm -hmm. And Peaky, unfortunately, going out in eighth. I just real quick. 
There was a Shojin on Seek and Seek Straven. So Seek and Seek, you know, got the seven, <laughs> get him out. Yep. That's fine. Anyway, That's just how it is sometimes. Argante has a second straight Gwen carry. And it's the, this is the, we were talking about this earlier, like the Piva tech, Jax Gwen duo carry. Has yep. the items to support it. Unfortunately, this Jax isn't going to get to play the game. Well, hold up. Okay, it played the game for a hot second. We'll see. <laughs> then just the no Nocturne's longer did. Yeah. on the Gwen, but the Gwen's able to get away. The Galio ult is actually huge there, and be able to buy enough time to proc the Revenant. The Gwen ult comes through and is able to finish off the fight. Yeah, that was great. Even though Jax didn't get to didn't get to play that much, the Galio with the the Radiant Bramble Vest comes through. I see an Assassin spatula. I do too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, oh Nikashi, yeah. Nakashi's praying for a Viego now. That's that's about all you can do. Like the Sin Spat by itself isn't a great power spike unless you have the Viego or you have items for your fiddle sticks. Just a Sin Fiddle for five assassins doesn't do quite enough. It does, it, you know, stage four, it allows you to run something like three Sentinel at level seven. But yeah, I mean, at this point in the game, what is three Sentinel really going to do for you? And if anything, sometimes like that Kha'Zix is able to just get a quick snipe that feels really good and is able to kill one more unit. So not a huge spike for Nakashi unless he finds that Viego. We'll have yeah. to see, though. He's going he's gonna to roll down, I'm assuming. He's at one life. I can't uh, imagine. It's first or eighth. Sure. If you're not going to roll, I don't see a world where I, you actually take the uh, assassin spat, right? You're, I mean, if you're rolling on seven, you're praying to 1% of Viego. Like, I'm pretty, I feel like the math works out. Your odds of going eight and rolling 10 gold, you're actually, you actually have greater shot to find a Viego mm. than in this 20 gold right now. So, so I maybe mean, better to sense. use this time to sweat your matchups, find the best positioning. Does yeah. end up rotating into B Chris, who does have this Heimer too, and also a lot of CC, but the Nocturne's right in the middle. So if he's able to heal up and avoid the CC, maybe the, there's a world where the Nocturne doesn't. It actually looks not too bad. I mean, it's the Assassin Fiddle, but he's the Nocturne was stuck on that Bramble Vest Abomination. And unfortunately, Nakashi out in sixth place. You know, that's the reality of a Sim player. You say you're gonna just start slamming sins. As soon as you play the second sins game, especially in attorney lobby, people see you going towards the sins. Everyone takes Bramble Vest yep. and you just wanna cry. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. That is the tourney tech. I mean, you see people building out their boards to uh, deal with each player that they know may play something specific. So, you know, just the way it goes. But, uh, you know, I want to go back to Ano Aragante because this is the second game. You called it out before. Second game, we're seeing the Jax Gwen. And last game, we actually saw him hit the Gwen and then build the Jax later on. I believe this game was a little bit of the opposite, right? Didn't we see the Jax actually early game and pivot into this late game carry? So Ano Aragante clearly showed that he's able to play this comp and is familiar with how to play it at the different stages of the game uh, with different carries at different parts of the game. And he's actually able to beat B Chris's uh, Heimerdinger Abomination board. So that is a huge win. That's a huge win and it's, B Chris, it's, it makes sense because B Chris is sacking the level nine, trying to get all those upgraded legendaries in there, go for the Gwen two, eventually find the volley two, could go for a Garen two, but eh. <laughs> Garen, Garen feels like not a unit unless he's two star and stacked. So I'm going to just say not Garen, but as we're on B Chris's board, has volley pair, has a Gwen on board. Can sack one more is so healthy. Can sack one more level to nine on six two and roll for everything there. And has a good amount of room to spike on this board. Or gonna just level here, play the Gwen on zero gold. Uh hmm. honestly. You know, I I, I, I don't guess know. I, I don't know. <laughs> if you're trying to just play for tempo you want to maybe knock someone out next turn guarantee that you're top four i could see that it's also able to play two vola bears one short of the three bears we're almost there three bears <laughs> but actually if you poke around the lobby no one else has the eco to go nine so b chris is the only one who's going nine and is going the only one who's really going to be able to play this stacked legendary board so taking this level here you're just saying i'm I'm just playing, I'm almost just playing for top four here because I'm not giving myself the eco to really cap out my board and just be the strongest in the lobby. Takes this fight, but we saw Temelaz had a Kale too. 
And this Heimer, it's only a two item Heimer plus a tier. That tier is. It's just a component. It's not a third item. Takes down W29F. We have our top four. Beakers is in a good spot. But it's. I, I don't know. I, I don't like that level. Yeah, we'll have to see how it plays out long term. I mean, in the end, it's always nice to have an extra layer of CC in the Volibear. Bear. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like you're saying, when other people are starting to cap their boards much higher than you originally expected, then yeah, you kind of want to hold on to a little bit more gold. And Ano Aragante hits the Gwen too. So keeping in that theme, we're kind of finding that other people are able to make their boards very strong. And if Beakers isn't able to, oh wow, nice hit on the Volley too. If Beakers isn't able to keep up with a third item on Heimer, uh, and it starts to fall to some of these other strong late game boards like the Kale or this Gwen 2 and plus Jax, then I mean, I think he'll regret having not waited until 6-2 to actually level. For sure, and okay. Wait, White, White Lies and Temlaws both have Kale 2. Hold up, okay, this, lo I, <laughs> this lobby's high roll, it's official. It's a Kale 2 with Deathblade, Rageblade, BT, Wow. Please tell. Okay, no, there's. Th that is a please, Teemo on the other side of the me. board, though, right? Does this. Please tell. Oh. Okay, thank, God. thank God. I was going to say, please tell me this Kale does not literally 1v9. If it had Hodge and could heal off of the swords, there's a chance. But BT doesn't let her heal off the swords, that final ascension. So that's. A good sign for B, Chris. Able to take down a Kale 2. Temlaz, the other Kale 2, goes down in fourth. So Aragante's Gwen board able to take that down. B Chris finds another Teemo, able to Nico it for Teemo 2. Just that little bit of extra damage, even though you don't really have the items for it. Not bad at all. And it's a Gwen 2 for Aragante now, though. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to see. This looks like a very strong board from B Chris. Having the Teemo 2 as well is really nice, especially if it can get onto that Jax and is able to cast to slow his attack speed down. He hasn't yet, but this cast will do it. But this Gwen is just kind of free hitting and is able to heal quite a bit. And the Jax ends up actually on the Heimerdinger, and Ano Aragante takes a fight against B Chris. That Gwen is doing so much work. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh -oh. We've got kind of like a we've got kind of a rock paper scissors thing going on. Argante losing to White Lies, and B Chris losing to Argante, but B Chris beating White Lies. So it's at that point it is just about HP, and this, so it, there's a B Chris is probably top two. It just depends on the ghost RNG, because I believe it's a fifty when you face a ghost. At this point, it's just a fifty fifty on whose ghost you face, and it, and it depends on the the order of the matchups right now so Argante has a shot at going first if he can avoid white lies the next two fights and white lies takes two losses then Argante can go first easily now I see a Rakan being built and I did see the spatula so that looks like a renewer spatula yeah and that's four renewer on B Chris's board so when you who did he I mean ended up putting renewer on Volibear yeah. That is going to be a lot of CC on B Chris's board, huh? That's for for renewer one of those traits where it's such a good trait, but you hate playing the units for it. But once you get a spat, it does a ton of work. The Gwen does a ton of work. This Gwen, the Gwen is in the back line. Oh my! All right, all right. So you know what? It is a strong board, but we said it before. It is this rock, paper, scissors. We saw Ano Aragante take this fight last time. So we have to see if he does take this fight, Does is White Lies able to actually beat B Chris, or are we going to see the same thing happen before where B Chris actually takes it against White Lies and White Lies is actually going to beat B Chris? No, the Kuro came in. Oh, <laughs> no. Cruel up the Hellion, up the double Hellion. Oh my god. That's what, that's actually why you really want to play two Hellion with Teemo. Because that double Hellion can come out, and now that it activates Cruel, that doppel, the double Hellion specifically can win the fight, especially in the Kale matchup. So a lot of times, this Kale versus A Bomb matchup, Kale will mow the, its way through the entire board, and it'll be the last one standing, though. It'll come down to just Teemo versus Kale, and of course, Teemo will always win that. Now, we're going to have to see how Ano Aragante, B Chris, and White Lies change their boards. We're seeing the, the run back of B Chris and Ano Aragante. And here's the thing without any CC to actually deal with that. 
that Gwen, because of the QSS, she's able to just dive into the back line just like last time and start free hitting. But the Heimerdinger is alive this time. He did not die early. The turret is alive. Multiple cats are coming through. Another one comes out and kills the Gwen. So it does look like B-Kriz is going to be able to take this last Jack. fight. Jax. Oh no. Jax. Oh, oh no. That's the beauty. Of, that's actually the beauty of this. Argante won the last fight off of Gwen targeting RNG. This time looked not great, but bought enough time for the Jax to clean up. Even yeah. against the Heimer 2, just not enough to one shot the Jax and then it just sustains back up. And I'm not sure exactly who White Lies did play. He probably, I'm assuming he played one of their ghosts, but he also won that round. So we're going into a place where we have three players alive at stage seven. This is the point of the game where I, I'm not exactly sure how many units B Chris would have to lose by to get one shot, but there definitely is a world where he could get one shot from 27 HP. It's a 7-0. Oh man. That, so unlikely, unlikely, most likely two Un lives, but not impossible. Unlikely, but not impossible. And even, even if he dies, he probably guaranteed second. Mm -hmm. Because I believe White Lies and Argante are going to rotate into each other. So it's looking like third for Argante and second for Beatriz, maybe, and top, and top two for Beatriz and White Lies. And we'll see how that that matchup works out. But let's see, White Lies still powering up his board. Draven two has a secondary carry. Also has a trap call, which is. Pretty huge. Yeah, you can see Ano Aragante, he, he's expecting to play. White Lies, just like you said, is able to shroud the corner. I mean, doesn't really do much against the Kale, but able to get a couple other things. This Jax is on the rail and is able to ramp up. The thing is, if I have to choose between ramping up and it's a Jax or a Kale, I'll, I'd rather have the Kale. And we'll see, this Kale is on the Gwen. And the Gwen's back on the Kale, but not able to kill it. And this Kale is just powering up. But the Lulu cast, not going to do enough. The Kale leaves her final ascension and is able to take the win. Ano Aragante out. Let's see, was, was that a double kill? It looks like not. As we're going into the final fight, we have B Chris versus White Lies playing for top two. Yeah, B Chris actually able to win that fight. So. Yeah, it, we're down on top two and kick it close. And this, if it just ends up coming down to Teemo versus Kale, that's how you actually, that's how you hope to win a lot of these Kale fights. You hope it's just the Kale alive and you hope that you can get Teemo to cruel her. So, it, and that's going to be on good Teemo positioning, I think. Keeping keeping Teemo safe. I like this kind of like putting stuff in the way of Teemo. Mm -hmm. So it's more likely that he's going to be the last one alive. No, I don't exactly know because I so White Lice doesn't actually have a thresh, right? So it doesn't have much corner access. I actually wonder if there's a world where cornering the Teemo makes more sense here. Uh, we'll have to see how it does play out because you're right. Yeah, if that Teemo is the last unit alive, it's going to be the difference maker. Volibear comes through and does stun the backline. The Abomination does interrupt the Draven, but not the Kale. So that Kale is free hitting. The Teemo ult comes out, but this is the part where Teemo is going to start to walk up and the turret is still alive in the corner. So the Kale is ascended. The Heimerdinger ult almost does enough. One more cast might do it. It's coming through. If it one shots the Kale, it's oh! just enough. It's just enough. And White Lies is still alive no, at dead. seven. He's dead. Delayed damage. Oh, he delayed damage. Delayed He's damage. dead. <laughs> and B Chris takes the win at 7 2 with a crazy high return, dealing enough damage after the cast. I oh that my gosh. I what thought White a Lies had that. I thought B Chris actually messed up because he getting the high return in the opposite corner opposite the Kale would have put it out of range so the Kale would hit the Teemo, hit the Doppelhelion of the Teemo that comes in, not allow it to crew while the turret's still on the field, but just enough damage with the final Heimer oh cast. My goodness. And one more Heimer auto before the Kale can get those autos in. I mean, we said it wow. at the beginning of the game that if B Chris wants to make it into the money, he's gonna have to place first, place top two, and well, you know what? He did it in, the, in game five. He's got one more game to do it, right? He's got one more shot. But uh, overall, he's he's done the first half of it. We'll see if, if he can keep it going. For sure. So, okay, we'll take a breather. I know, what a game. I, 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 I need a breather. I also want to look at scores. Uh, if, we, <laughs> if, we go to, if we go to the scores, we, I am speaky, even with the eight, Speaky's still in the, in the lead. So it's, 
it and but the thing is when that person in first takes an eighth it tightens up the scores you can see the scores have tightened up you know four people playing for first that are three points apart peaky in first with 34 white lies not far behind 33 seek and seek and argante tied for third at 31 points w29f at 29 nakashi at 26 unfortunately with the nocturne low rolls <laughs> beakers at 24 even after that first still has a lot of ground to make up and temlaws at 23 it gets so close. It, the scores tighten up. This is exactly what I was talking about after game four. If the people at the top just don't extend their lead, that allows the rest of the lobby to catch up. That allows the middle to just be this insane cluster of these really tight points. And first to first through fifth, five points apart. It's anyone's game at this point. If Peaky takes another eighth. And the top four, all the top four in points right now, just all go bot for it. There's a chance that WT9F sneaks in there and snags that first. And it's just, it comes down to the last game, really. Yeah. I, so, one of the things I want to call out here is Ano Aragante, who came into the back half of the tournament at sixth place. After game four, fifth place. After game five, fourth place. So, we're starting to see an upward trajectory. And is he's now in a spot where if he does place first, does play second somewhere in that top echelon of the standings is actually in a place to win the tournament and it comes down to exactly what you're saying when the top of the standings are condensed like this it comes down to one final moment one final game where you need to play your heart out sweat every turn because every single health point can matter for sure and i mean it's tft you like you said it's a huge it, it's all about hp at the end of the day Whoever dies first gets the eighth. Whoever dies last doesn't die. Whoever has that HP, they can get that first. So at that point, and especially in tournament setting, yeah, you've got to be sweating out every bit of HP, get every little optimization that your brain can handle that your fits your play style. And this, this is something I talk about a lot, actually, about your, fitting your play style. Obviously, none of these players are going to play perfectly optimized TFT. Or just our brains cannot do that at all, much less in the short amount of time we have to actually play like play this game because the time in between rounds is only 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So these players need to be playing to their strengths, whatever those strengths are, optimizing for their game, squeaking out every bit of HP that fits their game that's optimized that way. Play for every placement possible because one HP can be the difference between money and not money or first and second. And, and again, I, I have to keep calling back to, I know I keep saying it, but it really does change the way you have to approach this game. First place is not a two point difference. First place is a one point difference. Top four is a two point difference. So when you are playing with a three point margin between first and third or first and fourth, whatever it is, I mean, top four is actually more valuable. And there's a world where you actually overtake first place with a third or a fourth place finish based on how those other players play. Because if they are playing this first or eighth go for broke and they bottom out, then you can actually win the event with a third place or a fourth place finish. So we're gonna be going into this first game in just a little bit. One of the players that I think it's really important to watch is Peaky. Peaky's currently the, the point leader sitting at 34 and they're gonna be setting the tempo of this game of, am I playing for first or am I playing for top four? I mean, at this point you're, you're looking for your best placement, but I, I, I'm curious to see what the decision making looks like when it comes down to the end of the game. Yeah, especially with especially with players that close behind you just the top four doesn't secure it automatically depending on when when other players die if you see white lies go out in seventh and you're still alive and you know okay white lies can no longer pass me so i need to have a three point gap above up above the whoever mm -hmm. goes first and has a shot overtaking me at that point now you're just playing for third but going, yeah, going in, you don't know what you need to play for right now because it is dependent on the other players. So I, I want to know if Peaky just goes for broke automatically, like is going to start playing for first. Well, I do think the safer play is, is to start on top four. And this is also just how I approach TFT in general. You start by playing for top four, you evaluate if you can play for first, if you need to play for first, and then you play for first from there. Yeah, you can see that right off the bat, picking up the pair, 
one of the most obvious choices in TFT generally. Uh, some people maybe prefer to not play that Vladimir right off the bat and may just opt to choose units they're more comfortable with. But when it comes down to the actual just odds of playing, you pick up the pair because it's your best chance at a two star. Yeah, unfortunately, I, I, these like mesh shops, I really like holding these Kha'Zixes. Just Kha'Zix, what, when you don't have a strong opener, just a Kha'Zix 1 killing a unit. We touched on this earlier. Just Kha'Zix 1 can just kill a unit that saves you HP. Especially with this Vlad pair you're picking up. If you find the Soraka, you want, you want to play some kind of like Dawnbringer or Renewer front line. That fits a little better. Just a random Kled is leading you in a different direction. So it's... It's a tiny, I would call it a mistake. I think it's very small. Also, not holding the Kha'Zix when you have a Gragas pair, you're missing out on Dawnbringer. It's these tiny optimizations in the early game that can actually really matter. Especially with the Warmog slam coming through, it, it does feel that if you're going to be slamming Warmogs and you're going to be playing a Gragas as your front line, you would just naturally want that Dawnbringer to buff up your front line because all of a sudden, I mean, Gragas, Gragas too with the Warmogs is basically like three or four one-star units in your front line. It is, he's a beefy boy. And even just off belt start, even if you don't see, you haven't seen that belt, second belt coming in on one four. You don't know you're getting Warmogs, but even just off belt start, belt start screams, what do I want to play that uses a bunch of HP? Renewers and Dawnbringers are perfect for that so i would love to see kiki holding those units instead instead gonna opt for some like hellion with a gragas 2 mishmash gonna get was that three owed by b Chris? not a great loss i honestly think a slightly better played opener actually saves at least a couple more health there if not entirely winning the fight and eh, well, okay i'm not gonna go that far <laughs> i'm not gonna go that far but it saves more hp it's a small thing you can do for free, holding the correct units that still saves HP. Kiki, considering the Sojin Slam here, opts to not do it right away. I mean, it's one of those things where Ziggs 1, uh, Kennen 1, and I was going to say level 3, you may not want to just commit to anything because you're keeping your options wide open. I don't exactly know what this level plus Vladimir is going to do for him, but what I think my first thought is, Kiki may just be playing for better shops because he's saying, you know what, what I'm hitting right now is just not it. Maybe I find a three cost that can give me direction. Maybe I can find a Riven or a Nidalee on my next shop, in which case I really don't want that Sojin uh, slammed because I could opt to play something like a Bloodthirster, which may work better with my board at that point in time. In all fairness, though, okay, this is a thing. If you level on 2-1, you get that level 4 shop on 2-2. And then you get another level four shop on two three. If you level, if you choose not to level those first two levels, you get level three shop on two one. Which okay, it, we're, if we're just focusing on two 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 three, that's my bad. Two two, you get level three shop. Two four, you still get the level four shop. Leveling on two two actually doesn't improve your shop odds at all because you still have it's still a level three shop on two two because you didn't level beforehand. You level. But even if you hadn't leveled, you still would have gotten the level 4 shop. This doesn't improve his shop odds at all. You're just leveling for a random Vladimir. And all of a sudden, you're not making 10 here. So it actually is setting your econ behind. To Does it even save HP? I don't think this Vladimir saves any HP. Yeah, I mean, he ends up, you know, being able to play the Vladimir for Nightbringer, but ends up playing Dawnbringer anyway. And now we're kind of circling back to... We have a Kha'Zix in play because we have a Gragas 2. I mean, some of that obviously is hindsight. He hit the Gragas 2 uh, after not picking up the Kha'Zix. But where we are right now, we'll have to see how he wants to actually pivot his board. He does have this tier on Yasuo. He has a sword on bench. I don't really think that anything about his board is screaming a certain direction. He's pretty wide open and ends up to pre-level. Because again, once again, just looking for, for better shop odds, I guess. Yeah, and even though you're getting the better shop odds, you're on three loss, you pre-level here, you're automatically level five next turn. You can't evaluate, do I want to just not level to five, go for a five loss? If you pre-level here, you are at risk of facing a weaker board of someone who opted to not level and losing your five loss streak. And at that point, this far behind an HP, this far behind an eco, and getting your streak griefed, like you're pretty much Autobot for, and at that point, Kiki's going to be playing for 7th, and when you're the points leader, 
you that is, you don't want to be playing for seventh. You want to be playing for top four, playing for first. Yeah, well, we'll have to see exactly what Peaky's planning to do. He did pick up a rod off of the carousel, so has the option to slam something like an Archangels or a Gunblade, depending on what direction he wants to go, or maybe just hold on to it if he's saying, late, long term, I want to play within the AP tree. He has the Gragas too with Warmog, so that does take something like Karma if he can get there with a lot of health. We'll have to see exactly how he does it, but we're, we're looking now at Ano Aragante, who's currently fourth place in the overall standings, is on a three-win streak with this Kled carry. Kled, I feel like, can consistently has been a very strong carry in stage two, tends to fall off in the back half of stage three, but when you're just looking to build up your economy and even now looking like he wants to transition into Sentinels for stage three, is a great carry to get you there. For sure, and I'm okay with even losing Econ for the Sentinels because it's an Olaf pair, it's a Senna pair, you have an Aurelia on board, like selling these pairs Selling anything of these pairs would actually cap out your board strength. This Sentinels is going to be slightly stronger than this current opener. Okay, sells an Olaf. Commits Kaya to the Cavs opener. Hits a set. Hits the... Oh. Huh. This is one of the most depressing feelings in TFT. When you sell a pair to make it go, and you hit that... Hit the pair the next shot. Could have had Olaf 2, Senna 2, and... Pro could easily slot those in. That's probably Luki stronger than the Kled. Yeah. And, and yeah, you're just, by selling that pair, even though you think, okay, I want to make 20 here, I want to be able to make 30 next turn, you're still capping out your board strength. I really think you have to be willing to lose a little bit of Eco to maximize the potential of your board. Now he also does hit this Aphelios, and I feel like this is where TFT kind of becomes a bit of a puzzle, right? Because it's like, I have this Cavalier Knight Forgotten on my board right now. I've got these Sentinels behind me, and I also have this Aphelios who could be a very strong four cost carry if I can support him right well enough. So, oh, wait a second. Actually looking at the fight, this Olaf too is going to take out this Kled and Ano Aragante is actually going to lose his streak to W29F. Exactly what I was saying. Olaf is going to be better than Kled here. Finds a Draven, which is a huge hit. Okay, that- But he could have been hitting Draven and this Aurelia. Yeah. On a five streak. I really think he five streaks if he go if he holds if he holds those pairs, goes for that Sentinel Skirms opener. That Olaf too is I it's going to be stronger than the Kled too. I agree with the decision to sell the Aphelios. It makes way more sense to use this Draven. You can play him now with Aphelios. You're basically just holding on to And even Last Whisper, I mean, just fits better on a Draven. Uh, I think most people would, would probably agree with that. And also hits the IE. I mean, man. Well, there you go. I This this just screams Draven now. So this, he, Aragante's fine now. And I, I do like seeing Aragante play not Gwen carry. It shows kind of the diversity of the comps he can play. Went for that AP route this uh, the last two games now, going for the AD route. So but being able, being willing to switch it up depending on his item drops, super valuable skill in TFT. But we're going to pivot over to Temlaz, playing a little bit of a throwback. Yeah. Like, throwback to last patch. It got B patched out pretty quickly because <laughs> we saw how insane Aatrox he was, but he's playing Callista Reroll, has eight Leonas. Okay, uh, let's take stock of this. Eight Leonas, six Callistas, and three Aatroxes, and 37 gold left. Oh. <laughs> well, <laughs> on the bright side, able to take this win, it looks like. Most likely going to take this over B, Chris. Uh, but it also snaps his loss streak, and he's below 50 gold. He gets back up to 40, which feels nice. Uh, we'll have to see. I mean, if you, if you do find these Callistas pretty early and finds another one there, probably... Uh, I don't, I don't think he's going to roll down. He's probably just going to keep trying to get back up to 50 and slow roll at that point. Once you miss, once you miss that 3-1 uh, roll down, then you kind of have to just take your loss, uh, go back to the drawing board, figure out how you can get back up to 50 without losing gold, and then uh, roll down from there or slow roll from there. Oh, oh we lost them loss for a second. And yeah, yeah. But uh, back on board with B Chris yeah. now though, we've seen yeah. B Chris back with another AP based board. Another Ziggs 2 in the early game. This, I guess this is comfort. <laughs> it's, it's the same deal, although this time was willing to slam the Shoujin. I guess it's just saying, okay, we're just... I'm just going to play for top four now. I've, I'm, or, I'm looking at the standings, and even if he gets first, 
Puts him at 32 points. Needs a ton of help just to go top four, even if he goes first. So at this point, it's just Beaker's like playing for pride, almost playing. Mm -hmm. At this point, it's just, okay, I'm just going to play my game. Just just play like I normally do. Slam a Shoujin, play for the top four here. It's more than okay. It's how players approach tournaments, especially in the later later stages of the tourney. But we see Temlaz. Temlaz in a similar situation, although he, I don't think he can top four at all. So he's just playing Callista reroll, finds a Leona three. And back on board has seven Callistas. So he's, I mean, why not? Play the Callista reroll. Do your thing. Yeah, if you hit it, why not, right? And uh, something to actually, you know, there's a, there were two different players with Draven, and then I did see another player. I didn't see if it was itemized, but I did see a Misfortune on the board. So it, there actually is a world where there are multiple forgotten players in this game. And if you are one of those top four players, you really don't want to be contested right now. For sure. And... As just playing anything that contested, especially trying to play a four cost carry contested, if you're committing to playing that four cost carry triple contested, your odds you, you can play it contested by one person. Like, doesn't feel great, but you can do it. If you're contested by two people, especially if you poke around and you see they both have the two stars already and you don't have a single copy, then good luck. Good luck finding a copy, much less two starting it. At that point, you have to change your whole game plan around. And a lot of TFT is finding your game plan, finding your direction, and just sticking to it. And unless if that game plan involves a pivot, so be it. But a lot of times I really feel like in TFT, it's just you look at what you have, you play around what's directly in front of you, you play around the direction it's telling you to go. With that, uh, Temlaz does pick up a second, uh, or uh, yeah, a second vest for this Leona, able to make Bramble if he chooses to. It's also going to be rolling down. He's just two Kalistas away. See if he can hit that now. Does pick up an Aatrox, a couple of redeemed units as well. This could be just six redeemed, uh, yeah, standard Kalista Aatrox. The crazy Leona in the front line as well. But yeah, still not hitting that Kalista does not feel great. Yeah, I do so a couple things. Uh... I'm, I'll say I don't like the six redeem version of this. I like with a redeem spat on the Callista maybe, but six redeem just doesn't feel like enough defense. I'd much rather have like four knights or a bunch of mystics depending on the lobby. This lobby it's probably going to be four knights and ironclads. Um, so and you just buff up the Leona, you get three redeem buff on Aatrox, and that's all you really need for them to be super tanky with the other defensive synergies coming in. Also. <laughs> Part of re-rolling, sometimes you low roll and you just don't hit. Sometimes you find three copies of a unit in three shops, which is exactly what happened with Aatrox. And with Temlaz, Temlaz feels good from the spot, though, because he does have one of his three stars. He does have the Leona. You don't need to panic. You don't need to send it yet. You don't need this Callista 3. You're going to want it by 4-1, but for now, it's fine. You can just chill out. You, um, you'll, you'll spike on 4-1. And as we look at this, I do like the Titans. The, the, the Titans, it's it's just more a, it's more defensive stats for this Leona, but also it gives her a little bit of AP, which the AP scaling on her alt and not taking damage, it's a little bit overkill sometimes, but it, at some point it just reduces the damage of even like Heimerdinger turrets, or the, like the Heimerdinger, um, the Heimerdinger fireballs. It's so much damage reduction with just a little bit of AP in there. It's pretty nuts. Yeah, I think needless to say, Temlaz is not worried about having enough defense right now. They they have more than enough for the rest of the game. Uh, we're looking at Nakashi right now, who does take the Runan's Tempest on this Yasuo. Also has a bow and a glove on their bench. So actually, if they do choose to play Yasuo, they have plenty of health to do it, and they have multiple outs with their itemization where they can play something like Runance, they can also play Jeweled Gauntlet, however they actually, or they can play RFC or Jeweled Gauntlet, however they actually want to play it, they do have a handful of different outs, and they don't even have to play Yasuo, they have just strong general items that they could play on an AD flex carry. I would say off of taking the Radiant Runans, this probably doesn't, it's either not Yasuo or just doesn't want to be Yasuo because Yasuo doesn't get that much benefit out of having Radiant Runans versus Runans because the, the Radiant bonus of Runans is all centered around AD mostly. It's extra attack damage on that bolt. 
is the main radiant benefit, but Yasuo doesn't care about his attack damage. He just wants a rune ants just so he gets extra true damage procs. Doesn't matter what his AD is at that point. It's just not enough value out of the radiant version of the item when you already have a bow component on your bench. You're probably you're thinking you're probably gonna get a get get that rune ants. So pr there's a decent chance he looks for something else. Might just be committing to Yasuo anyway. It could be. It could be Jax. Could be Jax. I it looks like Jax to me. Jax here. Yeah, he's picking up a I, lot of for for a second. Yeah. For a second, I, I did see the uh, the Nocturne on bench and thought, "There's no way he's doing no. it." He had the last whisper on bench. He had the Nocturne there, the Root Radiant Rune Ants. But yeah, it looks like this is a Jax game. He found he found Jax. Doesn't get the Jax in though. A bit of a slow transition. Oh, that's that might cost him. And that's transitioning on four one. You either I. There's either two ways you have to approach it. You either know you're going to nail the transition on 4-1 and have a strong board on 4-1, or you're not confident in it, and at that point, you just can roll on neutrals. Makashi has a lot of gold. Could have easily rolled on neutrals. Could have guaranteed the pivot goes off. He gets the pivot off. I think he wins that fight. And winning that one fight, you can't afford to be just dropping rounds for free at this stage of the game at this level. So... So I want to call something going out. I think it's Yasuo. I think he's just going for Yasuo he, anyway. At the end of that last fight, there was a Galio and a, no uh, a Nautilus in the shop. He opted to not take it, even though he had the Jax on his bench. So it looked like he wasn't t playing Knights. Now hits the Yasuo too, despite the fact that he does have the, the Jax pair. I mean, Nakashi's kind of going for broke here and saying, you know what? Yasuo is really good. I have the RFC. I've got Runans. I've got Hodge. Yasuo will definitely do damage. The question is, is it going to be enough? I feel like, okay, if you really wanted to play Yasuo, if you're Yasuo 2020, congrats, you hit. But you're also on such little gold, and I feel like you had a stable Jax board around 40 gold left, and that lets you go for level, go up to level 8. Uh, it's... man... I will say we did see this on almost this exact same build. I know we saw the uh, Radiant RFC plus Rune Ants earlier. Oh, with an extra RFC. And that was actually able to carry as a Yasuo 2. So maybe there's a world where Nakashi is saying, I have a lot of health. There's a lot of low health players in this lobby right now. And if they don't stabilize on 7, this Yasuo 2 with these items is definitely going to stabilize me on 7. So I can see a world where he's playing to that and maybe playing more of a top 4. And then, you know what, if I end up hitting Yasuo 3, maybe I win. But generally speaking, I agree with you that the the Jax pair definitely spoke to a more consistent level of play. Yeah, I, and it speaks to playing what you want to play versus playing what you hit mm -hmm. like and what to what nakashi excuse me hit there was hit a jacks board hit a hit a jacks board with a good number of upgrades and a viego like skipped over a viego and us i don't like that skipping over viego even if you're playing yasuo because i think you can get a ton of value out of viego in this comp so just tunneling on it feels like he's just tunneling on a yasuo build a very specific yasuo build trying to now missing Diana also, like, it it feels like I want to play this specifically. I'm not going to play what the game wants me to. I'm playing exactly what I want, even if it takes me way more gold to hit it than it would if I just stuck with the build I had give, been given. Going into Carousel, he does have the glove on bench. Could maybe just pick up something like Thieves Gloves if he wants to throw that on a Lee Sin or a Diana, some other Nightbringer in the composition that's definitely viable. Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, Nakashi right now just wants to get back up to, to 50 gold, right? He, he wants enough gold to find Yasuo 3. That's that's the goal right now. He does have enough gold to or health to spare that he can at least lose a handful. But really, I mean, you want to get to a spot where if he can get two neutrals while also having uh, a decent amount of health, he'll be able to get back up to 50 and start to slow roll from there. It's just, that's the part of the game where having a three Nightbringer Yasuo 2 is going to fall off unless you start to hit. What What's happening right now is actually one of the downsides of having rolled so deep. You're having to go through these leaps and pounds to like kind of make eco. He had to sell a Lulu just to make 20, just to guarantee that eco. Was able to win the fight anyway. Different fight 
that Lulu can maybe make a difference? Because it's a Lulu versus just a random Sejuani one with no items. Like, the Lulu one with no items is probably low-key a little better. You can get a little more value out of it. So you, you have to go through these leaps and bounds to make Eco. And even by the time you make Eco, you're only on three Yasuos. It's still going to be hard to hit Yasuo 3 from here. So... I got to talk about W29F right now, though. We've 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 seen Nakashi enough. I mean, W29F is currently in fifth place, sitting at 29 points. They are hail with perfect items at 4, 5, 50 gold level 8. That is a good spot to be. That is a very good spot to be. And I, I think this is the spot where W29F is saying, I not only have gold, I have health. And I have board strength. We talked about that trinity of economy earlier in the game. Well, W29F says, you know what? What if I just have all three? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> just why not have all three? It has a it's sitting on a Galio one with just a decal, so it's not the strongest front line. If they find the Galio pair, they might opt to roll a little bit actually, just to guarantee an even safer level nine. Um, then you can go go up to level nine. You hit that KL two. And that gap, just the Galio upgrade, the Galio 2 versus Galio 1 can save a ton of HP to get there. So we'll, we'll see what they do later. But for now, Nakashi matching up with the Temlas who managed to hit Aatrox 3, Leona 3, Callista 3, everything you want to hit. And the Kale. It's just going to run through this Yasuo. Oh my God. Just even though Yasuo has true damage, <laughs> theoretically... He's gonna need a lot of it. Gonna need time. Gonna need time to ramp that up too, and this board just isn't quite strong enough to give that Yasuo the time to ramp up. Yeah, hopping back on board now with Temlaz again. Temlaz in eighth place, not in a in a position to win the tournament. So Temlaz is saying, you know what? If I'm gonna go out, I'm going out in style. I'm I'm playing for pride. Gonna get every placement, and you know what I'm gonna say is even though I didn't win the tournament, I'm gonna beat everybody else and place first in the game where I know they're trying to win. For sure, <laughs> it's. There is, there's, from, from someone who's done this before, like, there's a little <laughs> bit of satisfaction out of, like, being out of the tournament and griefing placements from other people because you tried. It's, it's that little bit of, like, ha 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 idea, <laughs> but, like, which also, like, I mean, they're competitors. They should be trying. So, like, it's, if this is what Temlaz wants to do and wants to do, they like, actually try in this game good for him mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> absolutely yeah go out going out going out with a bang up now against b chris who is running once again this abomination revenant heimerdinger board also has a teemo online doesn't have the uh heimer 2 teemo 2 like last time but we've got plenty of time left for them to hit it's going to be pretty hard for them to get through this entire front line but actually they are able to solo out this Leona, but the Callista 3 is still free hitting in the back, so I am expecting the Callista to take this fight. And yeah, while well, it's only a three unit loss, just the Aatrox 3, Leona 3, Callista 3, it's just too much damage, too many tank stats, very, very hard to get through. Does hit the spatula, but I do not think Assassin's spatula is going to do much for him here. No, so. absolutely not. The death, the death plate is fine here, you just slap it on the Kale, you get a little bit of extra damage. What I saw in that fight though, I want to know where B Chris's damage is. Double Shojin Heimer and a GA Teemo. <laughs> Where is the damage? Yeah, not looking great. Definitely able to cast. Again, it's one of those things that can potentially take out low roll uh, players. But what happens when you are kind of the low roller in terms of health and you are sitting at 19 health and have no way to kill strong units? So we'll have to see how this plays out. I'm, I don't expect B Chris to. Uh, pull anything out of his hat unless he can find a damage item on carousel the, the the goal is can he survive till then i actually think playing against nakashi here probably feels pretty good again you have that cc between ivern and the volibear the volibear while it doesn't negate nightbringer shields anymore does deal double damage and generally speaking you just have a lot of cc that's going to be buying time for that teemo and heimerdinger and just like that between that and the fiddlesticks uh, ends up doing enough damage Yasuo just did not get to play the game there, which yep. is the beauty of Revenants into melee carries. <laughs> just Teemo, Teemo slowing attack speed, Volley just knocking them up, A-Bomb coming out knocking up, Ivern, Lulu if it manages to cast on the carry. Just, good luck playing the game without a QSS. 
Oh, does hit Lee Sin 3. W2 Knight F finds Kale 2. I believe at level 8. I don't think they went to 9 yet. I am curious about White Lies. They are sitting in 2nd overall in points, and right now they're sitting in 8th. So we got to see exactly how they're going to pull this out to get as high of a placement as possible. Man, W2 Knight F really, really hit hitting right now. Hit Finding the Rel 2 as well. Seek and Seek with the Aphelios 2. Uh, some attack speed, some damage, got some stuff going on there. We'll have to see if this is enough to actually take out the Revenant board. The Volibear does not knock up the Aphelio, so he's able to get that mana going, but uh, slowly making, whittling down Seek and Seek's board. And it looks like the Heimerdinger is able to take out the Aphelios. You know, I mean, where's the damage? I guess the damage is a Heimer too, and you don't also, how many times have you seen an A-Bomb Heimer board win without the Heimer casting once? Not, not that many times. You know, I've seen it happen a lot. It's just so much going on on the board that you like Heimer doesn't cast, but like just the collective strength of everything still takes over the fight. So that's basically what's just happening here and can maybe get a Renewer spat. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, sure. there's, a, there's a couple of things to talk about right now. One, Renewer Spatula is going to be insane in this composition. <laughs> Second, White Lies is out in eighth. White Lies is out. They were they were vying for one of those top spots, and just like that, out in eighth. That, that's going to have a huge impact on their overall placement, so we'll have to see if they're even able to place top four with that, uh, with that final game. Yeah, and I, I actually got to peek at their board, and they were playing Cavs. They were playing the reroll Hecarim Misfortune. They hit Misfortune 3. They hit Hecarim 3. Go one eighth. <laughs> Man. Well, <laughs> that is the uh, the nature of playing in a lobby where you have Kale 2 at 3 5, five 3 and Heimerdinger 2 at 5 2. I mean, sometimes there are just really strong boards. You have all these other reroll boards that have already hit. Though so, sometimes it just happens. Yeah, it really be like that sometimes. But we're going into Argante, who, yeah, stuck with that Draven. The IE last whisper, the Draven early. Stuck with that is fairly healthy, not not getting a chance to go nine on zero gold. But, uh, this rating QSS is doing a lot of work though. It's gonna stop the attack speed slow, stop the dra oh, not quite enough. It stopped the A bomb from knocking it up, but B Chris just has so much, it's <laughs> just so much on this board. This is the thing with Revenants. Like, you have three units that all have two lives. You have Daisy coming out. You have A bomb on the board. You have the Heimer turret. Like, look at how full this board is. And it's only level eight. So, something about that Draven build, though, that you called out in that fight is having, oh man, Garen 2 for Peaky. That's big. But having that Radiant QSS on top of Last Whisper IE is going to be huge, not only for winning fights, but for killing units. And when you're Aragante and you're in that top four, we talked about it before, it's more important for these players who are vying for those top spots to top four. And so he's able to kill enough units so that even if he doesn't hit his entire board, he will bleed out slower than some of these other players in the lobby and potentially squeak sneak into a fourth, even if it means that his board was a little bit weaker than somebody else's. Yeah, for sure. And as, as we're going on Peaky, who now has a better shot of closing this out now that White Lies' his main competition goes out in eighth, playing the Karma. And here's the thing. Karma on her own is okay, but not that strong. You know what really unlocks her, though, is a Garen 2. Yeah. A, this stacked Garen 2, and I believe that's a Radiant Gargoyles Titans Warmox. Wow, almost that knocks sounds... out... W29F as well. Brings him all the way down to five health. And W29F was sitting in an incredible spot with that Kale 2, but just does not have the, the front line to survive against Peaky's board. And that Kale, even if it does ascend, may not be able to kill that Garen 2 that's fully stacked. And you know who went out in seventh? Sneak and Sneak. Who was in <gasps> third. 2 3 in the tournament. Went out in 7 8. This is going to get tight. This is going to be very, very tight. And really, I mean, Peaky, Peaky is one of the players to watch. Ano Argante is one of the players to watch. But because it's so tight, depending on where they fall, it could be taken by somebody else completely. So we'll have to see exactly how that all plays out. Yeah, rolling as, down now. As Peaky's rolling down here, <laughs> blue buff Rabadons. Does, this is just <laughs> screams a Teemo. Not coming, but it's it screams Teemo, so just gonna slap it on the the Soraka, I believe, which I'm more than fine with. Honestly, blue buff Soraka is nice. It get it's the two tiers to get the mana reeve cast out that much faster, mm -hmm. which can make a difference in some fights. And nice repositioned. Good good 
sol solid reposition. Yeah, ma Karma dodging the Shroud, G Garen also dodging the Shroud, which I would honestly argue is a little bit bigger. Mm. It's this Karma is now just wiping out the board. G Garen staying alive for so long. Karma is not going to be hitting the high. Oh. We're going to go down. <laughs> just Karma trolling just a little bit. Can there's a world. Oh my god. Oh, here. Wait, oh wait, my wait. Wait, but if it, it's, if it kills Hyra and the turret before it kills the Teemo. Wait. Uh, oh, and he loses anyway. Oh my goodness. Before we were just saying we thought it was W29F who goes out in fifth. Who goes out in fifth place with the Kale 2. And Nakashi went out in sixth. And just like so. that, Ten Laws now, who originally was doing the reroll Callista, has an additional Kale 2 on board. So Ten Laws, B Chris, Ano Aragante, and Piki all fighting for that first spot, all of which have insane boards. White Lies and Seek and Seek. Uh, no, W29F, it gets so close for this top four. It's. And, but our, it's now just Aragante. And Peaky really fighting it out. If Argante beats Peaky here, if that if this is lethal, knocks him out in fourth, there's a shot. Oh, wow. if, as long as Argante goes first, there's a shot he can win this. But it's this Dawnbringer, just two star gear, and this Draven can't quite get through it. Gonna stay alive for now. Argante taking a huge hit. <laughs> oh, you know, oh, and the cruel again. The <laughs> This lobby's nuts. Okay, you know, oh I want to call this out before. Uh, we, we talked about it before. I want to call it out again. Otto Aragante saved so much health from having the Radiant QSS on this Draven. Because when well, just at a glance, I would say that his board looks weaker than these other insane boards in the lobby. But he was actually just the health leader or second place in health because of how much he saved. Because he was able to beat all of these mid-game boards by having a Draven who is never getting CC'd. So I think at this point, Ano Aragante is probably going out in fourth. But he's okay with that because of how stacked the rest of these boards actually have been. Yeah, and it's you, at this point, if you're Aragante, you have to play for first or you're just in second anyway. So it, and it, feel, it feels okay, but, the, you know, b Chris's board, I'm surprised at how much work it's doing, considering this Heimer has no damage, but it's also <laughs> Heimer too. So that's Aragante out and fourth. Yeah, I know Aragante going to yeah. lose there. The, the Heimer Dinger too, the uh, Teemo coming out, and Temla is also out there. It's down to b Chris and Peaky. So we'll have to see how this actually plays out. Yeah, <laughs> you know, Ballista reroll takes third. No decent sign for it. We'll yeah, take it. Yeah, maybe it's back we'll in the meta. I mean, we've talked. Oh wow, big hit there with the the Velkaz or the uh, Vola Bear too. Unfortunately, not going to be able to play another unit. Probably just a yeah random Riven. Uh, actually, is that? Uh, What's that because because he I has mean, Dawnbringer. He does yeah, give it, him it two Dawnbringer. Sure, sure, I guess. <laughs> that's that's some of these like. When you're on the level nine, like three gold, you're just like, okay, what's the most value I can squeak out of this last little spot? Like, what's the tiniest bit of value? And it's just, oh, a random ribbon for Dawnbringer and a stun. Cool. Because opting to shroud the front line, I think that makes a lot of sense. Delaying the Vol the Volibear cast and the Garen cast. And the thing about B. Chris's comp right now is he has so much frontline that he really just wants to buy time for the Heimer and the Teemo and is actually able to kill Peaky's entire board. But now it's just the Garen with a cast is back to full health with this gigantic shield. The question is, is this Teemo going it's to survive? Go it looks like is it go going to be a cruel again? The Doppelhelion still hasn't spawned. I'm pretty sure this Teemo is going to cruel it. We'll see. I think, uh, Another <laughs> cast. If he kills everything but the Teemo, it might be enough. Another cast, but... He's alive in the cruel! <laughs> and Teemo is able to cruel oh the Garen, and with that, what I don't know what the delay damage is. What's the base damage? He's alive with 4 HP. Wow. These fights. <laughs> yeah, these fights are disgusting. I mean, how many times are we going to see a Teemo diff? This is time and time again. The Hellion coming through, able to, to use Cruel to take out the fight. Also able to get four Renewer with the Vladimir. So that, that definitely feels pretty good. I mean, either way, it still may come down to this GA Hellion Teemo. Because really, I mean, the, everything on the board is dying. Everything G except the Garen. 
The GA especially is going to make difference. It gives Teemo two lives, and that's just two more chances for it to get cool off, and that's probably going to matter in this fight. Could Just could be it right here. We do see the Karma immediately killing the Teemo, and then Nidalee back there as well. If this Karma does kill the Teemo before he's able to wipe out the rest of Peaky's board, this may spell trouble for him, but the Teemo's still staying alive. Another Heimerdinger cast coming out, but the, the Karma still alive and attacking the... the the uh, Teemo is dead, back to only Italian form. So the only way that the Cruel is going to activate is if the Garen kills this front line and is then able to go to the Heimerdinger, but it ends up attacking the Teemo. This might be it, but they have the Heimer turrets, which kill him. <laughs> oh my goodness, and Chris takes another game. Uh, just go back to back 1-1. One, one. Wow. That even... <laughs> Beakris. Beakris was... Sure. You needed 1-1 one, one to even have a shot. And I don't... 1-1. One, one. Sure, why not? With no damage timer, just double Shoujin, just repeated casts over and over and over and over. Apparently just enough to take it. Yeah, I mean, we were looking at it in the mid game, right? And, you, and we were saying... To double Sojin, no offensive items. How is this Heimerdinger going to do it? But you, you pointed out yourself. These Revenant boards, between the Fiddlesticks, between the, the Teemo, between all the, the Brand Shred, I mean, there is just a general large amount of damage that's being done. It actually was able to carry b Chris pretty far into the game to the point where he was able to get that GA on the Teemo and actually carry those late game fights against the Garen. In the end, not needing it. The the Heimer, the Heimer turret coming in clutch once again and, and, and you know, securing that victory. I think it shows the value of Heimer 2 over Heimer 1. Like Heimer 1 right now, especially that build, double Shojin, not mm -hmm. a unit. There's no damage there. Heimer 2, though, able to cast just so many times that eventually just whittles down the board, especially with the Heimer 2. The Heimer 2 auto attacks actually do quite a bit. So Beakris gonna Beakris taking that final first. But with that, we have the final scores. And Peaky! <laughs> Peaky's done it! This and Peaky, Chris, oh no! Beakris just falling out of the top four, actually losing, potentially tying. Actually, might have won the tiebreaker. We'll have to. Uh, I'm assuming this is including tiebreaker, so Seek and Seek taking it. But Peaky taking first with 42 points. Ano Aragante sneaking into second with 37. White Lies uh, coming in with 34. Seek and Seek with 33. B Chris with 33, W29F with 33, Templars with 30, and Nakashi with 29. And we did get confirmation that this is including the tiebreakers. For, so Seek and Sneak did confirm get fourth place in the tournament. Yeah, so, and that's, you know, I, B Chris, I've been there. It feels really bad when you've done all you can. You go 1 1. You need the 1 1 just to even have a shot. You go the 1 1. And it's still not enough, and you still lose the tiebreaker. It feels so bad. But beyond that, the top four, you know, congratulations to all of them. And they I, they all set up getting that top four in different ways. For Seek and Seek, it was smashing the first three games. They mm -hmm. went bot four. They went 6-7-7 in that finals lobby. But going 2-1-1 enough to just pretty much auto-secure that top four finish, put them in the money, more than enough to get there. White Lies decent performance in in the first half starting out finals lobby hot with 3-2 then just eating an eighth getting to the third more than okay Aragante solid performance throughout just one bot four and same deal with Peaky that one bot four being the eighth but they took so many firsts they went two three one one eight two so many top twos able to just accrue points that way that they were able to close out in first by a decently commanding margin that five points so well played to everyone fantastic series and i love like i said at the start i love the comp diversity we saw i love how many boards we saw go first how many different boards we saw take top fours I mean, it was amazing to see something I really want to call out. We talked about it multiple times throughout the broadcast was Ano Aragante going from sixth to fifth to fourth to second. Just, uh, you know, this tra upward trajectory. But like you called out, Peaky had commanding games and in the end started to play more of this first or eighth, uh, you know, AP 
uh, base compositions, whatever it was that they were actually playing, they were able to actually take all of these top twos that put them in a first place spot. So congratulations to all of our top four finishers. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I can't believe we actually got to see that many different compositions in the top four. The meta seems really, really great. Large amount of diversity. I mean, was there anything else that really stood out to you from this event? We we talked about the beginning, like Yasuo's, Yasuo's been kind of stomping on ladder, but we didn't see we didn't see that much Yasuo in the first place. We also didn't, I don't believe we saw Yasuo win again. Yeah, the only time I believe it won was off stream in the first three games I think we had talked about in the beginning, or at least it had top two that had done well, but you're right. Top two. Yeah, we it, talked, it, it we talked about it. Off stream. It only got it only got second. Its max placement was second, so it's I mean, that kind of goes to show sometimes like ladder meta is not going to translate to tournament meta. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, especially we talked about it multiple times. The tempo of the game tends to be higher, tends to be faster in these tournament games. And if you can't keep up, well, then you can't afford to stay on seven and slow roll because you're just going to bot four. So, you know what? All in all, Peanut Butter Cup number one has come to an end. And I think that was quite a start to the European Weekly that we have in our hands. For, for the event, I've been Gangly, joined by my co-host, Jirachi. Thank you guys so much for watching. We hope to see you again next week. Uh, take care, have a wonderful day, and we'll catch you next time.